Sunlight winked through the tall pines, casting long shadows on the lawn in front of the library. It was late now, but the boys were still out, playing in the woods that covered the south end of the island. Catherine, standing on the porch, listened for a moment, hearing their distant shouts, then shaded her eyes. "'Can you see them?' Atris asked, stepping out from the library, his pale eyes squinting in the sunlight. She turned, the hem of her dark green dress flowing over the polished boards. "'Don't worry so,' she said, her green eyes smiling back at him. "'Anna's with them. They'll be in before it's dark.' He smiled, then came across and placed his arms about her. "'Have you finished yet?' she asked softly, wrapping her own arms about him and pulling him closer. "'No,' Atris sighed wearily. "'I'm close, though.' "'Good.' He kissed her gently, then, releasing her, went back inside, taking his seat at a desk that he'd made for himself. For a moment or two he looked out through the brightly lit rectangle of the doorway at Catherine, drinking in the simple sight of her. Then, taking his pen, he looked back at his journal and began to write. It is strange now to conceive that I could have doubted her, even for a second, and yet in that moment when my father surprised me in the cave I was certain beyond all doubt that she had betrayed me. Certain, yes, and at the same time heartbroken, for I had transferred to her person all of that love, all of that natural affection, that my father had so unnaturally rejected. Love given freely, and without hope of repayment. Yet how was I to know how kind, yes, and how cunning, too, my Catherine could be? My saviour, my partner, yes, and now my wife. Atris paused, recalling the shock he'd felt that moment when Catherine had revealed to him that Anna was behind it all. The feeling, the overwhelming feeling he'd had of having stepped into one of Catherine's dream worlds. But it had been true. Without Anna's forethought, he would have been trapped on Riven still. That was, if Gannett let him live after what he'd done. He dipped a pen and wrote again. Only a remarkable woman would have done what Anna did, following us down through the labyrinth of tunnels and broken ways into Dunny. She had known, of course, that Gen would not keep his word. Had known what I, in my innocence, could not have guessed. That my father was not merely untrustworthy, but mad. All those years I spent on Kavir, she had kept a distant eye on me, making sure I came to no harm at my father's hands, while she awaited the moment of my realization. Idris looked up, remembering that moment, feeling once more the weight of his disillusion with his father. Such things, he knew now, could not be passed on like other things, they had to be experienced. A parent, a good parent, that is, had to let go at some point, to let their children make choices, for choices were part of the Maker's scheme, as surely as all the rest. He dipped the pen, then wrote again, faster now, the words spilling from him. Anna saw me flee Kavir, and sought to find me in the tunnels once again, but again had got there first. Even then she would have intervened, but for the mute. Seeing them carry me back, unconscious, to Kavir, she had known she had to act. That evening, she had gone to Kavir, and, risking all, had entered my father's study, meaning to confront him. But again was not there. It was Catherine she met. Catherine who, after that first moment of shock and surprise, had chosen to trust and help her. So it was that Catherine had known me even before she met me in the hut on Riven, like an age one has first read in a descriptive book, and then subsequently linked to. I should have known at once that Mist was not Catherine's. But how was I to know otherwise? I had fought Anna lost. Lost forever. And how was I to know that, just as I made my preparations, so the two of them made theirs, pooling their talents, Anna's experience, and Catherine's intuitive genius, to craft those seemingly cataclysmic events on age five, in such a way that after a time they would reverse themselves, making Catherine's former home, now Gant's prison, stable once more. And the mist book? Briefly he looked about him at the room he'd made, pleased by his efforts. Then, picking up his pen again, he began to write, setting down the final words, the ending that was not a final ending.
was the moment I fell into the fissure that the book would not be destroyed as I had planned. It continued falling into that starry expanse of which I had only a fleeting glimpse. I've tried to speculate where it might have landed. I must admit, however, such conjecture is futile. Still, questions about whose hands might one day hold my missed book are unsettling to me. I know my apprehensions might never be allayed, and so I close, realizing that perhaps the ending has not yet yet been written. Hello and welcome to Let's Play Mist. Finally, we'll get to see how my favorite games franchise got started. In Myst, the main character is what is known as an ageless, faceless, gender-neutral, culturally ambiguous adventure person. Not much is known about the player character in Myst. Some say that he found the Myst book in the San Francisco library, and that he was there looking for books about photography. All we know is, he's called the Stig, um, I, I mean the stranger. San Francisco library version of the story actually comes from the official Myst strategy guide, though um, nothing from that guide should be considered canon. It also doesn't entirely match what we see in the game. I certainly don't remember the San Francisco library being this drafty. Given what we learn in Uru, this might be uh, the desert in New Mexico. Near the cleft. The main character was actually intentionally left vague so that the player could simply immerse uh, him or herself in the game and imagine actually being in this world. It was not until later that it was revealed that Myst actually takes place in the early 19th century, around 1806 according to uh, various sources, which throws a bit of a spanner in the works for that theory. Of course, a first-time player wouldn't know any of those things. All you'd know is that there was some guy falling talking about his Myst book, and that now, that book lies before us, in this dark, featureless plane. So let's uh, take a look at it, and we'll find out that, uh, as he said, the ending has not yet been written, instead it is actually the beginning. A plain enough book, at first glance, except most books I know don't have moving pictures in them. Our first glimpse at Mist Island. And a strange phenomenon such as moving image in a book bears some closer inspection. And when we touch that image... We find ourselves transported to this mysterious island. Standing on what appears to be a dock. It's a pretty nice view. It's a clear day. The sea is calm. There are some birds flying around. And that's about it as far as uh, all we know at this point. This game was state-of-the-art back in 1993, of course. Uh, I actually remember reading a review back then talking about how amazing it was that you could see birds flying in the background. Which, of course, by today's standards uh, is not quite that unremarkable. Of course, the question is, where are we? Um, and what are we supposed to do? Let's take a look around. Like I said, we appear to be on a dock. And there is um, a boat here. Presumably owned by Jack Sparrow, uh, looking at the parking job. I don't think we're using this boat to get anywhere in a hurry. I suppose we could get into the crow's nest, except you can't.
Some more birds in the background. Well, uh, just endless sea as far as we can see. And it seems we're standing on the end of the dock, since there is no going this way. You actually can't go this way. I think in real mists uh, you may be able to just walk into the forest, but in this game you cannot. There do appear to be some structures behind there. Some kind of brick wall. But a bit hard to make out what it is from here. There's a number of other structures on the island as well. So I'm guessing this island must have been inhabited at some point. And it looks like there is a door in the side of the dock. We'll check out what uh, is behind that door in the next video. Welcome back! The story so far. In the beginning, the universe was created. This made a lot of people very angry and has been generally considered to be a bad idea. Then we found a book in the desert, pr presumably in the desert, and ended up on this island. And we have no idea what it is, where we are, or why we're here. We did, however, find this door in the side of the docks. And we can open it. Let's see if there's something down there. Hmm, sounds like somebody put a stereo uh, down here. As you probably know, um, Myst originally was supposed to have no background music, because the uh, Miller brothers felt that that would break immersion. But um, Ro uh, Robin Miller then wrote some uh, short pieces on uh, his uh, synthesizer, and they tried them out and found that in fact it enhanced the atmosphere rather than break, uh, broke immersion. So they decided to run with it, and I'm very glad that they did, because it has a very nice atmospheric soundtrack. Even though, unfortunately, the sound quality is not all that great, despite the fact that I'm playing the Masterpiece Edition. Let's see, looks like we found some kind of pool. Some water in there. I guess we could use a drink. And it has a button on the front. Maybe that turns on the bubbles or something. Or not. That's not a pool! Some kind of uh, holographic imaging device. We turn it back on? Yes, we can! Interesting, yet pointless. One of the um, primary differences between the original Myst and the Masterpiece Edition, which I am playing, is the fact that all of the backgrounds have been uh, recreated in 24-bit color, rather than using 8-bit uh, palleted images, so they look a lot better. You can tell, however, that the same was not done for the videos, because the video still appears differed, which was necessary to... Uh, accommodate the limited color palette of the original version. But it was done for the rest of the image. Let's see what else is here. Not an awful lot. There is a panel on the wall there. With a note on it. Perhaps we can finally find out, find out uh, some more about where we are. Settings dimensional imager. Well, I guess that refers to uh, the imager that's behind us. Topographical extrusion test. 40. Water turbulent pool. 67. And marker switch diagram. 47. Well, I guess the current setting would be water turbulent pool. But where is that set? I mean, we didn't see any place where you could put 67. Maybe you need to press the button 67 times. That'd be like the worst UI ever. 
but perhaps there's more to this panel. Because it looks like it has a button on the top left corner. Aha! 67! So that's the water turbulent pool. Let's try the other two settings. Uh, let's see, it was 47 for uh, the marker switch diagram and 40 for topographical extrusion tests. I guess we just change the number and then press this button. Seems to work. Let's see. Oh, the viewer turned off when we did that. Let's see what happens when we turn it back on. Well, the image definitely changed. I suppose that this, then, is a marker switch. Whatever that is. Didn't we see one of those things on the dock in the distance? I think we did. Must be important if it's um, displayed here. Unfortunately, all we got is an image. Would have been nice if there was some kind of explanation of what it actually does, but no such luck. Let's see, let's try the uh, topographical extrusion test. I see. Some kind of 3D landscape generation thing. I think this may actually be uh, Mist Island. It's a bit hard to see, but uh, I do believe this to be the case. With this being the uh, mountain on the back, this would be the side where the forest is. The dock is on the opposite end from where we're looking at it now, and the uh, rocket is somewhere around here. Uh, we haven't seen any of those things yet, so if you're... Uh, watching this Let's Play without having played this game before and have no idea what I'm talking about, so don't worry, we'll get to that later. Although it's a bit weird if this is Mist Island, um, what are these other uh, things near it? Since there aren't any islands nearby as far as we can see. Well, I guess whoever set this thing up was... Uh, trying to uh, map out the terrain or something. I don't know what purpose this serves. I suppose we could go through all 99 combinations to see if there's a hidden message somewhere. But that's gonna take too much time, and I'm much too eager to see more of this mysterious island. I hope that for whoever lived here, this boat wasn't their only means of getting off the island. Because otherwise they'd be in trouble. And here we have one of those marker switches. Well, I guess that... Uh, must do something. Uh, maybe it marks something, I don't know. Let's see. Well, that was anticlimactic. It didn't do anything. Nope. Oh well, we'll leave it uh, switched on or up or whatever. I don't really know. Maybe it was on when we got here. We'll leave it in the other position anyway. And let's see. Some strange gears over there. That's a bit strange to put that on your island, I think. I mean, I can... Understand, um, you know, forests and buildings. You can't actually look left from here, which is a bit annoying. But why put some giant gears on uh, on your island? The only way that would make sense is if this island is actually the secret base of a James Bond villain, and that's the mechanism that magically turns the whole thing into a, lance, a launching platform for a giant rocket or something. Um, let's see, let's go up these stairs. And I actually want to check out the, um, gears first. Also might give us a nice vantage point, since it's a bit higher. And it looks like there's another one of those marker switches up there. Maybe that one 
will uh, do uh, something more interesting. That's weird. Okay, it's hard to see. One of the annoying things about this game is that unlike its uh, successor, it really doesn't have enough nodes, enough places where you can stand. So sometimes it's very difficult to get an actually good view of something. What I was talking about though is that these two gears do not appear to mesh. So what's the purpose of them? I don't know. There is music, however. And the marker switch. Maybe that turns the gears on. Nope. No such luck. And over there we can see some of the structures on the island, as well as this tall mountain that appears to be on the back of the island. And um, although it's hard to tell that you can, again, because it's really difficult in this game to figure out where you can look sometimes, you can actually look up and see that the mountain has some kind of tower on it. Could be an observatory, I guess, although I don't see uh, a telescope as such. I don't know. Perhaps we'll find out. Doesn't really appear to be anything else here. We can get a nice view of the sunken ship, though. Whoever built this stuff must have really liked, you know, classical designs. It all has a bit of an, an ancient Greek vibe here. Alright, let's uh, head this way. And see what else we might find here. We're now standing pretty much uh, above the door that we went in to the room with the dimensional imager and above the place where we started. And there is a staircase leading up here but we'll explore further in the next video. Welcome back! We are exploring this strange island to which we were magically transported And we have found a staircase leading up to the interior of the island. So far there is no sign of any inhabitants here. It's almost eerily quiet here, in fact. But what is this? A note. Catherine, I've left for you a message of utmost importance in our forechamber beside the dock. Enter the number of marker switches on this island into the imager to retrieve the, the message. Yours, Atris. Interesting. I guess the four chamber beside the dock is the uh, room we were just in, and the imager is, well, the uh, imager that we just saw there. And there is apparently a message waiting there if we um, use the number of marker switches as uh, a setting for that imager. Fortunately, we know what the marker switches are, and we've already seen two of them, so we'd better keep track. And there's the third one, actually, in front of this structure. So let's check it out. Still doesn't do anything. Let's see, some kind of round building with some columns around the edge. And a door with some kind of medallion on the front. Uh, actually, this medallion is seen um, in several places in the game, although I do not know exactly what it means. I've read some theories that it might be uh, some kind of dunny symbol, but as far as I know, nobody really knows for sure. 
Well, let's see if we can get in there. Hopefully the door isn't locked. It's not. How nice. Ah, we found this island's dentist. I think. Well, we can uh, sit in this chair. There's a weird control panel above the chair. With dates on it. And some sliders. And a button now it looks like a display. It's a bit vague though. Let's see, let's try something. Well, how far does it go? 9999. That's far. Well, something happened. Can't really tell what. Hmm, that's a bit annoying. Wait, but there's a button near the entrance. A bit conspicuous for a light switch, isn't it? A bit big. It turns the lights off and shows some stars on the ceiling. This is a planetarium. Very neat. I sort of have the impulse here to try and shut the door, but if you do that you just go outside. Or actually nothing happens. Let's see. Maybe now we can see what's going on here. Yes, this display is showing stars. I guess it's showing the view of the stars at the particular time entered in the uh, controls here. Let's see... Um... I'm going to set it to uh, today, so you can see when I recorded this Let's Play. Um, yes, I recorded this in the year 7765, but you didn't know that. I'm sending you this Let's Play from the future. Okay, maybe not. It looks like you can't really position this very accurately, but if you use the uh, arrows, it's a lot easier. That's, uh, wait, the date is, the month is wrong. It's actually May 14th, 2011, and the time is... Seven thirty-five p.m. Thirty-six. Yeah, I'm not gonna keep updating this. I'll be here all day. Well, some different stars. It's pretty neat. I could sit around uh, playing with this all day if I had OCD, which I don't. Um, but as interesting as this is. I think I want to uh, explore the island some more first. We don't really know what, what to do with this anyway. And we could look at some stars. I guess these are the stars on this world. Seen from this island maybe, or some other location? I don't know. I turn lights back on. That serves no purpose, but you can! Alright, let's see. Um, to the right of here, we actually saw another building. Again, some sort of classic-looking uh, design. Kind of reminds me of the Parthenon. They say of the Acropolis where the Parthenon is... Actually, I'm not going to tell you. I just want you to go, um, after you finish watching this video, of course, and uh, put that entire sentence, they say of the Acropolis where the Parthenon is, into the search of YouTube. Watch the video. You'll die laughing, I guarantee it. Um, let's see. 
we can go inside, of course, because, well, there is no door. And we find a... very um, nice-looking room. Somebody definitely took a lot of care and effort to um, construct this place. Someone who takes a lot of pride in this work, probably. Appears to be an oct uh, octagonal room, based on the, the center. Which, um, by which we can tell that Gen didn't build it. If you've played Riven, you'll know what I mean. Um, and its main feature appears to be these bookshelves at the end. Let's take a look. Well, most of these books aren't in very good condition, are they? They're burned to a crisp. That's a tragedy. Who would go around burning books like that? Someone been watching Fahrenheit 351. Um, some of the books appear to be in a bit better condition, though. Like this one. And it looks like a regular book, not a special book like the one we used to get here, just one with text in it. No moving images here! Well, I guess that goes for the others too, then. I guess. Wait, that's a bur burnt one. That one's okay. Um, this one looks slightly less burnt than the rest. Hey, that one doesn't have text in it, but these strange patterns. Knitting patterns? I don't know. Some kind of puzzle book? Dunny version of Sudoku? I doubt it. Man, how many of these are there? Whoever made this really liked patterns, I guess. There we go, that's the last one. 300! That's a lot of patterns. And there's one more good-looking book. I, this one. Which is another regular book. I wonder, did somebody put the, um, the unburnt book onto the shelves after the... Um, after the fire? Or did the fire just somehow not affect those couple of books? Maybe they have uh, fireproof covers. Who knows? Well, as interesting as it would be to uh, read these books and learn a bit more, maybe perhaps it can tell us more about our surroundings here, I don't really want to spend uh, half an hour reading here. I much I'd much rather explore some more of this island first, so we'll leave that be for now. Um, let's see, there's some more books here, but like I said, I really don't want to get bogged down reading. And another one, I guess these two books might be special if they're called out so specifically by putting them on these separate pedestals rather than uh, on the shelves. But again, I really don't want to waste any time reading right now. One thing that might be of interest, though, is this painting, which looks like a map of this island. And that could be useful in our explorations. Let's take a closer l Wait. That's not normal behavior for a painting, is it? It's definitely a map of this island. I mean, th this would be the docks and the... Um, uh, the gears, and the planetarium, and the library. I guess this would be the tower that we saw. Why is it blinking? Ooh, if you touch that spot in the painting, something happens. It says tower rotation, and we can hear uh, an awful lot of noise. I guess we can point it at stuff. Yes, we can point it at the uh, gears. Interestingly, though, 
the um, west side of the island, assuming this map is north-oriented, which I'm not entirely sure of, is um, rather barren. It seems that the only places that actually show up uh, on this map are places that we've visited. Is this a magic map like in, uh, in Kings Wars 3 that only shows places you've visited? I don't know. We'll have to uh, find out more about it in the next video. Welcome back. We have found this painting in the library, or at least I think it's a library, um, judging by the bookshelf anyway, which shows us places on this island that we've already visited. Somehow. I don't know, is this a magic map? Like in King's Cross 3, perhaps? We don't know. It also allows us to apparently rotate the tower or something, which appears to be the tower that we saw before. And I pointed it at those gears, or at least I made sure the line intersected. And judging by the noise it made, something definitely happened. Now one thing that you might wonder is whether or not we can see the result of that um, action. But the answer is no, you cannot. It is not actually visible what you do with the tower. I think you can see it in uh, Real Mist, but not in this version of the game. That image is always the same. I guess because the tower is sort of, sort of in the shadows. I don't know what that's for, though. Alright, uh, well, we'll leave the library and its books uh, for later, because, like I said, I don't really want to get bogged down uh, when, with reading when there's so much exploring to do. So, let's see. Uh, it's not a very big island. We've reached the other side. There's a path leading behind the um, library to a spaceship, or a rocket, any in a in any case. That's sort of not what I expected to find here. There's also um, a power cable going from the spaceship to some other place. And the pillar that that's attached to appears to have a ladder on it. Let's see if we can get down there. Yes, looks like it. Of course, if you've played um, Real Mists, you might realize that there's supposed to be something in this particular p uh, platform, I think. I think it's this one. It's either this one or this one. But you cannot see that here. I assume it's still here. We just can't see it. Let's see if we can uh, climb up here. Maybe we can get a nice view. It's pretty windy here. Makes you wonder how that note uh, we found is actually staying on the grass. Would have blown away, more likely. Oh, well, it's a power cable and a switch. That doesn't seem to do much. The view from there was a bit disappointing. All we could see was ocean. Alright, let's uh, see if we can find this, uh, or find something interesting in this spaceship, or rocket. Hmm. You know, if you're planning to launch this thing, it's really not in the right orientation, is it? But there is another marker switch, that's number four. Keeping count uh, because of that message that we can supposedly see. But again, it doesn't seem to do anything. What are these switches for? Can we go into the rocket? No, we cannot. Really looks like a 1950s short sci-fi movie type rocket. I wonder why that door won't open. Maybe the rocket doesn't have power. So, I guess we'd better find out where that power line goes. 
see the back of the library from here. And you kind of keep wanting to look at things, but can't, because there's no screens in between. Again, that's something that Riven is much better at, at providing you uh, intermediate viewpoints of places where you expect them to be. But then again, Riven was uh, five CDs, whereas this game fits on one. So that explains why they have to uh, be a bit more careful with um, their disk space usage. Alright, um, well the power cable goes off to the left there. I didn't mean to go down. So let's follow the path down here. More columns leading into the forest. There's some structures on the back of the island as well. And I guess some kind of bird bath or something. And a number of boxes on legs in front of each column. Look at the bird bath. Scale model of the boat at the dock. Including the fact that it's sunken. That's just weird. It either suggests that after the boat sunk, somebody went and built a sunken scale model of it, or they maybe they already had built a skill, a skill model, model and then were so upset that it didn't match anymore that they sunk it uh, as well. It kind of gives me the impression that perhaps the sinking of the boat is deliberate, though. Otherwise, why have a skill model that's also sink sunken? I don't know. Let's take a look at these boxes in front of the pillars. They have symbols on them. This looks like some kind of bird. A swan, maybe. And if we hold our hand near it, it lights up. That's sort of neat. Let's see what happens if we touch it. it turns green. It doesn't really seem to do anything. And touch it again, turns red again. Let's check out some of the um, others. This can be also very hard to do to make sure that you see all of them. There's eight in total. And this one has on it the Templar's Cross. I guess, that's what it reminds me of anyway. And we can turn it green as well, but as before, no effect. Um, did we move? No. A maple leaf! Maybe the person who lived here was Canadian. Hmm. And finally... An arrow. Can turn it green too, but no effect. And there is a marker switch here. That's number five. Looks like there's a structure in the woods behind there. We'll see if we can get to that later. There's more boxes on the other side of the path, though. Another structure there. It looks like that's where the power cable that goes to the spaceship um, comes from. We'll check that out momentarily. Let's see. An anchor. That's sort of appropriate, I guess, if we're if this is anything to do with the ship. And uh spider. No, it's not a spider. It only has six legs. A bug. A beetle, perhaps. That would be appropriate, considering this is a missed game. Um It's always hard to tell if you or not. This one has a snake on it. What's the point of these things? I don't know. And the last one has an eye. So 
So we got quite a collection of symbols here, but uh, there doesn't really seem to be any kind of uh, connection between them. No logical uh, way we could say, okay, these ones are the odd one out or something. I guess we, sh we could try turning uh, all of them green, but uh, well, we'll do that if we can't find any better way to explain what to do with this. For now, let's move on. We've got more stuff to explore. Let's check out that structure on the right where the power cable goes. Let's see some... Um, go back here. You can... Well, we could see some butterflies there, but um, they appear to have gone. Let's try that again. They've disappeared. That's not nice of them. I guess they were scared by us. There's a clock tower. In the distance, it appears to be 12 o'clock. And, um, we'll check that out later. I first want to look at this structure. Ooh, marker switch number six. Still doesn't do anything. And we'll see what we can find here in the next video. Welcome back. We found this structure, which appears to be where the um, power line, assuming it is a power line, it certainly looks like one, uh, that goes to the spaceship originates. This building, at least, appears to have some power, because I can see lights. The first sign of uh, actual power that we've seen here. Although, actually, um, that's not true, because the, the imager also worked in the um, forechamber by the dock. And whatever rotates that tower when we use the painting also must use a lot of power. So I'm talking out of my arse here. It's not the first sign of power we've seen. Um, hard to tell, but you can actually go between the trees and the building here. Which leads down to another pillar. Where we can find another switch. I guess these are breakers or something. And from here we can also see uh, the pillars and the bird buff. And back in the distance between the trees, or behind the trees, is the uh, planetarium. Nice view of the sea here. You'd expect there to be more waves considering how windy it uh, sounds like it is. It's also not a very nice day. It's kind of misty. Appropriate, I suppose. Nothing else back here, though, so let's go inside. This place is kind of creepy. It leads underground. This is actually the second underground uh, structure that we've seen. After the four chamber. Although this one seems to be a bit deeper. Fortunately, it is a well lit tunnel, otherwise, it would be really creepy. And somebody f uh, made the effort to make some steps here. Although the walls appear to be just plain rock. And there's the end of the passage, which ends in a door, which I suppose opens with this button. Hmm. We've got a large room. This appears to have something to do with the electricity, considering these um, lines that run from it. Two gauges and a whole bunch of buttons. Let's see what happens. Something turns on. And it's... Both of the gauges now say 10. I'm a bit hesitant, though, to play with a device that I do not understand. And let's look around here a little bit more. Behind us, we find a 
diagram of some of some kind. I guess this explains the control panel. The left gauge shows power, the right gauge shows power to the spaceship, and the switches turn on generators. So I guess this place generates power for that spaceship that we saw. So now we're generating 10, I don't know, volts, watts, amperes, joules, something. And um, the spaceship is also receiving 10 units or of whatever it is of power. Maybe that means now we can open the door. I want to check that out. Which means we have to go back up. And I kind of wanted to go here. Well, that's a bit disappointing. It's more than we got last time, though. It sounds like something's happening, but then it dies. It sounds like an engine dying. Maybe it's not getting enough power. Maybe we need to do something with these uh, switches now. Let's try that out. That still doesn't really appear to do anything. Alright. In the words of James T. Kirk, let's give it more power, Scotty. Let's see, you got 10, 17. That looked like not all these generators generate the same amount of power. The first one gave us 10, the second one only adds 7. And then we get an additional 8. Well, let's just try turning on all of them. 49. Hey, we got 71 generated power, but the spaceship just went to zero. That's not good. Let's turn back off. Spaceship doesn't come back on, though. That's annoying. I guess she cannot take it, Captain. Well, we're not uh, getting that door open if there's no power to the spaceship. But uh, I don't feel like spending hours and hours working this out right now. Tr with trial and error to see how much power we need to sh send to the spaceship. So let's um, continue our exploration first. Wow, it's still 12 o'clock. Time is either moving really slowly here or that clock is broken. Also a wind vane on the top. Let's check it out. Mark switch number 7. But, we can't reach it, to switch it. I guess I can't swim or something. Maybe these waters are just as treacherous as those around the uh, uh, land of the Green Isles. And we would immediately be sucked under by the undertow if we tried to go into the water. Although, judging by the looks of them, I'd say probably not. In fact, I'd say that these waters have to be very calm pretty much all of the time. Otherwise, this tower would be um, partially submerged if, uh, if there's some really heavy waves. Also makes it seem like this place does not have tides. Or maybe the tower uh, is just somewhat higher above the uh, water some uh, some part of the time. If this place truly does not have tides, it either means that we're not actually in the sea, just a very, very large lake, or this is not Earth. Of course, I actually know this is not Earth. I have no idea whether or not the place is not uh, has uh, no tides, however. I'm just speculating. This clock appears to be broken. 
Then there's these controls down here. Let's see what they do. They look like they might uh, open a valve or something. Doesn't appear to have any immediately obvious effect. Maybe we need to push the button. Nope, that doesn't do anything either. Hey! The clock changed! The uh, minute hand changed by 30 minutes. And the hour hand changed by two hours. And we rotated the left uh, wheel six times. And the right wheel two times. So that makes me think. Let's see. One, two, three. Yes. The left wheel controls the um, minute hand. And the right wheel controls the hour hand. So we can decide what time it is. We just made it a quarter to five. Doesn't appear to actually achieve anything. But nifty. Let's see. So we've reached the end of the island. It's not terribly big. And here in the woods... We find... What looks like a log cabin. I guess we also find many March Moosen in the Woodson. Or possibly not. Back there we can see a structure made of brick, which I believe to be the same structure uh, we could see in between the trees um, from the docks. However, I kind of want to check out the log cabin first. Also, marker switch number eight. We can switch on this one. Whatever the hell that accomplishes. And, um... Let's see... I guess we'll see what's inside this log cabin... ...in the next video. Welcome back! We have... ...located a log cabin... In the woods on mist. Well, I guess we don't need to uh, wonder where he got the wood to build this thing from, because there's plenty of trees around here. Whoever built this, anyway. And um, we also found the eighth marker switch. We're keeping count of them because the note said we could use the number of marker switches to get a message from the uh, imager. Let's see what's inside this log cabin. Maybe some living quarters? Or... Maybe it's empty except for what looks like a boiler at the end. Also, a picture of a giant tree. Or something. I don't know. Doesn't look like this is doing anything. But there is a wheel. Let's try turning it. Hmm. I can hear something. Gas, I presume. But nothing appears to be happening. Guess we'd better turn that back off. Otherwise, if we find a, uh, a light or something, we'd blow the whole place up. Which would uh, be bad. I can see why this doesn't work. There's a pilot light here, and it appears to be off. But unfortunately, I don't smoke, so I don't have any matches with me. So, oh, there is more to this block cabin. There is, in fact, uh, a safe. Strange place to put it. I kind of keep wanting to close the doors to see if there's anything behind them. Like you would in uh, Riven, where that does actually happen several times. But you can't. Let's see. It's a safe with a combination. And the combination is not zero, zero, zero. Maybe it's one, two, three. The combination an idiot would use. No. 
What's in there? Money? Jewels? Gold bullion? Important documents? I don't know. I suppose we could try and brute force that. I mean, it's only 999 possibilities, but I don't feel like that. Maybe one of the books in the library will contain the combination anyway. Who knows? Let's see, we can see another structure behind the um, log cabin. And we can actually go there. And it appears to be a wall somebody built around one of the trees. Why though? What's so special about this tree? Ah, that's what's special about it. It's very, very tall. Much taller than any of the other trees. I guess um, whoever built this found it important enough to protect, for whatever reason. And wait a second, this sort of looks... This looks familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, appears to be the same tree here. So I wonder if this boiler has anything to do with that tree. But as long as we don't have any way to um, actually light the, the fire under the boiler, we cannot find out. It also looks like we've reached the end. Nothing, el uh, nowhere else to go. Nothing else to explore. And unless there are any more marker switches in hidden location, I uh, locations, I guess that there are eight of them. Which means I'd rather like to uh, go back to the four chamber and see if we can see that message that um, this note talking about. Again, listen to how windy it is. How is that staying there? It uh, looks like it's glued to the grass or something. So, back into um, the four chamber. And there's one thing I've always wondered about. If this is a four chamber, what's behind it? What is it, is it a four chamber to? Well, considering we never see any living quarters here, um, it has been theorized that um, the whoever lived here lived underground. Although, why would they do that? That seems a bit strange. And that the four chamber would lead to um, those living quarters, but we don't know. Again, seems a bit weird to do that on purpose, but... I don't know. We've seen stranger things, that's for sure. I mean, it would be no stranger than a book that magically transports you to the place um, um, that it shows in an image, wouldn't it? Okay, let's try see if we can get that message. There are eight marker switches on the island, which I guess that if we had tried all of the combinations, starting at zero zero, we would have found this fairly quickly. But let's take a look what kind of important message it is, and hopefully it will tell us a bit more about this place. Catherine, my love, I have to leave quickly. Something terrible has happened. It's hard for me to believe most of my books have been destroyed. Catherine, it's one of our sons. I suspect Akinar, but... I shouldn't leave to conclusions. I'll find him and Cirrus as well. Oh, I should have known better than to have left my library unchecked for so long. Well, I've removed the remaining undamaged books from the library and placed them in the places of protection. You shouldn't have to use the books until I return. But... If you've forgotten the access keys, remember the tower rotation. Oh, and don't worry, Catherine. Everything will be fine. I'll see you shortly. Oh, wait. 
and erase this message after you viewed it just to be safe. Now that was very interesting. Although the person speaking never identifies himself, considering he's addressing Catherine, and uh, we saw that note before mentioning this message, I guess it's pretty safe to assume that this is Atrus. Uh, and in fact, that is the case. And uh, one wonders what happened to him if he lived here. He also mentions... Um, the burnt books we saw in the library, and he said that uh, that he put the remaining burnt books in places of protection, but we saw uh, the remaining unburnt books in places of protection, but we saw unburnt books on the shelf, so that doesn't sound like much protection to me. It seems that this island was the home of at least four people. Atrus, his wife Catherine, and their sons, Cyrus and Achenar, all mentioned in this message. From the novels, we actually know that Anna, Atrus's grandmother, also lived here for a time, and in real Mist, uh, as well as uh, the ending of Mist 5, you can see her grave here on the island. Presumably it's also there in this game, but uh, since it's in the middle of the forest and the game doesn't actually let us go there, we can't uh, go and see it. Atrus was actually a survivor of the Dunny, the last survivor, as far as you know, is at this point in time. The Dunny were the descendants of a race called the Rone, who lived on a world called Gartene. They had the ability to create books that were links to, pl uh, to the places they described, like the mist book we used to come here. When Gartene's son was about to go Nova, some of the Rone, led by a man named Rinareff, fled to Dunny, a great cavern which we know is on Earth, to start a new life. The Dunny thrived for 10,000 years until one day a human woman from the surface, Anna, Atrus's grandmother, found her way into the Dunny cavern and fell in love with and married Atrus, another Atrus actually, who was the grandfather of this Atrus. It's kind of complicated. You need, uh, almost need a diagram just because they have the same name. Um, her presence actually caused a, tr a chain reaction that led to some radical elements uh, in Dunny society, who believed uh, in Dunny's superiority and purity, to cause the destruction of Dunny itself. When Dunny fell, the old Atrus sacrificed himself to ensure that Anna and their son Gen could safely escape to the surface. Um, the message we just saw raises a couple of questions, though. It seems that uh, Atrus, this Atrus, not the old one, anyway, uh, believes that um, one of his sons, Cyrus and Achenar, apparently, uh, were responsible for burning the, those books in the library. Which leaves the question, why did they do that? Uh, what, what was so important about those books that they, that they burnt it? And which one of them actually did it? And also, what happened to Atrus and Catherine? Why haven't they returned to Mist? And did the intended recipient of this message, uh, presumably Catherine, ever actually see it? Because, well, Atrus said to um, erase this message, and that obviously never happened. So although this message answers some questions, it only raises some more. Uh, which, I guess, means there's nothing uh, left for us to do in order to find out more than to take a closer look at the um, library, which we'll do in the next video. Welcome back. We just saw a message here from, uh, presumably, Atrus, who warned his wife Catherine about um, their sons, one of whom appears to be responsible for the burning of the books in the library, and um, he suspected uh, Achenar, but he said he shouldn't leap to conclusions, and I agree. He also said that the message should be erased after viewing, which apparently never happened, which makes you wonder whether or not Catherine um, ever actually saw this message. And if um, she did, why didn't she erase it? And what happened to the both of them? We can actually erase the message, like uh, it said. The way to do that 
It's not very obvious, but um, it is possible. What you do is you go back to the controls here, push the button, and while it is beeping, once it reaches the faster series of beeps, push the button again. And if you hear that series of notes, it means that you've now erased the messages. Or the message. See, nothing happens anymore. You can also erase the, um, the other three um, settings. There's no point in doing this. But it is possible. Which is kind of neat. In the last video, I actually talked about um, the question of where did uh, Atris and Catherine actually live? One theory, as I said, is that they live underground, which is sort of possible, I guess, considering um, that Atris, as a dunny, has very sensitive eyes. So he might prefer to live underground, but it still doesn't really make an awful lot of sense. We also don't see any place where they could grow food, unless they just ate, uh, ate a lot of fish, I guess. Or get fresh water, or any of the, the other necessities you would need to actually live here. Of course, since they had access to other um, ages, I suppose they could have gotten some of the necessities from there. However, the official explanation given by uh, Richard Watson, uh, a Cyan employee, is that actually Nist Island is bigger than what we see in the game. It was just technical limitations that uh, made it necessary for them to only show those places in the game that are actually relevant, rather than all of the stuff. Uh, all of the stuff. Whether or not you uh, choose to believe that is up to you. Some people uh, adamantly refuse to accept that there's anything that happened uh, in real life, quote-unquote, that isn't shown in the games. But if you accept the literary agent's uh, hypothesis, which uh, Mist does use, then that explanation certainly becomes possible. Alright, um, we've run out of places to explore, and although the message gave us some insight um, as to uh, where we are and what's going on, it raised more questions than it answered, so I guess the uh, best thing to do would be to go into the library and look at some of the books here. Um, however, I kind of want to look at that map again, because last time we were here I posited the theory that it is a magic map showing only the places where we've been, like the one in Kingsford 3. Let's see if that theory holds up. Looks like it does. All of the places we visited, uh, which is now the, basically the entire island, are now visible, except for the clock tower, which of course we haven't visited yet. Wait a second. There's another thing that all of these places have in common, except for the fact that we visited them. There's a marker switch at each of these places. Let's test that theory. We've been flipping uh, marker switches left and right, so let's see what happens if we turn one off. Um, there we go. Yes, now the planetarium disappeared from the map. So that's what the marker switches do. They determine what is or is not visible on the map. Let's turn that back on. Because I kind of like seeing all of the uh, place on the map. What purpose does that serve, though? It appears to have something to do with the tower rotation. As uh, Atris uh, talks about as well in his message. Which has something to do with uh, access codes to reach the books that were placed in the places of protection. Or something. I don't really know what any of that means yet. This painting definitely uh, seems to rotate the actual tower based on the amount of noise it makes. But what can we accomplish with that? We didn't find any way to get to the tower. 
Let's look at some of the books here, though. Um, there uh, are two books that are sort of more important than the rest, or seemingly more important, because they are placed on these separate shelves rather than on the main bookshelves. So I guess uh, if these really are more important, we should check those out first. Let's see. Red book and the page next to it. Let's check out the book first. Wait, this is not an ordinary book. This appears to be one of those special books. A linking book, actually. Like the one we used to get here, except it's suffering from bad reception. Maybe we need to adjust the antenna or something. I don't know. Doesn't look like it works, and indeed we can't touch it to uh, travel to wherever it links to. We can't see where it links to either, because the panel is just distorted. Maybe this uh, page is another note or something that could give us more information. Or maybe we can just pick it up. Let's see. Red page, red book. Maybe they belong together. Let's try that out. Well, something happened. Let's see if anything changed in the book. Lie. Now, who are you? Bring me a red. Well, that was weird. And quite hard to make out, actually. Because it was still very uh, bad reception or whatever. But among the snippets that we could make out, it was very clearly um, that this person uh, is called Cirrus, which is one of the sons that Atrus mentioned. And he seems to want us to... Uh, Bring him the red pages, because he wants to be rescued or something. Well, since the book went from completely useless to at least showing this person by adding one red page, maybe we can further improve the image by adding more red pages, but that we'll have to find them, though. Let's see. Well, the red page shows us one of Atreus's sons. I have a feeling that of the red book. I have a feeling that this blue book on the other side of the library would show the other one. Let's try that out. Well, like the uh, red book, this one is totally and utterly useless. But there's another page next to it, a blue page, so that might match this book. Wait, can we put a blue page in the red book to make a purple book, I guess? Nope, doesn't work, and it just repeats the message, actually. So, anyway, um, let's just put it in the book where it belongs. Let's see, Atreus' second son, I suppose. No, it's not. Help 
ring, ring. Blue pages. Never, never. Pages. I must have the blue page. Hmm. Again, a very hard to understand message. Except it's clear that, um, like Cyrus wanted us to bring him the uh, red pages, this guy wants the blue ones. I suppose for the same reason. Came across as a bit neurotic, though. They're both pretty strange uh, characters, I would say. But what to do with them? Well, we'll consider that in the next video. Welcome back. We have met the two brothers, Sirs and Akinar, sons of Atrus. Although we didn't learn an awful lot from them, unfortunately. The main thing that got through uh, when talking to each one of them is that they are looking for red and blue pages, respectively. Though for what reason is not entirely sure. Sirius, at the very least, seemed to implicate that um, he needed them to be rescued. Which seems to indicate that they're actually trapped in these books or something like that. Which is... Peculiar, to say the least. We also don't yet know if Atrus was correct in his um, accusation that one of the, his sons is responsible for burning the books in the library. And if he is, which one of them? Atrus said he'd, uh, he suspected Akinar. But, um, well, I'm not sure which of uh, the two would really be guilty. We don't really have any information to uh, base that on at this point. We also don't know why they or anyone else would want to burn these books. What's so important about them? I guess the only uh, way to find that out is to actually check them out. Now, the interesting thing is that Atrus said in his message in the Imager that he'd placed the remaining books in their places of protection. Yet, we clearly see there's several unburned books on the shelves here, and I don't think these shelves count as a place of protection, otherwise it would be a very bad protection. But, that kind of suggests that there might be other books, somehow more important books, that uh, are hidden away somewhere. So how can we gain access to those? And um, what's so important about them? Why would Catherine need to use them? Or whatever. I don't know any of those things. But the answer might lie in one of these books. So I guess it's time for us to check them out. So um, I'm just going to pick one at random. Let's do this one. It has... A sun on the cover, I think. It looks like a sun, anyway. Let's see what secrets it reveals. It has been a while since I have heard only silence, and I enjoy it greatly, I think. For some reason, I do not feel altogether welcome in this new world in which I have arrived. But how could I be unwelcome in an age with no inhabitants? It is, of course, only in my head. This world is very beautiful. But I think I have yet to ever write in a journal that an age I have linked to is horrid or disgusting. From the grassy hill where I am standing, I can see the green fields below, along with a few scattered forests. A rather large lake looms some distance from where I am standing, yet the water's blue can be seen plainly from here. The air is fresh, and the sky is sparkled with white clouds. It is absolutely breathtaking. And yet, that strange feeling again. Perhaps it is the hot breeze that continues to blow from the north. 
hotter than I would have imagined. It almost singes my skin, and I feel quite uncomfortable when it comes. I will try to ignore it. Night has almost arrived, and the sunset is spectacular. Oranges and reds have settled above the western horizon. Though night has come, the horizon still glows red long past the sunset. Dark reds flow from the horizon and blend into the black sky. Again, the feeling, and I'm beginning to believe it is not all in my mind. I must sleep now, I will need my strength to explore more tomorrow. I have had to return home due to an unpredictable natural occurrence more frightening than I have ever experienced. I was awakened by terrible shakings in the ground and explosions on all sides of me. Gigantic balls of fire were falling from the sky and I immediately left in fear of my life. I must remember to bring a missed linking book with me when I return, in case the one I left there has been destroyed or damaged. I have returned to a different world than the one I left only three months ago. It has been transformed into a barren, desert land with only gigantic craters scattered across the land to provide variety. Strangely enough, the small grassy hill where I spent my first night remains exactly the way I found it. Apparently, the falling meteors did not hit this area, leaving an oasis in the midst of this horrible desolation. The hot wind, I remember, has turned into a rather pleasant breeze, which is at least one improvement. I fear it is the only improvement. The magnificent lake I saw on my first visit is now completely dried up. However, another lake now exists and appears to be quite a bit larger. I assume one of the falling meteors created this lake due to its circular shape and the jutting rock that grows out of the center of the lake. The rest of this world seems like desert, although I will verify that statement with closer inspection. But this world has little visual excitement to offer, it offers much to the ears. Sounds constantly throw through my ears, and I have found where a few of them originate. It seems, as Catherine says, I do find beauty in everything. Last night I was awakened by a horrible hissing. I was sweating, and the heat was so intense that I immediately dipped my head in a nearby stream to cool it down. The hot breezes had returned, along with a low roar from the ground. I walked a short distance to observe some red flame shooting up from the earth. Suddenly, the ground began to crack, and a huge chasm opened. The chasm continued to grow until it was far too wide to cross. Then the tumult subsided, leaving only a dull roar. I have decided, however, I can use the chasm to my advantage. Perhaps the heat from the chasm can be harnessed. And there's a diagram here uh, of a pipe above uh, what looks to be lava, so I guess that is how he plans to harness that heat. Even as the chasm has ripped into the surface of this world, it has opened up a whole new world to explore. Although uncomfortably hot, I found it possible to reach a cave in that chasm that had been created, and have now explored deep into the crust of this planet. I found a vast underground cave system that will take many years to map and explore. I will also look for a safer way to reach the underground than through the chasm wall. This age seems to change on its own, so I feel I should leave again and see if things are different when I return. It is also important that I check on Cirrus and Akinar, and make sure everything is going along well. When I return, I also hope to bring back some tools I will need for my plans to explore the underground. The abundance of raw materials here is beginning to amaze me. I have returned with some of the com complex tools I knew I would be needing. I assumed I would have to return for more basic materials, however, it seems as though I will be able to find everything I need here. Of course, iron is abundant, but I have also found titanium occurring naturally. I am all the more excited to begin work. Everything is set, and I look forward to the morrow. My raw materials are all here. I think I will be able to have most of my additions to this age completed within one year. I so love working with my hands, whether writing or building. Unfortunately, it seems that part of this journal is unreadable. Let's see if any of the uh, other pages hold uh, more readable passages. Here we can read only one sentence. Well, and I have decided. There's a diagram of something, as well as a drawing of a satellite dish or something that looks like a satellite dish, anyway. Three meters is not enough support for the... 
beams. Hmm. Amazingly strong. And a drawing of a spaceship that strongly resembles the one we can see here on Mist Island. I wonder if that's the same spaceship or if they're uh, or if it's somehow related. To be one of my most prized inventions. I am extreme. Would never have imagined it to come together. I doubt. Could possibly work with 14 instead of completely fatigued. I'm so happy to have completed tomorrow. I'm leaving today in order to bring back Cirrus and Akinar. I have left them alone on Channelwood. I believe they will enjoy all there is to see here. The age seems to have stabilized. I believe the meteors set off a period of volcanic activity by piercing into the shallow crust. But the tremors have become few. I have just noticed that a large amount of this journal has curiously vanished from the very pages on which I wrote over the last 18 months. Fortunately, I have copied many of my construction notes in another journal. I do not understand the many mysteries of this world, but I trust I will discover logical answers to my questions. I have a feeling that many of my questions can be answered in another age, to which I hope to travel soon. But for now, I must simply accept this world's mysteries and take pride in my accomplishments. Finally, a drawing of a piano. That seems sort of out of place, doesn't it? Why would there be a drawing of a piano here? What does that have to do with anything else? And... A map, I guess, of uh, the place described in this journal, which is definitely not the island we're currently on. I guess this is the circular lake with the rock in the middle that uh, was described. And that's the final page. And we will continue in the next video. Welcome back. We have just finished reading one of the books from these shelves, uh, which appeared to be a journal. Although it didn't mention who the, who the author was, from the various mentions of Cirrus and Akinar, I would su uh, suspect it to be Atris. The journal itself described a place very unlike the island uh, we're currently on, but it isn't clear where it is or how to get there. One peculiar thing to note is that he described this place as an age, which is a strange word to use in this context, um, unless time travel is involved or something. It is unclear, however, what this journal has to do with our current predicament, except for the mentions of Sirius and Akinar. And one other thing, the drawing of the spaceship that we have um, seen on this island. Right outside uh, the library, in fact. And then there's still the matter of the so-called places of protection and the tower rotation. It's unclear what we can actually achieve by using the tower rotation. Because we don't know how to get to the tower. If that is even possible at all. Perhaps we need to investigate this library a bit closer, because we haven't yet looked at everything in here. For one thing, there's a fireplace. Did you see a chimney on this thing from the outside? I didn't. So is this a real fireplace, or just decorative? Maybe it's an electric fireplace. But, oh, you can actually go inside the fireplace. Well, I guess, why wouldn't you be able to? Which gives us an interesting view of the library, but otherwise seems to serve no purpose, except... There's a button. Now that's not a normal thing for fireplaces to do. It lowered the a door or something, which has this plate on it. And let's see, is there anything on this plate? Hmm. If we touch it, we can make squares appear and disappear.
I can make drawings this way. Neat! You know what this reminds me of? The book of patterns that we saw on the shelves earlier. Those were 8x6 patterns, and this is also an 8x6 grid. So I guess that they are connected. So maybe if you enter some of the patterns from the book here, something would happen. But since there's 300 patterns to choose from, I don't really feel like uh, trying that out unless I have no other option. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. Fortunately, the button uh, releases us from the fireplace, so we're not trapped in there. The uh, other thing we haven't looked at yet is the other two paintings. They're actually quite peculiar paintings. Because... Why would you put a painting of the exit of the library in the library? I mean, if I want to see the exit, I can just look here. Not really much point in me looking at this painting. Can I get a closer look at it? Or maybe there's something behind it? I guess not. But when we touch it... It buzzes. I don't know about you, but I don't have any paintings that buzz when I touch them. No, it doesn't seem to have accomplished anything else. How about the other painting? This also looks like uh, it might be in the library, although I don't have—I haven't actually seen anything exactly like this. It just looks sort of like it should be here, with the arch the pattern being the same. Let's see if something happens when we touch this painting. It does. A trap door opens behind the shelves. Clever. And if you look around, you'll find that the door is now closed. Which means we're trapped. Which is not a good thing. Except... Maybe this other painting can help us. Yep, now the door's open again. But it seems only e um, either the door or the uh, trap door can be open, not both at the same time. And I want to see what behind uh, what's behind the trap door. So let's open that again. The trap door is actually on the opposite side of the entrance, meaning it leads towards the uh, mountains where the tower is. And since we were looking for an entrance into the tower, this may just be what we were looking for. Let's see. A dark passage. Leading to... A cave. At least uh, the walls are... Appear to be uh, rough stone. Whereas the floor is tiled, so that's a bit nicer. And this looks like it might be an elevator or something. Where we see a... button. And... a label saying library. Let's see what happens when we push the button. It is an elevator. And in true Miss Tradition, it can't just go straight up. No, it has to turn. I don't know why the lights in the elevator have to go out while it's moving. It gets more dramatic that way. Okay, we're in the tower. That's what we hoped. And there is a ladder here with a symbol of a book behind it. Hmm, let's see. What's on the top? Nothing. Looks like this is an opening in the tower and we can actually see rock behind it. Which is a bit peculiar considering that the tower appeared to be... ...above uh, 
the mountain. So technically I would actually expect it to just show a part of the island rather than just rock. But I guess they didn't uh, want to make images for every possible position of the uh, tower, so <laughs> this is easier. And we can actually walk around the uh, elevator to find another ladder with the symbol of a key behind it. Hmm. Didn't Atrus say that the tower rotation had something to do with access keys to the places of protection? So maybe this key means access key. But again, there's nothing to see here. But we must remember, as Atrus said, the tower rotation. Let's see if um, we can accomplish something with that. Because at the moment, I don't think the tower is uh, pointed at any of the elements on the island that it stops at, if you uh, use the map painting. So, let's uh, try that out. Now, there's actually four things on the map that it stops at. We've already seen that it um, stops at uh, the gears. It also stops, or turns red anyway, at the uh, crow's nest, the sunken ship, at the giant tree, and finally at the spaceship. And we saw a drawing of the spaceship in the journal, so I'm guessing that journal and the uh, spaceship have something to do with each other, so let's point that at the spaceship, see if we can find something out about that. Since we couldn't see the effect of rotating the tower from the outside, let's see if we can see it from the inside instead. Let's go back up. if this had any effect. We'll get to see this elevator ride a lot. Wait, did the tower have music last time we were here? I don't think so. So we must have accomplished something. Let's see. If we go up here now, we see that we can look outside, and indeed, we see the spaceship, which we pointed it at. So what can we see on the opposite side, where the key is? There's a plaque on the rock wall, and it says... 59 volts. Well, that's exceedingly vague. Except... We saw those generators before that could power... the spaceship. And we found that if we overpowered it it would stop working, and if we underpowered it, the door still wouldn't open. So maybe 59 volts is the amount of power we need to actually give it for it to work. Certainly worth a try. Which I guess also answers the question of what units uh, those generators used. It's volts. I guess we will have to see if we can 
open up the spaceship by using the access key we just found in the next video. Welcome back. By using the tower rotation, we have uncovered the amount of power needed to uh, properly power the spaceship, namely 59 volts. And in order to try that out, we have to get back to um, the uh, outside, of course. So we need to close the secret passage and open the door. That did the trick. Naturally, wasn't expecting otherwise. Okay, so let's see. Need to go back in here. So we can set the power. Um. Wait, the spaceship isn't getting any power at the moment. Because we gave it too much power. Let's see if we can fix that. I have a hunch that it might involve those switches that we saw. I'm not sure if this one actually works. Well, it did make a noise that it didn't make before. Let's see if that helped. Yes, you can use either of the switches, I think. Um, you don't need to do both. They appear to be breakers, which uh, trip whenever you give the spaceship too much power. And um, using the switch, you can reset the breakers. So the spaceship gets power again. Which is pretty clever. At least prevents us from accidentally blowing up the spaceship or, you know, melting its power system or something. It's a good uh, bit of safety there. Alright, so we need to give it 59 volts. Let's see. 41, 46, 47, 49, 71. Damn! Trip the breaker again. I don't actually need to go back and reset the breaker. Because um, you can just set 59 volts first and then reset the breaker. Oh, there we go, 58. That's closed, but no cigar. I'm gonna leave this one on. This is pretty easy to do just by trial and error. But we got a 1 here somewhere. Yes, there we go. 59. There's multiple ways you can do that, actually. And uh, I usually get different ones. Because, like I said, I just do it by trial and error. I haven't really... Uh, made any notes on how to do that. Because it's so easy just to... Uh, get the right number by fiddling around. So there's many different combinations that give you uh, 59. This is one of them, which sort of has the uh, benefit of being pleasingly symmetric. Alright, now we have 59 volts. So let's um, uh, switch the breaker again. Let's use the other one this time. tell when it did something when it makes that sound. And now it makes only a light clicking sound, indicating that nothing happened, because, well, the breaker wasn't uh, triggered. So you don't need to reset it either. And now, with power hopefully established, let's see if we can get inside. It worked! Let's see what's inside. Some kind of view screen. 
which from the cursor it looks like we can touch, but nothing happens when we try. And a couple of sliders and a lever. These do not look like very practical spaceship controls. Let's see what the sliders do. They set a sound. All of them allow you to pick um, a pitch level, I guess, a tone, but for what purpose? And what do we need to set them to, if anything? Let's see if anything happens if we uh, pull this uh, lever. It plays the sequence and then nothing happens. Hmm. Well, I guess there is a proper combination, but there's definitely way too many possibilities here for me to just try that out at random. So let's check out the rest of the spaceship. Equally logical to have in a spaceship is, of course, a pipe organ. Wait, what? If only Rosella was here, because I don't know how to play the pipe organ. And she obviously did. And she had more luck doing it than uh, King Graham. Um, but let's see, can we actually play this organ? Yes, we can! And it sounds um, the same as the sound made by the sliders. I guess, I think, actually, uh, probably the sliders just feed the organ, and the organ actually makes those sounds as well. Which, I guess, would be would be easier to confirm if this game had uh, 3D sound, so we could tell if, it, if the sound of the sliders was actually coming from behind us. But unfortunately, this game doesn't even have stereo sound, so... Not much chance of that. We can play some tunes here, though. Sort of the death march. It's kind of hard to do with the mouse. I apologize. Uh... That's a little-known version of Mary Had a Little Lamb, where the lamb gets killed at the end. Yeah, sorry, those are the only songs I can actually play with only one finger, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't... Uh, well, I suppose I could play Frere Jacques as well. Uh, Well, this is certainly a lot of fun, but it isn't really getting us anywhere. However, um, I remember seeing a picture of a piano. Or I guess it was, in retrospect, the keyboard of this organ. In the um, journal. Where we also saw the picture of the spaceship. So, quite likely, they are related. Let's take a look at that picture again. We see that there are a number of keys um, highlight, and they are, in fact, um, labeled 1 through 5, giving us an order. And if we try to play that, it goes that one, a C, another C, then this D sharp, 
and an F, and finally, um, yeah, sorry, my notes are a bit hard to read from this angle. Finally, in A sharp. So it's. Five notes, and there are five sliders. Could this perhaps be the sequence to get us into, uh, well, whatever it is that uh, this is protecting? Maybe it will start spaceship and we'll fly away to another planet. Let's see. Unfortunately, I don't have perfect pitch, so um, I'm going to have to do this one note at a time. So that's our first uh, low C. That sounds right. Then the high C. I think it's that one. I suppose you could also do this by counting distances instead of uh, just starting with the C and then counting distances, but that's actually harder to do in my opinion. Okay, that one is next. I got that one immediately in one try, by accident. Then the F. I... oh wait, that's the wrong slider. I hope I got that one back to the right one. Well, we'll see if it works or not, otherwise I'll have to... Double check. Um, that's the last one. Yes, I got it right, despite uh, some hiccups in the process. And the viewer now shows us a book. Interesting. Could this be one of the places of protection? Which means this is one of the uh, unburned books that Atrus was talking about, rather than the books that were still on the shelves in the library. Let's see. If we now touch the uh, viewer, it shows us um, a flyby, much like the one that uh, we saw in the mist book in the opening. So I guess that the book we see here is actually a special uh, book, much like that mist book. And indeed, if we touch the uh, image here, we can link there. And it gives us a much nicer, bigger version of the flyby. Exactly how it's supposed to work in the canon of Mist that you can uh, link by touching an image of a linking panel rather than the actual book, I don't know. And this appears to be the uh, world described in the uh, journal that we read. You can sort of see the circular lake here with a rock in the middle. A number of structures on it, which I guess is stuff that Atris built. This is the uh, one untouched oasis. And this is now the second time that the whole movie has looped around, so that's enough of that. Wait, it looks like we're still in the spaceship. We'll have to find out what's up with that in the next video. Welcome back. After opening the spaceship, we found another linking book, like the one that took us to Mist. But after using it, uh, first appearances appear to be that we are, in fact, still in the spaceship. However, if you pay close attention, you'll notice we're not, in fact, in the same spaceship. Because the sliders are missing. Also, you cannot use the lever, and the display doesn't show anything. There's still an organ, though. 
but it doesn't work. So, no more playing tunes. It's even more obvious that we are no longer in Kansas when you look outside. Because this is certainly not missed. It is, in fact, the place that we saw on the flyby. And that was described in the journal we read. And the door closed behind us, and I don't think you can actually go back inside. Nope. This door does not open. So either we're gonna have to find a way to open it again... Or... We need to find another way off here. Unless we're gonna be stuck here for the rest of the game now, instead of on mist. I don't know. One thing that always confused me is that Atrus described the place as being a desert, even though it's surrounded by water. And from the map he drew in the journal, it uh, looks like it was that way even when he was here. But perhaps um, we are inside a, another larger lake or something, and there is in fact more land nearby, which is a desert. There's no way to tell, because it's pretty hazy, so we can't see very far. This place is actually called uh, the Selenitic Age. I think it's the only age that is not named in the game, because the journal doesn't mention the name of it. We do know it's called the Selenitic Age purely from the... Um, files on the CD of the game. If you check that out, you'll see that all the files related to this age um, are um, in a folder called Selenitic. And indeed, yes, um, the word age is what you call a place that you reach by a linking book, such as the Age of Mist, and now this one, the Selenitic Age. Uh, an interesting little behind-the-scenes note here is that uh, way back during the first concepts for uh, Myst, before all of the backstory had been written, before even the idea of linking books existed, the original idea was for the spaceship to actually be your mode of transportation from Myst to um, Selenitic, so they were it was on a different planet or something, I, I guess, or maybe a different island on the same planet. Not entirely sure about that. But in that particular original concept, this spaceship and the one on Mist were, in fact, the same, and it was the way um, you moved between the two places. But when they uh, introduced linking books into the mix, that idea was abandoned, and instead the spaceship merely became a place of protection for the linking book that takes you here. Unfortunately, there is no way back, as far as we can tell, because, well, the spaceship was completely inoperable, so that's no use. And so far there's no traces of any linking books back to Mist. In the journal for this age, Atris did mention how important it is to take a linking book with you when you go to an age. But we don't have any uh, linking books back to uh, Mist, So we couldn't take one with us. So if we're unlucky, we might be stuck here forever. Hopefully Atris left a linking book behind somewhere that we can use. Let's take a look. Well, at the very least, uh, even though it is surrounded by water, the rest of the place does look like a big wasteland. Much as Atrus described it. But there's also a sign of a number of structures that were uh, mentioned in the uh, journal as being built by Atrus. And let's take a look. There's a door. And another bunch of sliders. Let me guess, they make sounds. They do. Not tones, though. A whole bunch of different sounds. Each slider does seem to have the same set of sounds to choose from. Let's see. And, if our experience in the spaceship is anything to go by... <laughs> it 
indeed, as I thought, the uh, button plays the sequence. And there's no organ nearby making the sounds because we can actually see the speaker here. So it's another sound-based combination lock. Ah, sound-based puzzles. My mortal enemy. Well, no piano nearby here uh, to muck about with the sounds. So I guess we're going to have to find out what the combination is. Uh, some other way. Let's see. From here we can see the first outline of um, that tower on the rock inside the circular lake that we could see in the flyby. As well as some of the steps that we could also see in the flyby. It is sort of hard to make out, and this is one of the things that always tripped me up in this age, um, is that there is actually a path off to the left here, but if you... Um, and you can get into it by clicking to the left there, or by um, walking past it, and then turning to the left. But it is sort of... if you're just walking back and forth between the... Um, between the uh, uh, lake there and the door here, it's very easy to miss the fact that there is a path to off to the left here, in which case you'll uh, just get stuck. And also, because this path also has steps, it sort of looks, when you turn left uh, onto this path, it looks like you've actually gone onto that one. <laughs> but you haven't. Yeah, this H is a bit confusing to navigate, again, from the problem that there just aren't enough positions that uh, you can stand in to really make it clear where you're going. You would need more intermediate positions in order to figure that out. So, let's uh, see where this takes us. Towards the... Uh, Oasis, by the look of those trees. To the right here is actually um, the structure that the other set of, a set of steps leads to. Which has a couple of pipes leading from the back. We can't look at it, unfortunately. I don't think you can actually look to the side here, you can just turn back. I keep wanting to look to the side, but I can't. Yes, this leads to the Oasis, quite a nice uh, little place inside this otherwise desert wasteland. And I can hear water, which is uh, nice. Doesn't sound like um, the sea or the water surrounding the island. Sounds like a stream of some kind. Let's see if we can find the origin of that. Here we can also see one of these satellite dishes that uh, were drawn in the journal. So maybe Atrus wanted to be able to receive CNN here. Or the BBC, or something. I don't know. Looks like we found the um, source of the uh, water sounds. There is a small pool here. I guess there must be an underground source of this water. Must be welling up out of the ground or something. Because it seems to start here. But also this weird contraption above the pool. What could that be? Not entirely sure. It seems to be connected by cable to the satellite dish. Well, since Atrus said in the journal that he was interested in the sounds of this age, could that perhaps be a microphone or something? And that be a transmitter? Seems to make more sense than the um, CNN satellite dish theory. And what do we have here? A symbol, apparently representing water, so that seems to make sense. Since we're near that pool. And um, a button, which lights up the symbol, but doesn't seem to have any other obvious effect. If we look to the left here, we find 
A blue page, much like the one we earlier found in the library. The ones that Akinar asked us to bring him. I guess we should try that. Now hopefully, uh, he'll be able to make more sense then. So let's take it with us. That means our cursor is now the blue page cursor. Which doesn't actually affect our ability to do anything else. Um, um, it will just have the same effect as the regular cursor until we actually get to the blue book. I don't think the button did anything here. There's no difference at the, the microphone or anything. You know, the wasteland of Salonitic must have conjured up some memories for Atrus, since he spent most of his life living in the desert. Atrus is actually the son of uh, Gen and the human uh, Kita. At least I think Kita was human. Um, she was described as a member of the Ahmad people, uh, a tribe living in the southwest of North America. A fictional tribe, actually, that. Um, and Gen, uh, Atrus's father, once commented on much uh, on how much he thought that uh, Kita's people were like the Dunny, including their technology, because they had uh, holographic imagers, which is a kind of advanced for a human tribe in the 19th century, implying that there may have been some uh, contact between the Dunny and Kita's people at some point, but we really don't know. Unfortunately, Kita had complications during her pregnancy, and Gen brought her to his mother, Anna, in the hopes that uh, she could help Kita. Unfortunately, she could not, and Kita died giving birth to Atrus. Gen showed little interest in the child and left it with Anna, who named him Atrus after her late husband, as we uh, know from the last time I gave him a little explanation after the uh, imager video. Atrus grew up with Anna in the cleft, uh, which is a small fissure in the desert of New Mexico at the base of a small volcano. The cleft provided them with shadow from the sun, vegetation, and in those rare instances where it rained, it would catch the water. In its own way, the cleft for formed a small haven in the desert, as this oasis does here. So I'm sure Atrus would have appreciated uh, the parallels between the two uh, locations. The place he knows so well, where he grew up. And this age, even though they are visually very distinct. And of course we um, will see that there is lava here, we already read about it in the journal. And the cleft where he grew up was right next to a volcano, so that's another parallel there. And we'll continue in the next video. Welcome back! We are exploring the Selenitic Age, and have found one of the blue pages that um, Akinar wants us to bring him. Unfortunately, unless we can find a way to get back to Mist, it's not going to do us or him much good. So I guess we should continue our explorations in the hope that we can find a place to uh, get back to Mist, presumably using another linking book. So, let's see, if we go here, um, again, kind of hard to see where we actually ended up going there. This is the path behind the uh, door we saw. Kind of looks like a bunker or something, actually, from this angle. So, left goes to the oasis and straight on leads to the lake in the distance, and another set of steps. Let's check out those steps first. That really is the most confusing place in the age, that one T-split there. Other than that, it is fairly straightforward. And these steps seem to take us up to another one of these dishes. And the sound of loud rumbling. What could that be coming from? Ah, well that answers that question. This is the fissure described in the journal. 
And again, like I said, this is something that would uh, probably um, bring back some memories for Atrus, because he lived near a volcano. And we can see these pipes here, which are part of the system he built to exploit the um, heat from the fissure as a source of power. Which again is not unlike something he once did back in the desert, living with uh, his grandmother, when he built a similar system to generate power from gases escaping from the volcano. Fortunately, his first attempt at doing that went rather badly wrong, which is maybe why he uh, later switched to the windmill that we saw in Uru. Um, it does make a lot of noise, this uh, fissure. It must be very hot here. It's kind of hypnotic to look into the fire. We see another symbol, which I guess represents this fissure, and another button, which lights up the symbol, as before. Um, it also looks like another one of these devices is placed above the fissure in the same way that one was placed above um, the pool. Going with the theory that they're microphones, this one would be recording the sound of the fissure. And actually, come to think of it, didn't we hear the sound of running water and the sound of this fissure as some of the options of the sliders? That's something that bears closer resemblance, uh, uh, bears closer uh, inspection, I think. Also notice that, again, this is connected to, well, the switch and the transmitter dish. Let's, um, before we move on here, let's quickly move back here to confirm that we've heard these sounds before. Yeah, you see, that's the sound of the fissure. And there's the sound of moving water from the pool. So are we listening to recordings or to um, live transmissions? Maybe that's what the uh, transmitters do. They send the sound to here. Not sure. Actually, they don't, as we'll see later, but... Uh, Uh, for now, we don't really know yet. If we continue this way, we come to that circular lake that Atris uh, theorized was created by a meteor. And in the middle was a rock formation, which apparently um, Atris used to build. Another bunch of uh, satellite dishes. And it sort of looks like one of them, at least, is pointed that way towards the um, oasis. So it, may, it might be pointed towards the dish of the um, oasis, or maybe this dish. A bit hard to tell from this distance, because of this damn fog, which definitely doesn't make it very easy to see. They should have called this age mist. It's much mistier here than it was on mist. No apparent way to get there, and we're still uh, afraid of water, so we can't swim. Let's see. What do we have here? Another uh, transmitter dish there. And here we can hear the distinctive sound of a clock. The clock appears to be broken. Which apparently doesn't stop it from making noise, for some reason. Now uh, this is a bit peculiar, because Atreus said he was interested in investigating the natural sounds of this age, but I don't think this clock was here when he got here. I guess that the reason um, he did, he built this clock, again with what looks to be a microphone next to it and the transmitter dish, is maybe he was interested in the propagation of the sound or the acoustics or something and wanted to see how an artificial sound would compare to the uh, natural sound. Or something, I'm just guessing here. And another symbol, this time showing the uh, hands of a clock, so obviously it represents this clock. I wonder if this clock tower has anything to do with the clock tower 
on mist. Maybe we should try setting the clock tower on mist to two o'clock later and see what happens. In any case, we have a button which, like the other two, switches on these um, sort of, uh, well, uh, lights up the symbol. We don't know what else it does yet, if anything. So let's move on. We can walk along the edge of this lake and um, we can see the uh, another angle of the central island from here. Still no obvious way to get there. I assume there must be a bridge or something somewhere. And here we come to another fork in the road. We can look at the islands from this location as well. Looks like there's another dish pointed straight at us here. Maybe at the receiver for the clock. Or maybe there's another receiver near here. Uh, or transmitter. I don't know which is the transmitter and which is the receiver. Uh, nearby here. Maybe there's another one nearby here. Let's see. I'm going to take the fork first. Go right. What is this? A vase? Now that's a peculiar sound. There's all these stone spires here, um, which sort of make a forest. Maybe it's a petrified forest, or maybe it's just a bunch of rocks in a uh, group together. Sort of look that sort of looks like a forest. So I guess the sound is made by the wind blowing between these stones. Let's see what we can find there. At the very least, we can see that there's another uh, transmitter there, and another microphone by the looks of it, recording this sound, I suppose. Let's see. And that's another sound, again, that we heard on the sliders, the clock sound as well. I wonder if uh, these stones have copper in them, considering this green uh, traces. They could be copper ore. Considering how many um, natural resources this age was said to have by Atreus, I wouldn't be surprised if that is indeed the case. Yes, uh, there is another transmitter. And another microphone. And, as we've come to expect, another symbol. This one represents the uh, stone forest, I guess. And... A button. Well, let's just keep pushing the buttons. To see what happens. Maybe if uh, once we've done all of them or something, something will happen. I don't know. And here is another page. The red page. Well, it's a bit the ones that Sirius wanted. And if we try to take it... We find that our blue page disappears. If we go back to the oasis, um, you'll actually find that it has returned there, somehow. This is sort of hard to justify from an in, uh, in-universe perspective. From the game perspective, it's still hard to justify, because it really wouldn't have been that hard to make it possible to carry two pages. And it just doesn't really make any sense at all that you wouldn't be able to carry two pages. I mean, you can fold one up and put it in your pocket, right? But apparently our player has only one hand and um, must carry the page in his hand and is still also then unable to have two pages in that hand for some reason. The uh, official strategy guide actually uh, is written as a journal from the player's perspective, although as I said, most of the things it's, uh, it mentions aren't uh, canon and contradict some of the other mist lore established in other games. And the explanation it gives is that somehow the blue page vaporizes when you pick up the red page. How that's supposed to work, I don't know. This is one of those things that is just purely a game mechanic and just there is no real explanation for it, unfortunately. So now we have a red page, and I guess we'll carry that around instead of the blue page. Sirius was the one who wanted red pages. I guess uh, we'll have to disappoint Aknar then. If we can't take the blue page with us. Wait a second. 
We found Akinar's page in the Oasis, which you could say is a kind of haven. And we found Cirrus's page in between these stone spires. Coincidence? I honestly don't know. Would be kind of neat if they did that on purpose. Alright, let's move on. In the next video. Welcome back. We are continuing our exploration of the Selenitic Age and its various sites and, well, mostly sounds, actually. And we have found a red page, as well as the blue page that we found earlier in the Oasis. But it seems we're unable to carry both of them at the same time, so I'm going to stick with the red page for now. Rather than go back for the blue page, which has returned to the Oasis, uh, magically. Alright, let's continue walking around the edge of this lake. This age would be so e so much easier to navigate if it wasn't so damn foggy. Um, but that would have made one of the other puzzles way too easy. So I guess that's why they made it foggy. Alright, let's see. We have found four sounds so far. The um, water sounds, the... Um, uh, chasm, or fissure, the uh, stone forest, and the clock. And there were five sliders on the door, so I guess there must be a fifth sound somewhere. Another one of those vases. There's actually, there's actually some on the uh, island there too. I guess they must be decorative. Or maybe they serve a purpose, I really don't know. And it looks like I was wrong. There's no bridge to get to that island. It seems like um, the access actually goes underground. And this would appear to be the entrance to that. And this tunnel leading underground also contains... Uh, also makes a sound. The sound of the wind blowing through the tunnel, which is another one of the sounds we heard on the sliders. With another microphone above it, if indeed they are microphones. And, once again, a symbol with a button. Still no obvious effect. An interesting thing here, although it's hard to get a good look at it, um, is that there's the remains of another staircase leading down to the water, and it seems that there was a jetty here at some point. This seems to suggest that um, my theory that there is more land around here somewhere and that that is in fact the desert that uh, Atris referred to because obviously, well, since all we can see is water around uh, this island, that isn't the desert. So I guess that uh, Atreus did in fact explore more of this age than just this island, and that he did find desert there. I guess this is a jetty, or maybe it's a bridge, it's a bit hard to tell, since we can't see if it continues uh, through the fog. In any case, we're not using it, since it is utterly broken. Another theory for the desert thing would be that the water level rose, but that doesn't really work, because then this lake would have been dry. Because it is, in fact, open on the uh, end, which is, again, rather impossible to see. I'm trying to get a look at that, but I can't. This is the end of the land here, so uh, the lake is open to the water on the outside. Hard to see, unfortunately, but it is true. You can see it more clearly if you look at the uh, map in the journal. 
Alright, uh, let's see where this tunnel leads. Actually, we know where it leads. Or at least suspect where it leads to that island in the middle of the lake. It's a bit dark in here, though. But there is a switch. Which turns on the lights? Gotta wonder why these are lights and not uh, fire marbles again. Perhaps because fire marbles hadn't been invented yet by the writers. Let's see. This is a pretty big cave with a pretty high ceiling, so I guess that ladder actually goes up further than you would think. Well, actually, considering it takes us three screens to get down, I suppose that does make sense. And it just did describe a very um, elaborate cave system, but I don't think this is it. Because it's, well, this isn't elaborate, this is a straight hallway. And that cave system was accessible from um, the fissure, which we're quite far away from here, so... I doubt this is what he was talking about. There was no obvious way for us to get down into the fissure and reach that cave system. But Atrus did say he was looking for another way to go in there, which um, he may have been able to find. Maybe it's behind that door. There's another switch here, which actually just turns the lights back off. I guess that makes sense. There's a switch on each side. Alright, now we're on that central island, I guess. Indeed. I wonder why the wind sound is so distinctive only when it goes through this tunnel. Whereas we can't really hear any wind anywhere else in the age. Okay, no, no, that's not true. We can hear wind, but it sounds very different. Wait. Which of the microphones can we see from here? What would be in that direction? I guess maybe the chasm, I suppose? Not sure. Or maybe the... I don't know. Something is in that direction where we can see the microphone. And here is the tower with a whole bunch of... Uh, transmitters on it. Although we can't look up, unfortunately. So let's just uh, look at the base of the tower. It has a door in it, behind which is a control panel. That is a lot of noise. Let's see... We've got here the five symbols that we've seen before. Water... And... The chasm... The clock, the stone forest... And the wind tunnel. And they all make an equal amount of noise. But I guess maybe this is the order we need to use on the sliders. That may be worth uh, trying. Let's let's go back and try that. I want to see if that uh, achieves anything. Oh. Did not mean to switch that off. Oh. Damn it. Okay, let's head back to the uh, door. Let's try that order that we saw. So that would be um, first the water sound, which is this. Then second would be the chasm, which is that. Third is the clock. That's interesting, there appear to be a couple of sounds here that were not found anywhere in the age. Or at least not anymore. Okay, that's the clock. Then fourth was the stone forest. That's, is that a steam train? Last up the wind tunnel. Let's see if that works. It 
It didn't do anything. I didn't really think it was going to be that easy. So let's head back to um, the tower. See if there's anything else we can do with it, because there was a bunch of controls we didn't try yet. And why is all we can hear here static, even though there's all these transmission towers? And there's also this button with the Greek letter Sigma on it. And it plays five times static in succession. I guess Sigma here is used in its mathematical meaning of sum, so it is shows, gives us the sum of the sounds. But since none of the sounds are actually working, that doesn't really do anything. Let's see what this uh, does. Ah. This moves the view and changes the number here. So I guess this is actually a number of degrees, maybe. Let's see, yeah, it's, uh, well, it goes very, very quickly if you hold it down for a while, which makes it hard. But it does go up to 360, it seems, so it is degrees. And it circles back to zero. So that is degrees, so I guess we can go all the way around, let's try. Yep, we can go all the way around very, very quickly. This, by the looks of things, is the uh, chasm. But we've selected um, the oasis, so we don't want a chasm. The oasis is near the chasm, though. It's behind it, so we probably won't be able to see it through this thick fog. But hopefully we'll be able to hear it at some point. Yes! We can hear the water. And now, this button is blinking. Which I guess means we need to go further right. There's still static behind the sound though, so we're not quite set up correctly yet. Ah, went too far, I think. There we go. We have gotten the sound of water. So I guess the dishes were not properly lined up, and now we've pointed one of them at the, uh, um, at the proper transmitter near the uh, oasis. Let's try the Sigma button again. Now instead of static for one of them, it actually played the sound of the water. But it clearly isn't playing them in the order that we see here, because it played the water sound second. So maybe that's the order we need for the sliders. Which means we're going to have to uh, um, set up the other four sounds properly. Well, I guess technically you, could, uh, you only need to do three, because then the fourth one would be obvious. But we're going to do all of them anyway to determine what the actual sequences we need to use to open that door, but we'll have to do that in the next video. Welcome back. We found this control panel which is used to um, set up the receivers on the central tower so that they line up properly with the various transmitters we've seen throughout this age. And we've set up the uh, water one properly, but not the others, and we're going to have to do all of them to uh, discover the proper sequence to use on the door. At least, that's what I think this will accomplish. Don't really see what else it will be for. I think Atrus was really afraid that he f would forget his passwords or something, if he kept leaving all these hints around rather than just trying to remember them. Alright, let's see. The chasm should be near the uh, oasis, actually, somewhere to the left of it, so... somewhere between uh, 0 and 150 degrees, then. That's pretty close. 
You can actually s see the microphone here. You can't quite make out the actual transmitter, but we can already hear it. And we can see that we have to go f slightly further to the left to set it up properly. That's too far. Ah, there we go. 130.3 degrees is the proper direction for the chasm. All right, the clock then. Well, the clock is once again to the left of the... Um, uh, ...of the chasm. And we can actually see it pretty clearly <laughs> in the viewer. I managed to stop damn close to the uh, correct direction. Did that by accident. Ah, there we go. Blinking lights again, telling us where to go. It actually does that when you get within five degrees of the proper... Uh, direction. There we go. 55.6 is the clock set up properly. Then the stone forest, which again, if you look at the um, uh, at the lake, is counterclockwise from the uh, if you if you were to look at the, visualize it from above the lake, you, the uh, the clock tower is counterclockwise from the uh, uh, the uh, sorry from the chasm. <laughs> Forgot what I was talking about for a second. Yeah, the sorry, <laughs> it's getting late. So the clock tower was counterclockwise from the chasm, and the um, uh, s stone forest is counterclockwise from the clock tower. That's what I meant to say. They're actually all counterclockwise uh, here, so if, you, if you see them in this order. So again, we need to go further to uh, the left from where we set the uh, clock, which was 55.6. And here you can actually see that vase, that is above the entrance into the uh, stone forest. And you can see one of the stones, even though you can't make out any more. And there we have the sound. There we go, exactly 15 degrees. Now the last one, I guess we don't technically need to set it up, because, um, well, we know if we use the Sigma button now, we would know that the one spot that doesn't work is supposed to be the wind tunnel. But for completeness sake, let's do it anyway. Which again is further counterclockwise from the uh, stone force, so further to the left. And um, since you can already see the vase there, I guess we need to go left from here. I don't want to overshoot it. So, sort of trying to prevent it from going into turbo mode here. Ah, there we go. I swear, I'm not actually good at this. I just keep landing at uh, <laughs> the proper spots by accident. This one is pretty easy to see, though, because it's fairly close. There we go. This one also clearly shows us that you need to line up the actual transmitter dish in the exact center of the screen in order to get the right uh, sound. 212.2. In any case, we have um, verified that uh, these things are in fact transmitters and that they're transmitting and recording the sounds that are near each individual transmitter. Which gives me an idea what the buttons might be for. I want to check that. We turn this off, I wonder. Go back up. Yes, now we don't have any sound anymore for this one. So the buttons actually turn on the uh, 
microphones, or possibly the uh, transmitters, one of the two, or both. So if we hadn't been t uh, turning them on as we were going along, we wouldn't have heard anything at the control panel here, which would have made it very difficult to figure out what you're supposed to do with it, since it wouldn't have made any sound. Anyway, with all of them turned on and uh, set to the correct directions, let's use the uh, Sigma button again to see what the sequence is. Aha! Uh -huh. So it's Stone Forest, Oasis, Wind Tunnel, Chasm, and the Clock. Let's hope that opens the door, otherwise I'm out of ideas. Let's be nice, switch the lights off. Save the planet and all that. Whichever planet we happen to be on. Alright. Let's see. First the stone forest. Then the oasis. Oh wait, that's all the way at the bottom. Then the sound of the wind. That's the top one. Damn, I suck. The chasm, and finally the clock. Let's see if that is more successful at opening this door. It is! What is behind it? I see we're going quite a distance underground. So that makes this the entrance to the cave system that uh, Atrus describes, I guess. He's done a lot of work here. Built uh, walls. I'm not sure if this is carved in the rock or if it's actually metal. It looks like metal. Now you may remember how much of a, uh, of a fuss I made about Cirrus being able to build all the stuff we saw him build in, in Mist 4. If you've seen me, uh, seen that Let's Play I did. While here we see Atrus build uh, an equally impressive amount of stuff, but the simple fact of the matter is, I'm much more inclined to forgive this game, because, well, for one thing, the journal actually mentions that this age was rich in resources, and that he had to bring special tools from other ages to do this, and um, because we know that he did actually also visit uh, ages with inhabitants and had his sons potentially to help him. He didn't necessarily have to do all of this alone, so that's why I'm much more inclined to give this um, game the benefit of the doubt uh, as far as all the stuff that Atrus was building goes than I was in Mist 4. And what do we have here? Looks like some kind of submarine. Are we going underwater? I don't know. You can actually walk around the submarine, which is uh, kind of neat. Hard to see, but you can actually see that it, um, the base of this device has something that uh, seems to be made uh, for some kind of track, so I guess it's not the uh, not actually a submarine, but something that runs on rails, like a train. Take a look at the uh, device from multiple angles by walking around it. You can't actually find anything else here, though. Still, it's kind of neat that you can do that. Let's see. It has a door and a button, which I suppose will open the door. Yes. That was predictable. Let's see... Go back outside, I guess, but that's not very interesting. Since we already know what's outside. We can sit down in the driver's seat. 
And we can see the chamber through the windscreen or something. As well as a bunch of controls. A red button, which we can't actually push. Or let's just try forward, although wouldn't we run, run into the wall if we tried forward? Well, this isn't so much forward as it is down, is it? I guess Atris didn't feel like making a separate button just to take you down the first bit, because we'll see that this button does take us forward in all the remaining situations. Also, for some reason, we turn around like three times while descending. Did you hear that sound? I'm not the only one who heard that, right? Let's see... Um, these other buttons lit up now, so I guess we can use them. I suppose backtrack might take us back up, so I'm not going to push that one. And um, this also started working, revealed a compass, or at least I think it's a compass. It says N, north, I suppose. Or maybe not, who knows. Uh, let's see if the red button does anything now. Yes. Replays that sound. That doesn't seem very useful. Although, considering everything in this age is about sound, that has to be significant somehow. Let's try the arrows. Oh, that turns us. And that confirms that this is in fact a compass. Northeast. Can't go forward here. I guess that's a dead end. Let's see. East is a dead end, too. As is southeast. South. Southwest. West. Northwest. Okay, so north is the only direction we can actually go in. So I guess uh, we'll have to try that in the next video. Welcome back. We managed to open the door and found behind it a strange device, which appears to be a car that runs on these tracks that we can see here. It's actually uh, mostly known as the Maze Runner. Because, yes, we have a maze to contend with here. We did read in the journal that Aetris wanted to um, be able to explore the cave system, and that it would take some time, and I guess he got tired of doing it on foot. So he built this system to uh, do it a little bit quicker. I suppose this is powered by the uh, power generated from the chasm, though we can't be sure of that. One peculiar thing we've noticed so far is that we heard this sound when we got down here, and we uh, can hear it again when pushing this button. We also noticed that north is the only direction we can actually go, because all of the rest are dead ends. So let's go there! Hey, a different sound! And now the button repeats that sound. That's interesting. Also, we can't go north. Let's see, what other directions can we go in? Hopefully we can't just go back. Maybe we can go outside. Nope. Door won't open. Damn it! Alright, let's see. East. Southeast. South isn't a dead end, but that's where we just came from, so that's gonna be a bit pointless. West is open. Let's just check northwest to be sure. Yep, the only way we can go is west, or back the way we came, so let's go west. That's much more interesting. From the sound this makes, I guess it's probably magnetically propelled. 
which uh, I suppose makes sense considering Riven also had the maglev cars. Must be a common dunny technology, perhaps, maybe. And again we face a dead end. Hey, and the first sound is back. That's interesting. Let's see where we can go from here, then. Can't go southwest. Can't go south. Can't go southeast. Uh, we can't go east, but that's where we came from. Northeast. North is open again. Let's check northwest. Nope. North is the only way we can go. So let's go there. Interesting, though. We've had to go north twice, and in both those cases we heard that ping sound. Ooh, another new sound. Uh, let's check our directions. We can go north. But I want to see if we can go anywhere else. Northeast. We can go east. Southeast. Back south, which is where we came from, so we don't want to do that. Southwest is blocked, as is west. And northwest. Okay, let's try north. This is the first time we've actually had more than one option. We could go either north or um, east, so this is going to be complicated. Hopefully we don't have to map the whole maze. Ooh, making some twists and turns here. Hey, I didn't hear any sound. Given that sounds are significant in this age, that does not fill me with confidence. Let's see, where can we go? North was blocked, as is northeast. East, southeast, that's where we came from, southwest, west, hey, all the directions are blocked, except going back. Maybe that means this is the end of the maze. Nope, we can't go out here. Well, let's backtrack. So we reached the dead end, and we heard no sound. I'm beginning to get the, the impression that these sounds are somehow related with the route we have to take through the maze. Well, the only other direction we had available here was east, so let's head east. Hopefully that isn't another dead end, because then we'd be stuck. There would be, is nowhere else to go. Nope, not a dead end, and we hear sound, and it's the same sound. And we can go further east. So we heard the same small bell sound uh, two times, and both times we had to go north. We heard some kind of chirping sound when we had to go west, and we heard this springy sound when we had to go east, and now we hear it again, and we can go east again, so if these sounds are indeed directions, that would mean we have to go east again here. Let's just try that. Let's save some time if it is true. We don't have to look around all, um, the entire place all the time, and I suppose we can always backtrack if we get stuck. That is another new sound. Which, uh, if my theory is correct, means we don't have to go east. Um, 
or north or west. But there's five other directions left. Well, northeast is open, so maybe this sound is uh, northeast. Let's try. Man, this would be so much easier if only there was some other place in this game where you could learn these sounds. Pfft, if only we could be that lucky. North? Hmm, this is peculiar. Kind of. No sound. So, I guess that means we're wrong again. Actually, I'm gonna save some time, I'm just gonna backtrack. And since we went wrong, that means the sound we heard was not, in fact, northeast. So it must be one of the other remaining directions. Interesting that you still hear the sound here, even though you're on the wrong track. Okay, so if this is not northeast, then what is it? We know it's not north. Northwest is blocked. West is where we came from. Southwest is blocked. But I guess this um, this sound, cowbell sound or something, um, is south then, maybe, perhaps. Unless southwest is also open, or southeast is also open. I didn't check that, we're just gonna go with this. We'll see if it dead ends again. Same sound, and south is still an option, so... Let's keep going sound. South, then. Of course, yes, I do know there is an easier way to find that out, this out. But I wanted to show you that you can, in fact, figure it out by trial and error, without having to map the entire maze. We've heard that sound before, and it was, um, west. And I, of course, know I can just see all of you writing comments about where you can f uh, find out these si sounds already. Yes, I can see you. Actually, I'm right behind you now, right now. And did you really think that I wasn't doing this on purpose? Did you really think that I didn't know about these sounds? Of course I know. And I will show you where you can uh, learn them otherwise, but I, like I said, I just wanted to show you that that is not the only way you can do that. You can still use the sounds even if you didn't learn them before coming here. Just by paying close attention to where you can go and what sounds you hear. It will probably take you longer in real life to do. Um, this is interesting. This is the sound of south and west at the same time. I'm gonna go out on a limp and say that means southwest then. Which is an option, so... I guess that might work. It'll probably take you uh, longer to figure this out uh, the first time around, if you figure it out at all. At the very least, you should realize that the sounds have to be important, considering every other puzzle in this age is a sound-based puzzle. That's west. Oh.
But of course, in the beginning you won't know that the sounds and the directions are limited, so it might take you a bit more trial and error before you uh, actually realize that this sounds like north and west at the same time. But if you uh, were to draw a map as you go along, which is uh, a good idea in any case, and also write down each sound you hear and each direction you need to go, then you will would be able to uh, find um, the pattern quite soon. And because... Um, that sounded like Northeast. Um, because the first couple of... Uh, Places in the maze, the first couple of stops in the maze have only one um, way you can go. That's north. And then the first time you actually reach a place where you have more than one option, the wrong path immediately dead, dead ends and lets you hear that there's no sound if you get on a dead end. The maze really is set up in such a way that it is. At the very least, uh, possible to uh, figure this out without having learned sounds elsewhere. I don't want to say easy because, well, I'm not sure if I would actually have. Uh, that's southeast. I'm not sure if I would have actually noticed that because I did not do the ages in this order when I first played the game. So I had, in fact, heard the sounds elsewhere. Ooh, this is different. So let me put some lights here. We've got a much nicer floor. All right, no sound, so another dead end. But since this looked different than all the other places, let's see if now maybe we've reached the end of the maze and can go outside again. Wish we can! We'll have to find out what's out there in the next video. Welcome back. After figuring out the sound cues, getting through the maze was a piece of cake. So now we have reached the other side. Let's see what lies beyond. Music. So it must be important. Another chamber in this underground system of caves. And what we find is a mist linking book, which shows a different linking panel than the book we saw at the start of the game. At the very least, it means we're no longer trapped here. Wait, where are we? Ah, the library. We were looking at the ceiling, which you can't actually... Oh, you can. I thought you couldn't. Anyway. So this linking book leads to a different location in the Age of Mist than the one we found originally. But it leads to Mist all the same. So now, with our extra red page in hand, we can see what Cirrus has to say once we give him that page. Must 
Basically from this book, Jericho. I need more red pages, please. Don't waste time. Look. My brother is killed. And I wrongfully imprisoned. Bring the red page to me. Hmm. Well, the message of that was mostly, I need more red pages. Kind of sounds like he's a crack addict or something, suffering from red page withdrawal when he says that. But, a couple of interesting tidbits in there. He seems to suggest that um, Akinar is guilty of something, I guess, burning the books. Which uh, would seem to agree with what Atris said. And he doesn't want us to waste time on what? I don't know. Even though both Atrus and Sirius are saying that Akinar is guilty, I get a kind of a weird vibe from this guy too. He seems very arrogant and also very forceful. I mean, you must do this. I'll be the judge of that. And I don't want to make a decision about who's guilty based on only one side of the story, so I think we'd better go back to Selenitic to get that um, blue page. Yes, that means we will need to go through the maze again. Isn't that going to be fun? But now that we already know the sounds, it's going to take much less time. Alright, we've already seen the flyby. Somehow the door opens when you link in here, but you can't open it when you're outside. I don't know how that works. Maybe there's a pressure plate or something inside the spaceship that opens the door when somebody links in. Um, there's actually one other feature of the Masterpiece Edition of Mist that I kind of want to point out while we're here. The Masterpiece Edition, like I said, its main difference is the higher quality graphics um, using 24-bit rather than the original 8-bit palleted images, so you don't get any differing or low-color artifacts. Um, but the only other difference, uh, the other big difference actually, is that there is a built-in hint system, which is actually way too easy to activate, so it's way too tempting to use if you're if you don't know the game um, and are playing, all you need to do is click below the uh, view, s view of the game and it immediately gives you a, a vague hint and tells me that if I'm seeking another page I can help you find it. We already know where it is, it's in the Oasis. If you use the arrow keys it will um, give you increasingly more specific hints until you uh, actually get the complete um, solution. And um, if you want to skip that step, you can actually just click on the... Uh, I think the, yeah, the, the light bulb will immediately give you the answer rather than the hints. It's sort of like built-in UHS hint. I'm not entirely sure what the magnifying class does. Um, and this button, which is uh, more interesting, actually shows you a map of the age you're currently in. You can recognize this map if you remember the uh, map in the uh, that was in the journal. It looks the same, except here all the places are filled in. So we can see that this is uh, where, uh, where we get started. Uh, where the spaceship is, and then you walk on... I guess the spaceship isn't actually drawn here. It seems to be out... Oh, pff, sorry. 
Spaceship is here. I'm looking wrong. Um, the spaceship is here, so you walk on land, and then on the right here is the uh, the entrance to the maze, and then the path to the left takes you to the oasis, and if you go straight you get to the lake, where from there you can go left to the chasm, or walk all the way around the lake to the central control tower. Uh, we don't need to bother with any of those things at this uh, point, though. All we need to do is go back through the underground maze, after we have gotten the blue page, of course. Would be a bit stupid to forget that. And like I said, when we lost the blue page when picking up the red page, it returned to its original position here. All of this is much easier because, well, the uh, combination is already set up properly, so we don't need to bother with the tower or any of the um, transmitters anymore. Just need to go in here and go into the maze runner, which has somehow returned here. Maybe there's a trigger linked to the um, linking book that automatically returns it to its original location would be a sensible thing to do. Of course, now that we already know all of the sounds and the directions they mean, this maze becomes really easy. However, it still takes rather a long time to navigate, and we don't really need to see that, so let's speed it up uh, a little bit. And while we're going through that, let's think a little bit about what we saw here. Unfortunately, it never really becomes clear what Atris was trying to accomplish on this age. It seems to be exploration and experimentation for its own sake, done purely to enrich Atris's understanding of this age, and ultimately, the art. But then, that certainly fits with his personality, and with how he was raised by his grandmother. Anna was the daughter of a scientist, she and her father were surveyors, and her teachings of young Atris strongly reflected that. She emphasized the importance of empirical observation, always asking Aetris that same question, what do you see? She taught him to observe and logically analyze his environment and to always consider the whole. He would apply this method to his surroundings in the cleft, doing experiments with the rock, the soil and the wildlife, and this methodical and logical approach to any problem can be seen in many places. His experiments with sound here, as well as the exploration of this cave system, are just an example of that, done apparently only for his own education. Frequently, Aetris would apply the knowledge he acquired to try and improve their lives in the cleft. For example, he once tried to improve the yield of their gardens by experimenting with soil composition, and he built a system to generate power using steam pressure from the volcano, not unlike what he did with the fissure here in the Selenithic Age. Anna also told Aetris' story of the Dunny and taught him their language, although she hid from him that she was Tiana, the one who had caused the fall of Dunny, something which she still blamed herself for. She was only just beginning to teach Atris the basics of the uh, art of writing Aegis when Gen showed up and took Atris with him into the ruins of the Dunny city. And now we are nearly at the uh, end of the maze once again to find the mist book right where we left it last time. So, let's head back towards mist. This time carrying the blue page that Akinar so desires. Give Akinar his page in the next video. Welcome back. We have returned from the Stellanitic Age for a second time, this time carrying the blue page which we should deliver to Akinar. Let's see what he has to say. Turn. You wouldn't 
protect. <laughs> hey, just <this is> rescue me. <laughs> I'm acting off. My brother, I beg you. To be complete. <laughs> Oh, he's blue pages. Not listen to him. Not listen to my brother. An egotistical fool and a liar. Bring me the blue pages. All the red ones. Don't bring the red ones. Prison? Must I will have my retribution. Please bring me the blue pages. Pages, pages. Please, please. Okay. Well, that's a bit confusing because what he told us is pretty much the opposite of what Sir said. Both of the brothers claim that they are the one who are wrongfully imprisoned, and that we shouldn't trust the other brother. Cyrus says not to bother with the blue pages, and Akinar says not to bother with the red pages. So which of the brothers do we actually trust? Which of them do we believe? Well, of the two, I'd say that um, Cyrus definitely seems a bit saner, but I'm not a particular fan of his arrogant manner either. At this point I simply have to conclude that we don't really have enough information to take either of them at their word. So for the time being all we can do is um, explore some more, find some additional red and blue pages, hope that one of them slips up, maybe implicates uh, themselves, or maybe we can find um, some additional information elsewhere. That means, of course, um, we should return to the bookshelf and pick another book to read. I'm just gonna go with a random second book. We've done this one. Now I'm gonna do this one, which has two leaves on the cover. Emmett was the first to live on the rocks. He named them the rocks because that is what they were. A group of sharp rocks clustered together in the middle of a large sea. This was where Emmett lived. He enjoyed his life. Emmett would occasionally swim to nearby rocks, as it was never too far of a distance. One day, another person appeared on the rocks for no apparent reason to Emmett. Emmett named this new person Branch. Emmett and Branch quickly became friends swimming and hunting for fish together often. Emmett showed Branch a simple cave in which he lived, on the largest rock. Soon, Branch discovered a place where he decided to live, also in the, on the same large rock. The sun always shone brightly in their world, and the water was always dazzlingly clear, showing them, allowing them to see almost to the deep ocean floor which surrounded them. Although the sun always shone, it was never too hot for the boys. A light breeze always came from the north and cooled the area down. One day, while Branch was swimming and having fun in the water, he noticed another boy swimming. Branch brought the new boy to Emmett to find out what to call the new boy. Emmett said the boy should be called Will. Will was soon a part of the group and all three of the boys swam and enjoyed their perfect world. At least, that is the story I was told when I, was arri when I arrived. Today on the island, Emmett, Branch and Will were surprised to see me at first, but even before the night ended we were all becoming good friends. Today, the second day on this newly created age, a strange thing happened. It was not strange to me, but the three boys did not understand what was happening. While I was relaxing under a large tree on one of the smaller rock islands, it began to rain. It was a nice rain that lasted for about an hour in the morning. I explained to the boys that the rain was not harmful, yet they obviously still feared it. Before going to sleep tonight, I told the boys I would leave the following day. I told them that while I was gone, I would make a surprising change in their world. 
that he didn't understand, not that I expected him to. I still do not fully understand what happened today. There's a drawing here of a ship. Reminds me a bit of the ship at the docks here, the sunken ship. I was experimenting with the art, testing the limits of the rules as dictated to me by father. I attempted to create a boat by riding it into the world. I thought everything was planned correctly, yet somehow the boat had become gripped by the rock and broken in half. Although this test did not turn out as I had hoped, I now have answers for a few of the questions my father never answered. As for the boat, I can see the boys enjoy it anyway, and with that I am pleased. They've played on it all day. Even though the boat cannot move, I have enjoyed studying from it. It is a much sturdier platform than the jagged rocks. In the course of my observation, I have learned some very interesting things regarding the solar system of this age. Another drawing here of a submersible lamp. The nights are absolutely beautiful here. I have made note of and named a number of constellations that pass above me. Also during the night, I catch glimmers of light from the horizon, which I have not been able to discover if it is created by some natural phenomenon or by additional people on far-off islands or rocks. I should very much like to discover which. I rather suspect it is additional people, which would explain the appearance of Branch and Will. The rain today was slightly heavier than usual. Just when the boys were getting used to the light rains, a small storm arrived. They were frightened of the heavier rain, not to mention the thunder and lightning. If rain has never fallen here until recently, as the boys tell me, I would like to discover why it is falling now. Regardless, I have decided to return home for a short while. I have also been thinking of some plans for a lighthouse that I hope to construct soon. I think that perhaps by shining a bright light towards the horizon, it might prove my suspicions regarding additional inhabitants. They would be curious about the light and travel to discover its source, if they have the means. I suppose that this is a drawing of that lighthouse. I returned many, with many tools that I will need for construction of the lighthouse. I have decided that once the lighthouse is completed, I will leave for some time and let the world's own imagination have control. We have worked three weeks on the lighthouse now, and are making great progress. The rock that we are building on seems to not be as secure as I would like. I have had to alter my plans slightly, but those alterations pose no real problem. This appears to be a diagram of the um, roof of the lighthouse, judging by the two diagrams, and it has a light on top. Hence, it is a lighthouse. The boys are quite strong and have been helping me immensely. I estimate construction will be done within two days. The lighthouse is finished, and we are all proud of our creation. The boys are amazed at the structure wrought from rock with their own hands. That evening we powered up the generator, much to the boys' dread at first, and shined a great light to the horizon for many hours. I stayed the night on the top of the lighthouse, and in the morning awake to observe the sunrise without my being coated with the chilly blanket of ocean dew I had become accustomed to. It was Will who first saw the girl. She was swimming not far from the boat where Will was getting ready to hunt for fish. Then Will noted, noticed a man not far away from the girl. Emmett was very pleased to meet the additional neighbors. I feel pleased to leave this age. I have set in motion events that have nothing to do with writing or the art. It will have a more profound impact on this world than I could ever have ever written. I think. And a map of this place, which is apparently called the Stone Ship Age. The map is quite interesting, actually, in that it shows uh, the ship that Atreus wrote into the age being embedded into the rock as well as a number of other structures I suppose one of them would be the lighthouse I think of it this age as a gift to myself that I will wrap up and open someday in the future only to discover that it has changed so much that indeed it is a surprise besides I have yet another new age that awaits me it seems I'm going to need some way to travel underwater in this new age and so much planning is in order it has been ten years since I left this age, which I have since called the Stone Ship Age. Upon returning, I cannot believe the changes that have taken place. The original three boys have grown into adults, 
and there are many new faces that I do not recognize. Branch told me that it has not rained for seven years, and the cool breezes are back again. They are all very content and have been serving me with new foods and showing me new materials. They have discovered. It even seems they have found gold somewhere. I see it in many forms around the island. My lighthouse has been kept in perfect condition, and it looked as if they have tried their very best to keep it so. Yet I have noted that the entire rock it was built on has sunk approximately 40 or 50 centimeters. After a wonderful visit with my old friends, I want to roll out with them what things will be like here in another 10 years. Then we find a number of drawings of constellations. A set of stars on the top, which actually represent the constellation. And then at the bottom, a symbol, which is, I suppose, what um, Atris believed the constellation to resemble. This one is apparently an anchor. It's a bit far-fetched, but you can sort of see it. And... This is really far-fetched. These two <laughs> just an are uh, these two stars make up an eye. The snake is a bit more obvious. Insect, I guess. A cross. Pretty obvious. The arrow. And the bird. Wait a second, these symbols seem awfully familiar to me. And a maple leaf. Yes, these are in fact symbols uh, we have seen on the uh, boxes in front of the pillars around the sunken model ship. Well, let us contemplate the information from this new journal until the next video. Welcome back. We have just read a journal about another age called the Stone Ship Age, which is another place that Aters apparently visited, and the journal told us of his exploits there. For a first time player, this journal, um, if you read them in this order anyway, um, also gives us the first uh, real glimpse that Atris is actually creating the links to these worlds by writing in the books that we've been finding. And that he's also apparently able to modify the worlds, although apparently not entirely successful at it um, every time. Unfortunately, the book did not mention Sears and Aknar, so it wasn't very helpful in that regard. Yet, I would rather like to visit that uh, world. And the uh, journal did contain a number of familiar elements in the drawings, including the symbols that are on these um, devices in front of the pillars, as well as the drawing of a ship, and the name of the age is Stone Ship as well. Reminds me of this ship here as well as the uh, sunken ship at the dock. Now, with the Selenitic Age, we were able to get into it by pointing the tower at um, the uh, spaceship. So let's try pointing the tower at the regular ship this time. And see if we can learn something from it that will help us get access to um, the book leading to the Stone Ship Age. Which means we need to go back down the secret passageway. And up to the tower. Where hopefully it will reveal the uh, key to
to the place of protection for the stone ship book. Well, as before, from this side of the tower, we can see the uh, place we pointed it at, presumably the location where we can find the book itself. And on this side, hopefully it will give us the access key. Three dates. October 11, 1984, 10.04 a.m. January 17, 12.07, 5.46 a.m. And November 23, 97.91, 6.57 p.m. Now, where have we seen dates before? By the way, this elevator, I noted before that it um, has a turn when it uh, goes up or down. And it actually makes uh, sense that it does that when you think about it. Because no matter how you rotate the tower, when you come out of the elevator, it always faces the uh, ladder with the book symbol. So I guess it has to turn to adjust for the position of the tower. Although, no, they didn't make different movies for different uh, positions of the tower, so it always rotates slightly to the right, regardless of where you actually position the tower. But at least they did think about how um, the elevator would be able to face that same position every single time, even though the tower itself is not facing the, the same way. All right, uh, we found some dates, and the only other place where we've um, seen dates before in this particular age um, is in the planetarium. I still think it looks like a dentist, but anyway. So let's see if we can input those dates. This is not today's date anymore, it's a different recording session. Uh, anyway, let's see what happens if we input those three dates that we just saw. Let's see, October... 11... 1984... by George Or Orwell. And 10.04 a.m. And we get to see a grouping of stars, of course, as always. And this one, however, looks familiar. If we look back at the um, constellations from the Stoneship Journal, we see that it resembles this one. The maple leaf. I have a sneaking suspicion that the other two dates are similarly going to reveal constellations. I guess that means that this planetarium doesn't show the sky of this age, but the sky of stone chip age, for whatever reason. All right, next up, January 17, 12.07, 5.46 a.m. There we go. And that constellation, if we look in the uh, journal again, is actually the snake. Snake! Sorry. And finally... November 23 That's two days before my birthday 
9,791, although I don't think I'll be alive by then. If I am, it would be my... What? 7,800... No? 7,810th 7, birthday, I think, if I calculated that right. Ninety-seven... Ninety-one! And... 6.57 p.m. That takes a while. Because of the uh, difference in dates. And this would appear to be... The insect. I don't really see how you see the insect in this, but... I guess... Atris has a sufficient amount of imagination to make this into an insect. Okay, so now we have three symbols. I don't know why, I just like turning that back off or on. Whichever way that works when we leave. Alright, uh, we have three symbols, so let's try and um, turn those three symbols green on these boxes. Not that one. That's one of them. The Maple Leaf. Not the arrow. Yeah. Not the anchor either. But yes to the insect, and yes to the poisonous snake. Ooh, something's happening. But what? Hey! The model ship has submerged! I wonder if it's... Real size counterpart has done the same! Indeed it has! We can already see from here! That now the crow's nest is a lot higher above the docks and indeed the entire ship has... come above water now. I wonder if, like with the um, spaceship, it was originally planned to have the ship actually be your means of transportation to wherever stone ship was. Of course, that means that stone ship, stone ship itself would have been different, because the ship couldn't have been embedded into the rock there. But, um, who knows? It's possible. I don't really know. I know I knew about the spaceship, but I'm not entirely sure if the same thing was true with this ship. Of course, that won't work for the other two ages, as we'll see later. Two more branches. Kind of like the leaves on the book, I guess, although those were a lot smaller. And behind the door, we find a book. As expected. Unlike the Mist book, none of these books have the title of the age on the cover. I think almost every other book in the other Mist games does have the title of the age on the cover. <laughs> but not the ones in uh, this book. In this game. Except for the Mist book, of course. And we get a tiny flyby of the age we are about to visit. 
And if we click on it, we get a slightly larger flyby. Well, we can see that the rocks was definitely an apt name that Emmett gave it. There we can see the uh, ship embedded in the largest rock, as well as the lighthouse on the left there, I guess. And something with an umbrella on top. There's the lighthouse up closer. And I think we've looped around, so let's link. And we'll explore this new age in the next video. Welcome back. We have arrived in the stone ship age. And we are standing on what appears to be the ship that has somehow become embedded in the rock. After Atris attempted to write it into the age. How exactly that works, I'm not entirely sure. It's definitely very hard to reconcile this particular change with the rules that were established um, for changing ages later. So I'm not even going to try. It will only make your head hurt. Because it's a lot of quantum physics technobabble nonsense. And it doesn't really work with what we see here. The ship appears to be pretty much the same as the uh, one in Mist, except that it seems that we can't go into the cabin because it's underwater. There's a thing with the umbrella on top. And to the right here, we can actually see the lighthouse that um, Atris built with the help of the boys who lived here. Speaking of whom, I'm noticing a distinct lack of people. Where is everybody? Are they gone? Are they dead? I don't know. Maybe we'll find out. The lighthouse appears to have a number of cables running fro uh, from it. Electricity cables, by the looks of it. And Atrus did mention a generator to power up the light on the lighthouse. So maybe that has something to do with that. Let's see if we can find anything in the lighthouse. I wonder if it was um, always this high, or well, obviously not, because Atrus said it sank 40 to 50 centimeters. But I wonder if it sank any further since that last journal entry. Because this does seem to be a bit low for a lighthouse. And again, it can't have sunk very far since these planks were put in place, because otherwise they would have uh, probably fallen down. Well, I don't know about the generator, but there is some power. Because there's a light here that appears to work. Other than that, the lighthouse appears to be full of water. And there's a hatch leading to the upper level, but unfortunately there is a padlock. And I didn't bring any cutters, or a skeleton key, or a hair clip, or a nail, or anything else we could use to get through this lock. So we're going to have to find another way. Well, there's a key here. But it's attached to a chain. Nailed into the floor here. Now, considering how old this stuff is, and how long this age has presumably been abandoned, I would think you'd probably be able to yank that out of there if you really wanted to. But it seems that uh, the stranger is a wussy and is not capable of doing so. 
Therefore, there is a problem getting that key to this lock. Because again, I didn't bring any cutter, so I can't cut this chain. A solution will have to be found, but it appears to be elsewhere. One interesting thing is that there appears to be a step here. Which makes you wonder whether or not there are other steps underwater. You know, another thing you might notice here is that it isn't exactly as sunny as uh, the journal described it. So I guess we're currently in uh, more rainy weather mode. And if you've played Real Mist, you'll know that in that version of the game it does, in fact, rain from time to time. But we can't exactly uh, see that in this game because of the technological limitations. There is a doorway in the mountain, or the rock. And uh, it's also flooded. That seems to be a theme here. Uh, Water-based puzzles. My mortal enemy. Wait, what? Um... Let's check out the other side of the ship. It's the bow. It's these sills aren't exactly in good condition, so even if the ship wasn't lodged in the rock, we still probably wouldn't be able to go anywhere. And this doorway is similarly flooded. And I sort of ran in there really, really quickly. Because I accidentally double-clicked. And there's a path leading up, which you may remember from the map in the journal. That map was a lot more complete, by the way, than the one for Selenitic, you may have noticed, because it actually contained some of the stuff in the age, rather than just a general overview of the land. I wonder if there's anything up here. There's music up here! Must be important, then. Telescope. I wonder what we will what we will be able to see through the spyglass. Well, not an awful lot. Zero degrees, I guess. And you can drag this, but it only works as long as you're staying inside the game window. Have to be a bit careful. Let's see if there's something more interesting to look at. Not much so far, just a whole bunch of rocks. Uh, that's one of the masts of the ship, I think. Ooh, and there's the lighthouse at about 135 degrees. So that's uh, southeast. To the south is another mast. So I guess that's the stern of the ship. Can we see the umbrella thing from here? I don't think so. Would be uh, around here somewhere, I think. But you can't drag up or down. Just from side to side. Nothing to the west. As far as I can tell. Just more rocks and... Clouds. And we're nearly back where we started. There we are. Well, that wasn't particularly interesting. I guess if the weather was clearer, we might be able to see more. I wonder if they ever confirmed that there were other people uh, somewhere. Definitely would make sense, because otherwise, how did all these people show up from nowhere? Unless they all linked, which I sincerely doubt. What is that thing? Actually, I think it's the crow's nest of the ship. Which would be in the part of the, uh, of, the of the ship that would actually be in the middle of the rock otherwise. The main mast, which is actually missing from the ship. It seems this is where it is. <laughs> Interesting. Is 
It's very peculiar how this uh, ship got embedded in the rock like that. I wonder what mistake Atrus made to get it like that. It's uh, any uh, in any case, it's clear evidence that Atrus was experimenting with various aspects of the arts in this age, and you can actually see that in numerous places throughout this game. But this is probably the most blatant example. The reason he needed to do such experimentation is, of course, that he had no formal dunny training in the art of writing uh, linking books. Instead, he learned most of it from his father, whose own understanding was fairly limited. Gen uh, arrived at the cleft where Atris and Anna were living and took Atris away and into Dunny when he was just 14 years old. Atris, that is, not Gen. Um, and there, Atris finally saw the places that Anna had been telling him about in the stories during his childhood. The city under the ground. Which we have, of course, also seen in Uru. That's why that was such a momentous occasion for many players when they first stepped into that location to finally see those places for ourselves. Anyway, once they got to the city, um, Gen instructed Atris in numerous things, including the Dunny language, um, as well as the Garo Hefti, which are the special Dunny uh, symbols they use for riding ages. He also indoctrinated Atrus in his vision for Dunny, which is um, actually that he intended to restore the Dunny civilization and have them rule as gods over the ages they created. However, it turned out Gen's own understanding of the art was very, very limited, having only basing instruction before uh, the fall. Gen mostly created ages by copying phrases from other books that he found, ignorant of the subtle and complex ways um, these phrases would interact. Perhaps even worse, he would often delete words that he considered to be pointless embellishments. As a result, most of Gen's ages ended up being unstable. Atrus, by contrast, applied his usual approach of observation and analysis, like we've seen in the Selenitic Age, and soon understood the art better than Gen did. We can see that even long after these events, Atrus still applied this scientific method, including here in Stoneship. He'd form a hypothesis about some aspect of the art, wrote a book to test it, and observed the result. He always tried to determine how the things he wrote manifested in the age, and could sometimes have uh, unexpected side effects, such as the appearance of people here on Stoneship, which Atrus was never really able to explain. One such experiment was this particular attempt to ride a ship into the already finished Stoneship Age. The Dunny, as a rule, never modified ages uh, after they had linked there, because modifications could often render the age unstable, or could even cause the book to uh, link to a completely different age altogether, losing the original link forever. We can see that Atrus was obviously not entirely successful um, here, because he obviously didn't intend for the ship to merge with the rock, although he later used this failure to his advantage when riding Spire, as described in Mist 4. And we'll see what else we can find on this age in the next video. Welcome back. We are exploring the mysterious stone ship age, which we can now pretty definitively say has been abandoned. Or maybe its people died. In any case, there's nobody here anymore. And you gotta wonder what happened. Also interesting is the lack of any gold, which, according to Atrus, was very prominent in this age, but has now apparently completely disappeared. It's too bad half of the places that are seen to be interesting are actually um, full of water. The only place we haven't been yet is to this place, which is the crow's nest of the ship, mysteriously placed to the side of it, with an umbrella above it. I guess the umbrella is to protect whatever is in here. These three buttons. I wonder what they do. Let's try the button on the left. Makes a sound that sort of resembles a pumping sound. 
So maybe that has something to do with one of the flooded areas. Let's take a look. Cabin was flooded. Oh, and now it isn't anymore. Very good. Wow, it's dark in here. Looks like we're underwater. There's not enough light from the outside to really be able to see what's going on here. I would guess, by the way, that this place itself does not flood. The door here probably holds the water just in the passageway, because otherwise all these wooden uh, things, like the staircase, would really be um, damaged by all the water. I have no idea where I'm going. Can't see much except for these windows that look out underwater. It's kind of neat looking and stuff, but if we want to do more here, I guess we're going to need some more light. Door automatically closes again. Probably make sure that when we pump the water back in, it doesn't flood the uh, chamber below it, as I indicated. I guess this is once again part of just um, a locking mechanism or something. As Atrus is very fond of having these kinds of contraptions. Let's see. Middle button. This is flooded again. And now this is not flooded. Actually, we didn't really verify that it wa that this was still flooded with the left button. Kind of forgot that. But let me show you it was. It's even darker in here, though. I'm not going in here. I could get eaten by a Gru. It's too dark for me. I'm going to check the lighthouse to see if that's still flooded. It is. Too bad. But we have one button left. Let's try that out. Let's see. This is flooded still. This is flooded once again. These pumps work pretty quickly, don't they? But the lighthouse... Ah, that's empty now. I wonder if all of this used to be above ground, in which case the lighthouse has um, really sunk a considerable distance. But I'm not sure. In any case, there is a staircase leading down here. I wonder what we could find. A chest filled with treasures? One could only hope. Ah, damn it, it's locked. And again, of course, that key upstairs, there's no way we can get that down here. I guess the chest is too heavy to carry. Too bad we're not a Sierra character. They would have had no trouble just fitting that chest into their pockets. But there is a spigot on the side here. Let's see what happens. Ah. Chest was filled with water. No wonder it sank. I wonder... The chest was staying on the bottom because it was filled with water. Then if we close it... It should now be filled with air. And stay filled with air when we reflood the water in here. And therefore it should... Float. Because water is lighter, if, uh, wood is lighter than uh, water, hence it flows. And unless this chest is extremely leaky, which it doesn't look like, it probably won't be able to fill fast enough, even if it does have some leaks, to uh, stay at the bottom. So hopefully uh, after we uh, do that, 
we can maneuver it close enough to that key. Hopefully it'll fit the lock. So let's see, let's just try any of the other buttons. I'm gonna do this one. Just to check if with the uh, cabin of the ship emptied. Yes, this is fluttered as I expected. I wonder actually, this room down here, who that belongs to, it could be the study that Aetris referred to. Certainly seems uh, like this kind of place sort of resembles some of the stuff we saw on Mist in uh, terms of design, particularly the library. But who knows? Let's see. Yes, the chest floated to the surface. And conveniently, it is both upright, not stuck underneath the stairs, and uh, right next to the key. How lucky we are. Let's see. We unlock it, and it contains another key. Which we can take, much like the red and blue pages. And I suppose we can use it to unlock stuff. Now, um, as you may know, the Miller brothers really didn't like inventory-based puzzles, so you can't really take anything with you in this game except for the uh, pages. So if we try to go outside, the key disappears. Now you might think that, uh, like the pages warping back to the original location if you pick up the other page, it has returned to the chest. But it has not. Have we made the game unwinnable by ma uh, making the key disappear? Of course not! This is not a King's Quest game! No, it seems that the uh, stranger is actually just really, really clumsy and when attempting to step out the door here, he dropped the key. Meaning it is now somewhere at the bottom of this um, lighthouse. That, of course, means we need to get back downstairs. Um, no, wait, it's actually that one. There it is. Good thing I didn't fall down the drain hole. That would have been uh, really unlucky. Wow, the chest has managed to land in exactly the same place as before. Can we use this key to unlock the chest? No, I guess it doesn't fit. Let's hope it fits uh, the padlock then. I hope these lights turn off when the place is flooded, otherwise we could get electrocuted by touching the water here. Let's see. Does it work on the padlock? It does! And where did the padlock go? It's gone! Or is it? Let's check downstairs again. It's not gone! It's here. You can actually pick up the key again, but then you can't use it for anything anymore. So the only way to get... Uh, to, the only thing you can do with it is keep it in your hand until you automatically drop it again when leaving the lighthouse. Um, and let's uh, head back upstairs. Actually, you can already see the padlock and the key from here. Shows you that they really did pay attention to detail when making this game. But then, of course, we already knew that. Let's see what's to be found on the upper level of Lighthouse. Not much. I guess this is where um, Atris slept the first night after they completed the Lighthouse. Because he said he was pleasantly surprised by waking up not being covered by ocean dew. Which would happen if you slept inside. I guess he brought the glass from uh, another rage. 
At least in this case, we know he had help building this stuff from the inhabitants of this particular age. And what's this? Looks like a battery of some kind uh, with a gauge on it. Maybe that indicates the electricity level. That would make this a generator, I guess. Looks like it's hand cranked. I hope that they originally had uh, a better way of doing that, otherwise keeping the lighthouse going would be really annoying. Let's see what's happening to the battery. Ooh, the gauge is rising. It's actually nearly to the top. Let's crank it some more. See if we can fill up that battery. That should be enough. I think that gives us about 10 minutes of power. The interesting thing uh, here is that if the generator is here, that means that these power cables are not, in fact, providing power to the lighthouse. It means that the generator in the lighthouse is providing power to other things in this age. Another question is, how did the lamps in the lighthouse work if there wasn't any power? Maybe there's a backup battery, or maybe they just look like uh, light bulbs, but actually do have fire marbles in them. I don't know. Could be. Let's see. Oh, you can already see from here, there's actually light in this tunnel now. Maybe that means there's also light down here now. Let's try that, see if we can go uh, underwater uh, and actually see something there. Hmm. This looks just as dark as it did before. That's sort of annoying. I guess we'd better go in here then, which means we need to switch the pump again. Actually, didn't, isn't that generator supposed to power the light on the lighthouse? Can't see it from here. But maybe we can find a better vantage point. Like up here. Let's look through the spyglass again. And look at the lighthouse. Yes. Now you can see that the light from the lighthouse is blinking on and off at exactly 135 degrees. Well, let's see if we can get down these passages now that we turned the lights on there. But we'll have to do that in the next video. Welcome back. We have managed to provide this H with power by cranking the uh, generator in the lighthouse. Of course, providing ages uh, with power will become a staple puzzle of the mysteries for decades to come. With it, we now have some more light in the um, two tunnels. So let's see if we can go down them. Actually, you can go down them even when it's dark. I just didn't want to. Too afraid of those grooves. Now at least we can see where we're going. And it leads to a door, much like the one that leads to the uh, room underneath the stern of the ship. And this also leads to a room. Presumably, again, this is a watertight door, so I don't think this room would get flooded. Because if it did, it would be a shame to ruin such a nice carpet. It's somebody's bedroom. Quite opulent. And somehow I doubt that this bedroom belongs to uh, any of the boys from the Stone Ship Age. Maybe it belongs to one of the brothers. In which case, I'd say... Probably Cirrus. Seems to be his style. I 
wonder wh whose crest this is. If anyone's. It's displayed rather prominently. There's a number of things in this uh, room. There's a bed. Nothing on the bed. And... These are some interesting looking spheres. Ooh, what the hell? They're projectors of some kind. This one shows a cloudy sky, it looks it. They're a bit noisy for uh, if you want to watch TV on them or something. Let's check the other one. Uh, water, I guess? I don't know, sort of cool. I'm not entirely sure what he wanted with it. My chandelier. And a chest of drawers. Let's see if there's anything of interest in there. Our matey, we found us some booty! Coins! This is the only sign of wealth we've seen on this age so far. Despite the fact that gold was supposed to be abundant here. I wonder if uh, Sirius maybe took all of that gold for his own self. Who knows? Let's see. Jewels! I hope Sirius didn't uh, wear this necklace, if indeed this was Sirius's bedroom. Maybe it belonged to Catherine. We know nothing about Catherine, so if this was Catherine's bedroom, there's no way to tell, but somehow this doesn't seem like a woman's bedroom. Um, let's see... Some glasses, some plates... Some candles... Everything you need for a nice dinner. Some pretty nice wine glasses, actually. wonder if they're crystal. If this was uh, Mist 4, we could find out by tapping them, but... This is not Mist 4, you can't do that in this game. Um, I didn't mean to do that. Let's check the other drawers. Some pieces of cloth, by the looks of it. Interesting motif. Probably completely irrelevant, not important at all. This one's empty! And the bottom one contains the red page! I, gu I guess that pretty much confirms that this is... Uh, Sirius's bedroom. Although, I don't know. I mean, Sirius obviously didn't put uh, these pages here. Actually, that's a good question. Who did put these pages here? It's chronologically, actually... Um, the uh, brothers getting trapped in the books happened after something else happened. I can't really talk about this without <laughs> giving spoilers. But there, is, there logically isn't anyone who could have done this. I mean, at this point we might think it could have been um, Atreus and Catherine, but from other information it couldn't have been Atreus or uh, and Catherine who put the pages here. Obviously it wasn't Sirius and Akinar themselves, so that means there must be another stranger who came here and tore up the books and distributed these pages over uh, all the ages, and then left, somehow. In which case we're now undoing all of his hard work. Um, let's see... There's also a table. Rather nice mural behind it. Well, at least Sirius has some decent taste. Ah, that's just weird. Nothing on the desk. Desk is well polished, considering how uh, long this place has probably been abandoned. I would expect it to be more dusty. And here we find a knife, some bottles, some more bottles of syringe and some pills. 
Was Cirrus a narcotics abuser? That doesn't really paint a nice picture, now does it? I guess the candles in the drawers are spares for these. Well, I guess that's it. Ooh, and it's dark here again. We've run out of power. You can still sort of see the door, so you can get into Cirrus's room, even when you have um, gone down here without power. Let's uh, go back here and give ourselves some more power. How are we doing? That's about halfway. This is fairly annoying that you can't see the gauge while you're actually um, cranking the generator. Alright, with power restored, let's check out the other tunnel, which is also no longer submersed, because those two are on the same pump. And well, let's head down. And another chamber. If the other chamber was indeed uh, Cirrus's bedroom, then I guess this might be Aknar's bedroom. Um, if it is... I'm rather disturbed. This is some creepy decor. I mean, who makes a lamp out of a human ribcage? That's pretty messed up right there. Some antlers on the wall. Kind of reminds me of Gen using warg tusks in Riven. Except chronologically I haven't seen that yet, so... I guess it should be the other way around. Anyway. What's this? Bottles of poison! Okay, so we got somebody who abuses drugs and the other brother uses poison. I don't know which is worse. Actually, yes I do. This kills you. Although, presumably, he didn't take it himself. Which is probably even worse if... Uh, somebody... If he gave the poison to other people. Another chest of drawers here. With some contraption on top. A rose! Kinda hologram. This is pretty nice, actually. There's also a lever here. Let's try moving that. This is kinda touchy. Hard to do. Um, the hell? Oh, come on, Akinar. The rose was kind of nice, but this... <sighs> I'm almost afraid to open these drawers now. It's a map. With a lot of animals. I guess it's another rage. Doesn't look like stone ship anyway. More maps. I guess Akinar collected maps. Nothing intrinsically wrong with that, at least. Maps! Get your maps! Ooh, this isn't a map. This is... Half of a note. Marker with Island. The vault is low. The island of... Achieved very... Instructions are each of the marker. Turn every one off. Off position. As a final step, there to. Huh. Something about a vault. Vault here or somewhere else? Maybe the vault in the log cabin on Mist. Although this doesn't. This seems a bit uh, complex for a vault that only needs a combination code. I don't know. Let's memorize this. I would take it with me, but, well, you can't. So let's memorize it instead. 
And another map. There's so much maps here, where's the cops handler? Also, I suppose there should be a blue page here somewhere. Yes, there it is. But I'm sticking with the red one for now. We'll give uh, Sirius this page first. That is, if we can find the way out of here. Because we're sort of running out of places to explore. It doesn't look like there's anything else in here. By the way, if I have to sleep somewhere, I think I prefer Sirius's bed. At least that one was clean. Let's see, let's go back upstairs. Maybe there's something we missed in uh, Sarah's bedroom. Let's see. Wait a second. Something in the wall here. It's kind of hard to see. I think it was even harder to see in the original... Uh, version of Mist, rather than the Masterpiece Edition, because the color sort of disappeared here. It's sort of reddish. Let's see... Ooh! A secret passage has been revealed. Let's take a look, shall we? I don't know why I'm talking like Sean Connery all of a sudden. And... Um, It's another underwater chamber, by the looks of it. With a compass... ...in the middle, and another chamber... ...with another, uh, ...hallway leading this way. Ooh, I think I know where we are. Yes! Ah, so I could've see ...could've gotten into this place from both sides. Neat. Wait, where's the entrance? Oh, there it is! It's looking on the wrong side of the corner. What to do with the compass, though? Guess we'll find out in the next video. Welcome back. We have found a secret passage. Within a center... A compass. Let's take a closer look. It looks to be uh, an ordinary compass rose, and considering the symbol here, I suppose that this is north. The real question though is what are these things around it? Are they lights? Or maybe they're buttons? Let's try one. Well, that wasn't the right one. What's going on? I can't see a thing. Hmm. Looks like the light's turned off. It's very dark here. Let's see, ah. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I hope uh, we didn't alert the guard dogs or anything. Um, which way is up? That's down. Ah, thank goodness. Outside. Away from that dreadful noise. Looks like pressing that button triggered an alarm and an emergency power shutdown. Which is a bit annoying. Still, I'm interested in what you can do with that um, compass. I suppose that one of the buttons will have a different result. But before we can check that out, we really need to restore power. So it's back here. If we see, uh, if we check the battery now, we see that it is empty. I'm not entirely sure how that would work. I mean, I can imagine an alarm tripping an emergency power shutdown by flipping a breaker, but how would it drain the battery that fast? I don't know.
we need to recharge it in any case. I actually have quite a nice view from uh, here. Of both ends of the ship stuck in the rock. And you can see part of the structure that holds up the walkway at the top here. And I guess that's close enough. Full charge gives you about 10 minutes, and I don't intend to take nearly that long. So, let's head back down. And hope that that alarm didn't screw anything else up. Hopefully we didn't uh, make the game unwinnable. Oh wait, I forgot. This isn't King Quest. This is a missed game. You can't make them unwinnable. Alright. The compass again. You can see actually that the uh, north direction is um, pointing away from both of the corridors. And it doesn't really matter which direction you came from. Whenever you look at the compass, you will always look at it with north at the top. Which means that the uh, two hallways are now down uh, to our left and right there. Okay, but uh, I suppose we could try each and every one of these buttons to see which one is the uh, correct one. But that would take a little uh, time since we'd have to go back and recharge the battery every time. And I don't really feel like doing that, so maybe we can reason it out. Well, the only other place in this age that we've seen anything to do with directions is the uh, spyglass at the top of the rock. And when we were looking around with the spyglass, the only interesting thing that we could see at any of the directions was the top of the lighthouse at 135 degrees or southeast. So I'm willing to bet that this is the button we need to use at 135 degrees. Let's give it a try. Well, no alarm this time. In fact, it seems to have gotten considerably lighter. Some lights turned on outside, underwater. Could it be those submersible lamps that the uh, journal mentioned? I suppose that is a strong possibility. Is there another one, actually? Yes, there are two submersible lamps here. One facing each of the corridors. I wonder, though, if there are some submersible lamps here... Maybe there are some in other locations, too. And there's only one other location that we've been that is underwater in this age, which is the... cabin of the sunken ship. Where we did run into a problem of it being too dark to see anything, so hopefully... There will be some submersible lamps that uh, have been triggered by what we just did. If that is not the case, then I really don't know what it accomplished, because there wasn't anything else that we could see in the secret passage, even with the extra lights on. Well, let's take a look. Oh, I can already see that it is, in fact, a lot lighter here. See, there's another one of these submersible lamps. I guess there must be something important in here that Atrus, or whomever, I'm guessing it Atrus, did not want anyone to find. Hence why he made it so difficult to reach this place with the water pumps and to actually see what you're doing with this complicated mechanism to turn the lights on. Otherwise, why not just put a light switch on the inside of the door like a normal person? 
of the rooms we've seen so far, this is definitely the nicest though. I'd much rather uh, use this as my study or bedroom or uh, anything than the uh, rooms of either Cirrus or Akinar. Well, I guess Cirrus's room isn't too bad, but uh, I'm not really into the whole uh, opulent wealth thing. Looks like down here at the bottom, there is a desk. Notice, by the way, that now we are looking in the direction of the rock. You can actually see um, some of the rock through the window pane, although it's hard to see. There's another submersible lamp there. If this were real mist, you could actually see some fish swimming around, but you can't in this version of the game. So we are now underneath the uh, stern of the ship, looking towards the island, towards uh, the front. No, well, not really the, the front of the ship, because that's on the other side of the island. Anyway, towards the island, because this is the back of the ship, which is the direction we were heading when we came down. Oh, that's interesting. You can't really look that way. Um, and we made a turn here. So now we are looking towards the island, not away from it, towards the rear of the ship. There seem to be some more submersible lamps around here. And nothing under the stairs, as far as I can see. No broom closet for Harry Potter to hide. So the only thing of interest here is this desk. Let's look at it closer. Very plain looking desk. I suppose at some point Atrus must have had some chairs here, unless he likes working standing. Doesn't have any drawers or any other place to uh, hide anything, and I was rather hoping to find the mist book here. Hmm. Well, maybe we uh, there's a hidden compartment or something. Let's try doing something with this desk. Okay. I guess we found the mist book. That's an interesting way to hide something. I guess this is something like an optical illusion or something that makes it look like the book morphs out of the table. It probably just comes up normally out of a hidden, com hidden compartment or something. I don't think uh, the Dunny had the capability of turning wood into books. Anyway, we found our way back home, meaning we can go and give Cyrus his third red page. You know what would really suck? If we went to an age from here where there is no linking book back to Mist, or the book has gotten damaged or lost or something. We'd be stuck! And that would be a bad thing. Alright, red page, red book, let's see what Cirrus has to say. I suppose we will be able to understand him a little bit more clearly once again. And I'm going to guess he wants more red pages. Unless we're already done, which I doubt. Have returned. On this forgotten fire of mist. I see that you are. I am called Sears. I need all the red pages. I know. Must search and bring two more of the red pages. I am released. I promise. Don't touch the blue pages. That is where my mind For my wicked brother, Akinar. He is a man of 
distorted mind and senses. He disgusts me. Do not release Akna. Thirst for destruction is not. Never ending. Bring the red paper. Beg you, please release me from this prison. I promise you will be greatly rewarded. Must, must help. help. Well, most of that was very similar to what we've heard him say before, but with even stronger warnings not to trust his brother. I think their distaste of each other goes a little bit beyond sibling rivalry. One uh, new piece of information, though, is the fact that there are apparently two remaining uh, red pages. Which makes sense, considering there are two journals left on the uh, uh, bookshelf here. And, of course, we want to give uh, Akinar his blue page, because despite Cyrus' warning, I am kind of uh, interested in what he has to say, too. But we'll do that in the next video. Welcome back. We have just returned from the Stone Ship Age with a red page for Cyrus. And although he rather strongly suggested that we do not bring any blue pages to uh, Akinar, I don't think there's any harm in hearing both sides of the story. So, we shall return to the Stone Ship Age to bring back the blue page. And fortunately, that is a lot less time-consuming than it was in the Selenitic Age, because there is no long maze to go through this time. So, back to the stone ship. And now that we have finished um, the age, and know what to do and where to find the remaining blue page, I will once again show you the hint map. Yes, we are looking for the second page, but I also know where it is, so I don't really need these hints, I just want to look at the map. This map is a lot simpler than the one for the Selenetic Age, because, well, Stone Chip Age isn't as big. Everything's pretty close together and easy to find. One thing this map doesn't show, though, is the layout of the underground tunnels. While at first you might think that's fairly straightforward, it isn't as simple as it seems. When you enter the tunnel to Cirrus' bedroom, the tunnel makes several turns to the left, and the panel to the secret passage is on the left wall. Similarly, the tunnel to Akinar's room turns right several times, and the panel is on the right wall. In both tunnels, the panel is just after the third turn. In order for that to work with the way the secret passages from both tunnels meet up, the only layout that I can come up with is that the tunnels actually go around nearly full circle, like this, putting the bedrooms pretty much directly underneath the tunnel entrances. It's very hard and missed to see how long the tunnels are, or how sharp the corners are, so I have no idea of the scale if this is even remotely correct, but the basic layout should be something similar to this. If we add the secret passages to this map, it would look like this. This matches what we see in the game, since if you enter the passage from Akinar's side, you make a left turn at the compass to get to Cirrus' side. We can further verify this layout using compass directions. I observed that in the compass room, North was in between and away from both passages. 
And we also know that from the top of the walkway, from the telescope, the lighthouse is to the southeast, allowing us to precisely determine where north is supposed to be. As you can see, the two values for north don't match up exactly, but they're close enough for me to believe that the real layout is something close to this, and I just didn't get the drawing exactly right. I tried to verify my observations with Real Mist, uh, hoping that I could get a better feel for the layout of the tunnels there. Real Mist definitely suggests that the tunnels are long enough and the corners sharp enough for this to be possible. However, when it comes to the secret passage, Real Mist seems to contain a serious mistake. The direction of north in the compass room in Real Mist is different from in, uh, what we see in Mist. In Real Mist, it's in the same direction as the tunnel coming from Akinar's side, which is actually closer to east, according to my theory. What's more, when coming from Akinar's side, you have to make a right turn at the compass to go to Cirrus' side, unlike the left turn in Mist. There is absolutely no way you can construct a layout where Cirrus' tunnel curves left, Akinar's tunnel curves right, the secret passage from Akinar's side heads north, and then connects to Cirrus' uh, side via right turn at the compass. The only way you can make those things fit um, is if you're MC Escher. I can only conclude that in real mist, the secret passage was somehow hooked up backwards, with Cirrus's and Akinar's sides reversed. If that is the case, then the intention would have been that the secret passage from Cirrus's side, not Akinar's, heads north, and that certainly seems plausible enough, and is only a minor change from mist. I've not been able to uh, find any maps of the Stone Ship Age indicating the layout of the um, tunnels and the secret passage, so I have no idea whether any of this uh, is correct. I certainly think it's plausible, though. Alright! Let's go and retrieve a um, blue page. But all of the lights have turned off again, so let's get some power first. As I said before, making changes to an existing age like Aetris did here is something that the Dunny didn't normally do. Atrus only did it because he was never taught by the Dunny, and the same was true for Gen. One memorable example of the dangers of modifying an age occurred in Gen's Age 37. He never named ages, you see, he just numbered them sequentially. Which he and Atrus visited during the time that Atrus lived with Gen in Dunny. The natives of Age 37 worshipped a weather phenomenon known as the Whiteness, basically a huge wall of mist caused by a temperature difference in the ocean water. Again, wanting to make sure he was the only thing the natives worshipped, tried to modify the Age's descriptive book to remove the phenomenon. Although he did remove it, the Age was struck by earthquakes and eventually suffered a catastrophic drop in water level, leaving the natives unable to survive. When Gen tried to correct this by making deletions um, in uh, Age 37's descriptive book, it ended up linking to a different Age altogether making Aedris and Gen unable to return to the real Age 37 and leaving its inhabitants to presumably die as a result of Gen's incompetence. With the change uh, in the descriptive book, it was now impossible to actually get back to the original Age 37 as all the linking books would have changed accordingly. And that shows very clearly that it's dangerous to make changes because if you change too much or do something that is wrong, or contradicts an existing thing in the age, then, instead of changing it, you end up linking to a different age. And this experience really was what uh, convinced Atris that what Gen believed about the art was wrong. The Dunny didn't, uh, the Dunny didn't create worlds, they linked to existing ones. And therefore, they shouldn't really consider themselves as gods on those worlds. Which, um, Gen, of course, did do. So that was the first time we really had some strife between Gen and Atris when they disagreed on that point after the events in Age 37. Okay, it's time for us to head back to Mist. All right, there we are, back again with a blue page. So let's see 
what Akinar has to tell us. I'm guessing that like series it will mostly be more of the same, just clearer. Pages you find. Bring more. I must have some more. That's all I ask of you. Long. It's so long since my brother, Cyrus, wrongfully imprisoned me within this book. Stupid schemes. Pretty speech. Which is endless! It should be perfectly obvious to you. He's done evil and he has destroyed all before. Do not bring the red pages to him. Do not let him trick you. He tricked our father. Murdered our father! He'll touch you! He'll murder you. Don't touch the red pages. I beg you to bring the blue pages. To me. Listen, you must obey me. Blue pages are my only hope. You must help me. You must help me. Jesus, you must obey me? Chill out, dude, I understand that you're imprisoned, but... Come on, if you want me to help, you might be a bit nicer about it. Both of uh, Sirius and Akinar actually come across as sort of page junkies, <laughs> the way they uh, act. But more interesting than any of that is the implication Akinar made that Atrus has been murdered by Cirrus. Which would be well, ra rather a bit more serious than uh, just some burnt books, even if they were linking books. If there is a murder involved here, and indeed a danger that we ourselves might get murdered if we release the wrong man, we'd better think very carefully. Which is why we must continue to bring both the blue and red pages to ensure that we make as most an informed decision as possible. There does not appear to be any harm, at least, uh, in bringing both pages until we have uh, all of them, I guess. I mean, all it does is make them uh, talk to us more clearly. It does not seem to be... Uh, does not seem to actually release them until we get the last page. And there are at least two more. I'm guessing by now, by the way, that there um, that there were also more linking books that uh, Sirius and Akinar destroyed, rather than just the journals. Perhaps the linking books were on this uh, bookshelf as well, only Atrus removed the only uh, intact ones after the fire, leaving their journals behind. Although it is rather convenient that the uh, journals and surviving linking books match. I suppose it's possible that the journals and the linking books that survived were stored separately and after the fire Atrus moved the linking books to their places of protection and the journals to the bookshelf for some reason. Might just have been a temporary thing. I don't know. 
I'm just guessing here. Anyway, we have finished with the stone chip age, and that means, of course, that we are going to read another journal, which we'll do in the next video. Welcome back. We have completed the stone ship age. So, let's look at one of the remaining two journals. And this time I'm going to pick this one. Which has a picture of a gear on the cover. So I'm already guessing that the age that this describes has something to do with the gears that we saw on one end of the island. I suppose that that might be the place of protection where this uh, book is um, um, stored. Let's read what this journal can teach us. Before arriving in this age, I was determined that it would be a journey to a world very different from my previous adventures, and it was. The sky here is dark and grey, and incessantly displays flashes of lightning in the distance. I met a very old man with a long beard and hair that hangs to his waist. He is very feeble, and has trouble even moving. This man has obviously been through very many things in this strange world, and I have learned many things from him. He has told me an interesting story of this world's history. Years ago, he told me, there was a beautiful city that rose up out of the water. It housed many people inside its walls, and the people had everything they wished for. The city was surrounded by three high hills, which rose higher than the city. On the east hill of the city rested a large lookout post. The people of the city had constructed the post, expecting visitors to arrive from the east. The people had no means of traveling on the water, which forced them to merely wait for friend or foe. As time passed, friendly visitors brought rumors of an enemy that existed beyond the horizon. The people grew fearful, yet nothing happened. One day, the usually strong su uh, sorry, one day the usually sunny sky became as dark as night, and black ships appeared on the horizon. The lookout posts' attempt at peace were turned away, and the sentries there were easily overwhelmed. The ships continued to wreak havoc on the city apparently destroying everyone and everything. After the foundations of the city were destroyed, the city sunk deep into the ocean, and only the lookout post remained. The black ships sailed away. The man continued to say that eight people had hidden and managed to survive through the attack. In the nine years since the attack, two of the survivors had died. He also said that it was rumored that ten years from the attack, the enemy would return to finish the destruction, they had started so long ago. I have decided, since hearing the man's story, it would be admirable to save this civilization and stop this enemy's plan of destruction. I am excited about the adventure that awaits me and an idea has sparked in my mind to provide the needed defense for these people. I met the remaining survivors today and I have begun work on a plan for protection. After a short absence I have returned to this age with my two sons. They have, as of yet, traveled rarely with me, and they are understandably excited to be here. They have grown considerably since Everdunes, and it is already obvious to me that they will be of great help this time instead of the nuisance they have been in the past. All three of us, along with four of the healthier survivors, began construction today. We are bu building upon the old city's ruins, which will provide a perfect foundation for our fortress. My sons have been spending much of their spare time on the South Island, where most of my materials are stored. I am very pleased with their intelligence and their creativity. It is refreshing to see as they work on some small projects of their own. And this drawing looks like a staircase that can close up by rising if these arrows are anything to go by. It has been over four months now, and construction is going well. My sons love the world, except for its grey sky. They detest the grey sky, and tell me many times they wish the sky here were like the blue sky in mist. The old man I first talked to tells me that the enemy is due in four months. 
I feel we will be ready when the time comes. The man reminds me of Emmett in many ways, and I often wonder how Emmett and his people are doing. It has been six months of work, and we have finally finished the fortress. It rests between the three hills, which are now only islands due to a rising water level that the people experienced after the attack. Inside the fortress I have designed a most intriguing device. It makes use of a technology called holography. I began experimenting with on my visits to Aspermere. It will be working in a couple of days after I compensate for some small miscalculations. This holographic device will enable survivors to learn to use the fortress. The enemy is due to come soon, and I trust the fortress will provide... And an intermediate page with a... Uh, drawing. I guess this is the fortress of which... Uh, Atrus spoke, and the three islands, although if those were the hills between which the city used to be, then that city couldn't have been very good, unless the scale on this is much larger than it looks. And another drawing of a gear. I trust the fortress will provide sufficient protection for all of us. The black ships have come. Their attack was substantial. Their weapons have been stopped, and it appears they have, tr they have turned away in defeat. I could not help but smile as I watched the boats leave. And a drawing of the insignia of the black ships. Haven't we seen that somewhere before? Last night we had a small celebration, and the old survivors danced their dances of old. My sons did not understand why the sky had not turned back to its original blue. The old man told them that the storms would never end until the enemy was destroyed. I assured my sons that the blue sky was not worth the risk of death, and they seemed to hear me. I have had a healthy adventure and have begun work on a new book. Once again, I must leave a familiar age in search of a new universe I have begun. But first I will have an extended time with Catherine, whom I miss very much. I must also return to the people of the Tide. I believe in my travels I have found a substance that will ease the pain of their bone ailments that they have long endured. I hope to return to Mechanical Age one day and find the population growing and my fortress still strong. Though the blue sky may always be black, I am confident the people here feel a heavier darkness has been lifted from their shoulders. And that is all that we can learn from this journal. And in keeping with my tradition of always doing journals in their own video, we will continue in the next video. Welcome back. We have just finished reading the um, journal for the Mechanical Age. So now, I suppose we need to find out how to get there. Which, um, well, if we know the procedure, will involve the uh, tower rotation. To reveal both the place of protection and the key. Well, since the cover of the book um, had a picture of a gear uh, on it, I suppose that this is where we will be able to find that book. So let's uh, rotate the tower to face the gears. The only location we've left after that is apparently the giant tree that we have seen, which I suppose therefore is the age mentioned in the uh, final journal that we haven't read yet. All right. Let's open up this secret passage. And see if we can find a clue. 
to how to open the place of protection for the mechanical edge. Every time we did this, it has involved more locations than just the place of protection. For the Stellanitic Age, we had to use not just the spaceship, but also the generator room. For the Stone Ship Age, we had to use not just the ship, but also the uh, pillars around the model of the sunken ship and the planetarium. So I'm guessing that this will involve not just the gears, but also another location on the island. But where? Well, this should show us the gears, which it does. You can see uh, the marker switch there, and you can actually see that it is switched up. Nice attention to the tail there. Let's see what clues can be revealed. Two forty and two two one. Two forty is that a ratio? Two by forty? No idea what that would apply to. I guess the three number combination could be the combination to the safe in the uh, log cabin. I don't really know what to do with a two forty. I suppose it could be a time. 40 minutes past 2. For the clock tower? I guess both of those ideas warrant some investigation. So, remembering these clues, let's head back down and see if we can use them. I guess first we'll uh, check out whether or not that three number combination is uh, for the safe, since that's the easiest thing to check. Oh, I accidentally double clicked there, skipped the screen. Butterflies. Neat. All right, let's see. Law cabin. Well, I doubt actually that this uh, is the combination for the safe because the law cabin appears to have something to do with the tree, the remaining place of protection, not the gears. But, well, trying it won't hurt. Two, two, one. Nope. Hmm, well, let's try our other idea, that the time has something to do with the clock tower. Actually, come to think of it, it makes sense that the clock tower ha has something to do with the mechanical age, because its base is a gear. Clever. Okay, so we need to go to 240, meaning we need um, 11 turns on the large wheel and 9 turns on the small wheel. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Did we get that right? Looks like it. Would be much easier if you could actually see the clock <laughs> while looking at the gears. And now if we push the button, a path appears. Cool. Hey, look, the number plate of the, the clock actually says missed. Kind of neat. 
Final marker switch! Well, turning all of them on still had no um, obvious effect, other than, of course, revealing the um, clock tower on the map in the library, I suppose. Let's see. Well, fortunately the door is not locked. That's gonna save some trouble. A gear, much like the one on the end of the island, and some more gears here with numbers on them. 333. Three, three. Ah, so this is probably what we need to set to 221. Well, let's see, we have two levers on each end of the machine and another lever back here. Well, that one doesn't do anything. Let's see. Oh, that moves the bottom two numbers. It also drops this weight down here. Two, two, one, three, two, two, one, two. No, I want two, two, one. No, that's two, two, three. But I can't get the one on there this way. Three, one, one. One, two, one. This might be more difficult than I thought. Oh. Looks like we ran out of turns. The counterweight has dropped all the way. The counterweight seems to be attached to something at the top. And there's a chain going from this lever to the top as well, so hopefully... Yes. That resets it. Also resets the numbers. Now this puzzle looks very difficult if you are doing it the way I just did. What you have to realize to make this puzzle actually really, really easy is that if you pull the lever and then hold, it will move for this one, the middle row, by itself. Or the bottom row. Oh, no, also the middle row, sorry. <laughs> they both move uh, the middle row. So all we really need to do is put two at the top. Now if I pull this, it will put the one in its right place and continue rotating this, which I will have to do until we hit the two again. And then I can just release, making this puzzle actually very simple. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out a way to do this just with single pulls because I didn't try holding the lever down at first. Not sure if there is a way to do it with single pulls. There might be. Okay, there we go. Two, two, one. Well, this small gear opened. Well, with Stone Ship Age, the small ship emerged, and so did the uh, large ship, so maybe the small gear opened, or maybe also the large gear. Oh, what the hell. Um, opened now. Which is certainly worth checking out. Kind of looks like you're jumping over the bird bath that way rather than walking around it. Um, actually, if we go into the library now, we should be able to confirm that yes, the clock tower is now visible on the map, which it wasn't before, as well as these uh, additional paths. Because we flipped the marker switch. But since the clock tower is not one of the places of protection, that doesn't really accomplish anything. The tower does not stop there. And indeed, the large gear has opened. I'm kind of disappointed that these gears are not related to a mechanism to turn the... Uh, island into a giant rocket launch platform or some some other James Bond villain type thing. 
Well, I guess a linking book to a brand new age will have to do. I wonder why the Mist Book is the only book that has uh, the name on the cover. And this definitely looks like the location we saw on the map in the journal. Big fortress, and I stand by my claim that the scale of this makes it look like the city was really small. If it uh, used to exist in between these three uh, hills. I think we've uh, looped around, haven't we? We probably have. Yes, we definitely have. We almost looped around twice. I kind of prefer the way they did it in Riven, where they uh, end with circling the location that you're going to link to, because it's much easier to see when you're done with the animation. Well, once again, we are in a location that strongly resembles the one where we um, linked away from. Like with the Selenitic Age. But we are clearly not on Mist anymore. And we'll explore this new age in the next video. Welcome back. We have arrived in yet another new age, our third age, the Mechanical Age. We have here a structure that looks a lot like the one uh, on Mist where the book was, except there's no book here. So again, I guess one of our primary concerns will be to locate the uh, Mist book. Let's take a look around. There's some interesting giant gears here, which are apparently unused. That's where the uh, fortress is, with a uh, wind vane on the top. One thing that you might um, immediately notice, although I must admit that I certainly never noticed this when uh, I first played the game, but I did lo uh, notice it on subsequent replays, is that the sky is not black. There is no sign of these storms on the horizon. In fact, the sky is a perfectly clear blue. And this seems to indicate that the black ship pirates are dead. Either they died out by themselves, or someone decided to go after them anyway. Could it have been Cirrus or Akinar? Atris mentioned in the journal that they wanted to, but uh, that Atris believed he had talked them out of it, but, uh, well, considering the nature of the two characters, I wouldn't uh, be surprised if one of them decided to disobey his father and uh, come back here and finish the job. Lots of gears here. I guess that this is the South Island then, which Atris said he used to store his materials. I guess he ended up uh, not needing all of the gears he brought. There's also a kind of control pad here, where it looks things. As well as this. That looks like the rising staircase that was drawn in the journal, but it is presently closed. And doesn't open when we click on it or anything. I bet this has something to do with it. Bunch of symbols, pluses mostly, and a bunch of buttons. Ah. These seem to change the symbols. And this does nothing. Now I'm willing to bet that... 
changing these symbols that these uh, that these changing symbols are actually part of a combination probably if we get the combination right this will open I have a feeling that might be where the mist book is there are quite a few different symbols so I don't really feel like brute forcing this and if um, our experience so far has taught us anything it is that there will be an answer somewhere there are more islands visible around the uh, perimeter of the fortress that one over there if this is indeed south that would be the east island which I guess is where the original lookout post was and um, I I think there is another island to the north, which you can't really see from here. Because it's uh, obscured by the fortress. We did see it in the flyby, though. But there is no bridge connecting to those islands. The bridge appears to go this way, but it looks like this bridge is... Um, Suspended on this railing that goes around the entire fortress, and it's actually on wheels, you can see. So it seems to be capable of moving. In fact, the fortress itself seems to sit on top of a mechanism, suggesting that this fortress rotates. Wait. Rotating fortresses? That sounds awfully familiar. Well, there's no evidence that Atris never visited Garrison, so maybe he did. And that's where he got the idea. I guess they must have had ornaments of some kind as well, if they successfully fought off the, uh, the pirates. I mean, this fortress looks like it might um, be a very defensible position. But if you don't have any way to... Uh, convince your enemy to leave, that still isn't really going to do much. More remnants of gears. Okay, um... Not much left of that outpost, if that is indeed where it was. Then again, I suppose the black ship pirates would have destroyed that. I like that you actually are able to look left and right on these locations. Too few places in this game where you can do that. Let's head inside. Looks like um, we can go either left or right. Again, there's lights here indicating either a power source or maybe there are uh, fire marbles in there. I'm actually gonna go left first. I don't know why, I just like going from left to right usually. Some ominous uh, music here. Doesn't really look like an appealing place to live or anything, this fortress. But somebody did live here. Another bedroom. Who wants to bet that this is... Um, one of the brothers' bedrooms, and in fact, judging by the opulent feel, I'd say probably Cirrus's. Which means we should probably scout around for another red page. What do we have here? A throne? Really? Can we sit on the throne? Yes. Look at me, ye mighty and despair. Okay, maybe not. That's probably what Cyrus would have thought, though. Why would he have a throne? I mean, come on! It's really ap um, appealing, sort of, to think that there's things in the throne or things you can do with the throne, but there's not. I guess this is chess for beginners. It's six by six. <laughs> I don't know any board games with, that are six by six like that. 
If indeed it is a board game, might not be. Wine glass. Some tapestries. Not sure what this is a depiction of. And a mechanical bird. Um, this doesn't do anything. Ah, okay. It's a winding mechanism. It winds the bird. That's kind of cute. But, quite pointless. I wonder where, uh... Sarah's actually got this. You can get a bit of a more clo uh, closer look at the uh, tapestry here, but I really do not know what that is a depiction of, or if that is a real painting. I know the, um, the two paintings in here, but I don't know this. Maybe someone will tell me in the comments. On this side are some items that look familiar. Rocket from the Selenitic Age, and another m uh, model of the boat from Stone Ship Age. Doesn't look like we can do anything with it. Its tiny door does not open. It's nice, though. Sears is quite the collector of uh, junk, it seems. Now, this painting is kind of a, an interesting case. This painting is actually a um, real painting called Madame Moitessier uh, by the uh, French painter Ingres. However, this painting was painted in 1856. 50 years after this game is supposed to take place. Clear evidence that that particular part of the backstory was not yet invented by the game's creators when they uh, made this game. Although if you ask Richard Watson, I'm sure he'll say that um, the original authentic journals that the Myst games are based on mentioned artwork in, the, uh, in this room perhaps. But since they didn't have it, they just used contemporary artwork in the game instead. Or something like that. In any case, bit of an anachronism there. I believe this painting is in the uh, National Gallery of London, but I'm not sure. Alright. He has a spyglass. I guess maybe they used these uh, portholes at the site to... Uh, fight back. Well, Spyglass looks at absolutely nothing, and unlike the one in uh, the uh, Stone Ship Age, you cannot move this one. Model of the Clock Tower. Painting of some mountains. Not sure what this is either. Looks like there's maybe a village or something in front of the mountains. It's a bit hard to make out. Some gems. Which light up when you hover over them. Interesting. When I first played this game, I was convinced this was part of a puzzle. But it's not. It's just decorative. Which is a bit uh, misleading. And a drawer, which does not open, it seems. Maybe we need to find a way to open it to find that red page, which so far isn't, there is no sign of. But we haven't finished looking around um, all of the room yet. There's another painting here. And it's another painting by Angre. Napoleon I on his throne is what it's called. Except it seems that the face of the painting was replaced by Cirrus's face. Illusions of grandeur, March uh, Cirrus. This painting was actually painted in 1806. Again, making it highly unlikely that uh, 
Sears could have it, although not entirely impossible. And I suppose that since the original is again in a museum in real life, this has to be a reproduction, not the original. All right, uh, well... That looks to be all there is in this room, but no sign of a red page yet. We'll see if we can find one in the next video. Welcome back. We have found what appears to be Cirrus's room in um, the fortress of the Mechanical Age. And if I were to guess, I'd say that these rooms, or at least most of the things in them, were added well after the events described in the uh, journal. And were never seen by Atrus, because if Atrus had seen some of these uh, things, like this painting with his face on it, and all of this wealth that Cyrus was collecting, I think uh, he might have been a little less trusting of his sons. And he, so far at least, seems to have been completely oblivious that one of his sons was potentially a murderer. We have so far, however, not found the uh, red page, which is of course what we were hoping to find in this room. Is that a gold backplate? Maybe that's some of the gold from the Stone Ship Age. I mean, it was obviously missing there, so maybe uh, Cirrus removed it and used it to uh, make this backplate. I don't know, it's as good an explanation as any. If you look very closely, you can see that this wall is not entirely even. There is a panel in the wall that is slightly depressed. It's kind of hard to notice. And if you do, you'll be walking around this age in despair rather a lot. But if you do notice it, or uh, just click everywhere and notice it that way, you'll find that it hides a secret passage once again. Almost hidden behind the tapestry. And it looks like Cirrus had a bit of a treasure room. Here. Treasure chests. Gold and silver coins, by the looks of it. And I'm trying to see if any of these chests can be opened. Ooh. This looks like uh, gold bullion. As well, some in the chest and a red page. Now, if I were a stranger, I would really take some of the stuff with me. At least, it's not as if Cyrus uh, <laughs> is going to miss it. Then again, you'd have to carry it around with you for the rest of the adventure, and gold is heavy. So, we might come back at the end if we have time. Some wine bottles. Too bad we can't drink any of them. A glass of wine would do me nicely. Hey, that's not a wine bottle, it's a piece of paper. It's a note. Cirrus, your greed sickens me. Your desire for wealth and plunder is never satisfied. I will instruct my subjects not to pay your new tax, and you know they'll listen to me. Regards, Echinar. Hmm. Cyrus was raising taxes? Wow, that is evil. I mean, I don't know what else he might have done. He might have murdered um, Atrus and everything, but raising taxes? That is... Just unbelievable. Also, Akinar had subjects. 
Looks like Sarah's wasn't the only one with delusions of grandeur. You know, the more I learn about these two brothers, the more it seems that neither of them is entirely on the level. But since we don't have anything better to do, we'll just continue bringing them red and blue pages. Until one of them gets free and presumably murders us. Doesn't look like there's anything else in here. So, let's continue our explorations of the fortress. The hallway continues down the other side of the room. And leads to the reverse side of the fortress. There's something in here. But I'm actually going to walk around the hallway first, before we head to the center of the fortress. And on this side, we find what looks to be Aknar's room. Cheery as always. Which you can tell, in case you hadn't noticed, also because Aknar's theme is playing here, and Sirius's theme is playing in uh, Sirius's room. Although the themes do have minor variations for each uh, age, which is another nice touch. This room seems to be a lot darker than uh, Cirrus's. Oh, that explains it. He's got a curtain in front of the window, if you can call it that. He's also got some instruments of torture here. Nice. Some kind of tribal mask. Maybe from another rage? Oh, I like the giant wooden dragonfly. And the swords. This is sort of stylish. At least for... Uh, at least by uh, Akinar's standards. Let's see... Crossbow. Is this a mace? Well, I guess now we know how they fought of the Black Pirates. Wait, pirates in a black ship? Was this place invaded by Jack Sparrow? Anyway, I'm almost afraid to see what's in this box. It's a snake! Fortunately, a fake snake. Not too scary, I think. It looks too obviously fake. Makes me think of Back to the Future 2. Marty is the shark, still look, looks fake. Anyway. What's that? Some kind of hide? It looks, maybe? I don't know. Hard to see. The helmet and another sword. Where did he get these things? Mementos from the... Uh, Black ships, perhaps? If my theory about the brothers going after the pirates is correct... ...then that might be the case, that they killed the pirates and took these things from them. Either that, or they used them in the battle against the Black pir Pirates. There's also an axe here. And another throne, which we can sit in for no particularly good reason. So far, there's no sign of the actual inhabitants of this age, though. Just like with Stone Ship, the place seems to be deserted. So either they left or they died. And why am I inclined to blame Cirrus and Akinar for that? From what we've seen in the journal so far, it looks like Atrus is very much um, do something with an age, help the people there, do some experiments, whatever, and then move on. But from the way it looks, the brothers were inclined to come back after their father had moved on to collect all of this macabre stuff here and all of um, Cirrus's wealth. So maybe whatever they did here 
without Atris knowing about it, ended up either driving off or killing the inhabitants. And the same thing might have happened in Stone Ship. And what do we have here? Some kind of device with two levers. Oh, it's making noises. Fortress Rotation Simulator. Interesting. This looks to be the holographic device that is supposed to teach the survivors how to use the fortress that Atreus described in the journal. It started off showing a, a picture of the um, fortress morphing into this diagram. I guess so. I guess this diagram represents the fortress with the bridge currently in a south position, which um, it is in real life right now. So, let's see if we can figure out how to use this. Actually, to the real stranger from the early 19th century, this kind of technology must have seemed like magic. Let's see. That lever moves the bridge slightly off-center. And that moved it back. Hey, I recognize that sound. It's the sound from the Selenitic Age, from the Maze Runner. The South, uh, the sound for South. And this is South. Other than that, this lever doesn't really seem to do much. Let's try the other one. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't, also doesn't stay at the back. I wonder if we move this one to the back and then use that one. Ah, yes, now we're moving. And that's the sound for east! Neat. Did we just move the bridge to the east? Let's try and, and see. Nope. We're still connected to the uh, South Island. Ah, of course. It's a simulator. How stupid of me. It's not the real thing, which must be around here somewhere else, I guess. Let's uh, play around with the simulator a little bit more. I don't know why it needs to be calibrated. Maybe it's the holographic display that needs to be calibrated. Yeah, and it always starts in south. It doesn't remember where you were. It seems that this lever unlocks the fortress, and this one actually rotates it. Then when you pass a new point, you simply release that lever, stop it rotating, and lock it into position. And then you hear a sound telling you what position you are currently in. And these sounds, so far, match the ones from the uh, Selenitic Age. Let's try north. Indeed. And west. But there's no island on the west side of the uh, fortress, so could you actually stop the bridge there? And that gives us the bird-like sound. Again, the same as the Selenitic Age. And that takes us all the way around, back to south. So yeah, if you do the Mechanical Age first, it is a heck of a lot easier to do the Maze Runner, because you'd already know the sounds, without having to figure them out yourself by exploring the maze. Originally, when I played Mist, I did do the Mechanical Age before the Selenitic Age. I think I did the Selenitic Age last, actually. So I did have that advantage, but for this Let's Play, like I said, I wanted to show you that you can, in fact, find them out quite easily in the maze too, even if you have not seen this device. Now, there is so far no sign of any blue page here, but I have a feeling I know where it is. We'll have to find it in the next video. 
Welcome back! We have been exploring Eknar's room and have found the Fortress Rotation Simulator that apparently teaches you how to operate the fortress. It's meant to teach the survivors that. It's a bit of a complicated method of teaching them that, considering a simple note would have done, but I guess Atrus wanted to uh, try out his holographic technology and stuff. Now, what we are hoping to find in this room, of course, is a blue page, of which there is so far no sign. But, there is a hidden panel here, much like there was in Cirrus's room. And in fact, if you found this panel first, which is a little bit easier to do, then you might be inclined to think that there is another panel in Cirrus's room too, which makes it a bit easier to find that one because that one is harder to spot if you don't know you're looking for a hidden panel. Whereas this one, thanks to this yellow stripe, is quite obvious. It also helps that it's not obscured by a tapestry. Let's see! More stuff! Meat cleaver! Nice, Akinar! More chests? Would I be too hopeful to hope that they are filled with gold, like the ones in uh, Cyrus's room? Yeah. <coughs> yes, I was. Ugh, let's let's close that. I don't want to look at that. I hope that that was one of the black ship pirates and not one of the other inhabitants of the sage. Either way, it's kind of a bad thing to have lying around, but one is definitely worse than the other. And of course, the usual supply of poisons. And other stuff. And there's the blue page. I'm, however, going to uh, stick with the red page for now. We'll come back to pick up the blue page later, as usual. Anything else here? Maybe a note from Cirrus to mirror the note from uh, Aknar in Cirrus's room? There is a cage! And it looks to be electrified. You can't turn it on, though. I'm uncomfortably reminded of Noloben and Escher's experiments on the Barrow. I don't want to know who was in this cage. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if it were the Black Ship Pirates, but then again, I also wouldn't be too surprised if it were the other inhabitants of the age. At the very least, I'm beginning to see why there's nobody here anymore. I'm just gonna hope that they left and didn't die. I mean, the journal did mention there were friendly visitors as well, rather than just black ship pirates to the original city, so hopefully some of them came by and the survivors left with them. Okay, let's not stay here any longer than is strictly necessary. Um. Now let's take a look at the back of the fortress, where there is a passage leading to the center. And some kind of column or pillar here. There's nothing obviously inside it, some kind of metal thing. It's reflective anyway. And you can't walk around it. But there's a button here, so let's see what that does. Oh, for a second there, I was afraid it was another alarm. Oh, another one of these raising staircases. Assuming that the thing we saw at the beginning was actually also one. It leads to... 
room below. The fortress. It looks like this might be that pillar. It seems to sit on top of a gear. There's also some controls here. They don't match the fortress controls from before, though. There's only one lever and some kind of eye doctor symbol, I guess. It's two partial circles. The outer one has a gap at the uh, bottom, and the other one has a gap at the top right. Let's see what this lever does. That gear starts moving. Oh! And the diagram also moved. Now it turned red when the two gaps line up. Since this gear moved and that appears to be connected to the thing we saw in the center of the fortress, let's see if that indeed is uh, related. And it seems that it is, because this looks different now. Let's check it out. Looks like we can now go in here. And I would guess an elevator by the buttons. Can we go down? I don't think so. Considering if we go down, well, that's where the gear is. It didn't look like the elevator could go any further down. And indeed it doesn't. What does the middle button do? It takes us up. Well, that's useful. It stops somewhere in the middle between two floors, I guess. We can't open the door, and in a, even if we could, it looks like there's a wall behind it. Oh, huh, that's a bit more useful. Another level to the fortress at the top. Not much here, a bunch of lights. Doesn't look like we can walk around the place. Unfortunately, these lights seem to be illuminating something at the top, and there's an arrow here pointing up. And indeed, my cursor changes, indicating that I can maybe look up. It's the roof of the fortress, and there's two levers on top of the elevator. Now that matches the controls from the simulator. But that's annoying, we can't reach them. There's no ladder here. We can't walk around this thing. Hmm. I guess there must be something else in this age somewhere. Maybe the middle button has something to do with it. Hey, it doesn't take us down, that's weird. It's blinking now. takes us in between the two floors again, but it did so only after a delay. Hmm. That might allow us to get out of the elevator before it goes down. Let's try that out. It's still uh, beeping. And there it goes. Ah! That's how you can reach the controls. Again, I suppose this is more security measures, just to make uh, it difficult for any potential invader to reach these controls. At the very least, it would slow them down significantly, giving the people here time to react. Fortunately for us, there is nobody here. So now we can reach these controls. There's a button! Which... ah, oh, that raises it back up. Well, I guess it makes sense that there's a way to do that. Let's see if we can use these controls. Now, there's no diagram here, so it might be a bit 
more difficult, but with the information we gained from the simulator, we should be able to do so. So let's unlock. We can see some movement in the gears back there. If we lock it again, we can hear that indeed currently the fortress is south-oriented, as we had previously speculated. So let's try and move it to east. And this is a bit hard to do, because you cannot tell when you are actually past a point. So see, now I did it too short. We ended up back south. So we'll take some fiddling to get this to face east. Ah, there I did it. Only two attempts, that's not too bad. You know, I would have expected this fortress rotating to make some noise. Let's take a look outside if there's anything of interest on the uh, East Island. Perhaps a missed linking book. Or something else. I'm going back through Cyrus's room. Because that one is a bit more friendly than Akinar's. Alright, um, we can s now see both the uh, North, uh, South Island, sorry, where we started. And over there is the North Island that before was hidden. Doesn't look like there's an awful lot there. There's some small structure, but not much. Can't really get a very good look at it from here, but I suppose we'll visit it later. I wonder if these stru uh, the structures on this island are the remains of that lookout post, or if this is purely stuff that Atrus built later. Well, I guess we'll see what's on this island in the next video. Welcome back. We've managed to rotate the fortress to face east, so we can explore this uh, new island. One of the three hills that originally surrounded the city. Which apparently contained the sentry post. Although, like I said, I'm not sure if this is a remainder of that or if this is all stuff that Atris built. Well, I can go up the stairs here. And this looks very much like the um, control panel with the four symbols that's on the South Island. And it gives us two of the symbols! The last two, by the looks of it. It's not a complete code, but if we wanted to brute force it, at least it would significantly reduce the amount of uh, combinations we had to try. Although, if we can find half of the code here, I'm going to bet that the other half is on the North Island. It looks, however, that there is nothing else here except a view of endless sea. So let's head back inside and see if we can get that fortress to point. Um, to... Um, the north, so we can go to that island instead. We get some pretty nice views uh, from here, though. I am kind of partial of actually the, the this view from the end, where you can see the a, a, a more uh, uh, a bigger overview of the age than we have been able to see from any other location so far, except for the flyby at the beginning, of course. Defending this place from the Black Ship Pirates must have been quite a struggle, but Atrus is no stranger to struggles. When Atrus uh, confronted Gen about his mistakes in age 37, the two of them had an argument, and Gen started criticizing Atrus's uh, first age that he had written, uh, which he called uh, Inception, 
not to be confused with the movie, and Gen started to make deletions from Inception's descriptive book, thereby ruining the book. It's really a terrible thing for Gen to do to Atrus. This resulted in Atrus attempting to flee Gen, head back to the surface, back to Anna, but he failed. He was captured by Gen's mute serp uh, servant and butler type person. And then Gen locked Atrus into the basement of Kavir, the mansion where they were staying in Dunny, a location that uh, Mist fans will be very familiar with. And the only means he had left to get out of that room were, um, was a linking book to Gen's fifth age. The age that we know as Riven. Atrus first tried to escape by just tunneling out of the room with a pickaxe that was apparently there, but he caused a cave-in, sealing himself in even worse, and leaving him no option but to use the book to age 5, even though it was clearly a trap. It's quite a different kind of uh, struggle that he had against his father, though, than against the Black Pirates here. Much more personal, in many ways, rather than trying to defend a settlement. Um, alright, let's... Um, wait a second, actually. Now that we are facing another direction, maybe there's something to see through the spyglass. Nothing! Just as much nothing as before. Oh well. At least the idea was good. Maybe there will be something to see when we face north instead. For which, of course, we must head back here and lower the elevator to gain control access to the controls again. Unfortunately, it is a bit fiddly to get the fortress to face north, so let's see um, if I can manage to do that. Sometimes I'm uh, really quickly successful at it, and sometimes it takes me ages. See? Now I overshot. It's back south. Even though I did not hold the uh, lever for very long. Ah, and that's north. Wow, that's lucky. I do not believe that it is possible to actually make the fortress face west. At the very least, I've never actually managed to do that. And in any case, there's no island there. So there's not really any reason why you want to. Except maybe to see if there's something to see through the spyglass in that direction, but to the best of my knowledge, there you can't, and there isn't. So, um, let's see what we can find on the North Island. And while we're at it, um, I keep going the wrong way. I want to go through Sirius's room and see if maybe now there's something we can see through the spyglass. Yep. A skeleton! This is the kind of thing I would have expected from Akinar, not Ceres. I suppose that this is a remainder of um, one of the black ships. Every time I say black ships, all I can think about is Commodore Perry and his black ships uh, that arrived in Japan. But anyway, very different kind of black ships, although also not very friendly. Um, I wonder why... Sirius would have a spyglass pointed directly at that black pirate. Assuming that that is a black pirate, I would guess so. Or why someone would put the uh, black pirate directly in front of the spyglass. I guess it's possible that Akinar placed him there to freak uh, Sirius out. It's kind of a practical joke or something. The two didn't seem to get along very well, so... They'll seem to be the kind of thing 
they do. It's hard to see, but I guess the banner up here is the uh, one carrying the insignia of the black ships. But since there's not really any wind, you can't really tell. Wait a second. I just remembered where we've seen that banner before. Look, here's the insignia of the black ships, as drawn in the journal. And this is the cloth that we saw in Cirrus's room in the stone ship age. The two symbols are identical. Now this seems to suggest one of two things. Either Cirrus was in collusion with the uh, black pirates, or my theory about the brothers going after the black pirates and trying to defeat them was correct. That would mean that indeed all of the um, swords and helmets and other weapons we saw in Akinar's room were stuff that he collected from the Black Pirates, whereas Cirrus, being uh, not interested in that kind of stuff, collected the uh, cloth after they had defeated them. But again, it's just a theory. Maybe Cirrus was in collusion with them. Either way, it's not very uh, good for him. Because either he disobeyed Atrus and went on a needless quest to murder some pirates, or he worked together with some pirates. And unless it really was Black Sparrow, uh, really was the Jack Sparrow of the Black Pearl, I don't think that's a good thing. Anyway, let's see what we can find on the North Island. A few more remnants of gears. Or a gear. And some more views of the East Island. Can't see the South Island from here, of course. And as we expected, we can find the first two symbols of the combination here. Which means... That we can now... Hopefully open that uh, raising staircase on the South Island. Another nice view from here. Can't look to the side from here. Or here. I keep expecting to be able to look in more directions, because Riven is much better in that respect, in allowing you to look many different ways. But this game is not quite so nice. Alright. With all of this age d uh, explored and all four symbols of the combination revealed, I guess we need to turn the fortress back south and try that combination out. Um, oh. Need to push the button. Otherwise, it won't lower. Alright, let's see if I can get it to face back south. And that is much easier than making it face east or north, especially north. So, let's head back down and see if that combination works. back in the original orientation, so there's no reason to look through the spyglass again. 
Let's see. So the first symbol was um, that one. Sort of the uh, partial circle. And the next symbol was that one. And then the three triangles with circle above it. And finally the half circle. Let's hope that is correct. Yes! And as we expected, that is a raising staircase. And hopefully, the mist book is down there. The music would seem to suggest that it is the case. And indeed it is. And this time we don't even have to do anything weird like making it appear out of a desk. So let's head back to Mist Island. And give Cirrus his red page in the next video. Welcome back. We have returned from the Mechanical Age with the fourth red page. One of two remaining red pages that Cirrus uh, wants us to retrieve. Let's see if that will once again make the image clearer. And hope he has something to say that might be of interest to us. Of course, if this were truly two-way communications, I'd ask him about some of the stuff we've seen, as well as um, Eknar's allegation of him murdering Atris. Although, actually, I'm not sure if I tell him about that, because I'm not sure if I would want to tell him that we are retrieving blue pages and talking to Aknar too. If I were doing this for real, I'd probably try to play the brothers out um, against each other a bit, trying to uh, trick them into uh, revealing something they might not want to reveal. But unfortunately, computer games are not quite that interactive, so all we can do um, is listen to what Cirrus has to say. With each page I can see more clearly, soon be free from this hard prison, this book. You must visit the one remaining age you have not confident that I can. Brother Akhenar is demented. He is guilty. He took advantage of the freedom our father had given us. Akhenar began to I ask you again. Do not will destroy both myself and you, just as he destroyed the other creatures of the mist. Never will escape. So you must simply bring the red Tell them the story that I Your wisdom. See that I am innocent and he is guilty. This forgotten island long ago. I will owe you my life. Yeah, I'm still not convinced. While I might agree that Akinar was abusing the freedoms Atris had given them, 
from what we've seen, Akinar wasn't the only one. In any case, I will once again return to the Mechanical Age. To fetch us another blue page to see if Akinar has something to say. Really, the only thing we can do at this point is hope that either we find proof that clearly indicates which one of them is guilty, or that one of them says something to incriminate themselves. If one of them does, I'd be more uh, inc inclined to expect Akinar to, because Cyrus seems too shrewd to fall into such an obvious trap. Whereas Akinar seems a bit more uh, obviously crazy and therefore might be more likely to accidentally say something he wasn't supposed to. Of course, returning to the mechanical age means that we can look at the map. Yes, we kind of noticed that already. <laughs> Nothing about the uh, other page. This time, I guess if we go to some of the more detailed hints, it might. The map here is somewhat less interesting because it does not show the inside of the fortress. And although it shows you uh, where the mist book is and that the uh, two islands contain the code symbols, the map by itself does nothing to help you rotate the fortress or find the blue and red pages. For that you will have to use the uh, other hints, I suppose, or your own brain, which is the solution that I usually prefer to take unless I really get stuck. Alright, let's go and fetch a blue page, which won't be a lot of work this time, because we don't have to go far, and don't have to really do anything except reopen this uh, staircase. Continuing the story of Atreus' early life, after he decided to use the um, H5 book to escape his prison in Kavir, Atreus almost immediately drowned in the New Age, before he was saved by the natives uh, of that age, an age that they called Riven. There he met and fell in love with Catherine, and the two of them formed a plan to defeat Gen, who had been teaching Catherine the art and also planned to marry her. They intended to trap Gan on Riven by destroying all the linking books away from that age, after which the two of them would uh, live on Mist, which Catherine told Atris that she had written. But of course, things are never quite so simple. It's probably not such a good idea that the uh, combination doesn't reset. It means that after you link out of this age, anyone can open this. <laughs> Seems unlike Atrus to have such an oversight in his security. Alright, let's see what Akinar has to tell us after the uh, fourth blue page. <laughs> I see. Convinced the Cirrus is guilty. Pray, do not release him. He will destroy me just to see. The innocent bystander. I've been wrongfully tricked into imprisonment. Didn't you have observed his unbridled lust for riches? Four remaining worlds. <laughs> Some plot. It was almost perfect. I 
final blow to father. <laughs> it took him into believing that it was I <laughs> who was the murderer. I didn't murder father. <laughs> Bring me the remaining. Just please. A liar. All in a liar. I must not be free. What am I? blue pages from the last age of mist. I must be free. You must free me. I cannot bear it here for eternity. Free me. Hmm. For the most part, if you want to know what Ankenar has to say, after you've heard Cirrus, you can just, you know, do a find and replace. Replace um, Cirrus for Akinar, Red for Blue, and Lust for Destruction with Greed. Akinar, however, seems to continue to imply that Atreus was murdered by um, Cirrus, and has now said that Cirrus tricked Atreus into believing that Akinar was the murderer. Presumably before Atreus was murdered. Otherwise, that would have been a bit difficult. And that at least seems to um, match up with Atreus's message in the uh, Imager, in the forechamber here on Mist, where he suspected Aknar. So, is Aknar telling the truth? Did, Sir, uh, did Aethers only suspect Aknar because Cirrus had tricked him into doing so? Well, I don't know about you guys, but somebody who keeps a, a head in a chest in his room, a severed head, is not someone I think is entirely blameless in this matter. Even if he didn't burn the books, even if he didn't murder Atreus, I still don't really think that this is the kind of uh, thing that... Uh, that, uh, that this is the kind of person that we should set free. But since... Uh, Cirrus implies that there's only one age left, only one page left. Would they be set free if we bring them that page? We don't really know, but they might be. In which case, we have to decide which of them to set free, if, it, if any. Well, since we still don't really have any good uh, way of dealing with it, I'd probably have to say go with... Uh, Cirrus first. If anything, he seems the more scrawny of the two, so we might be able to take him. Of course, that means we must return to uh, the bookshelf to read the final journal for the final age. We'll collect, if Cirrus is telling the truth, the final red and or blue page. But, of course, we'll do so in the next video. Welcome back. Since we are done with the Mechanical Age, and both Cirrus and Akinar have told us that there is one red um, or blue page, respectively, uh, left, we have to read the final undamaged journal from the bookshelf. Which is this one. So, I wonder what kind of age this describes. Let's find out. I have called this age Channelwood, and it is a very different world. Though it is exactly how I imagined it, it is still amazing to see it with my own eyes. Water covers this age as far as I can see, except for a small, rocky island. Elsewhere, there are only trees, which grow directly out of the water. A myriad of thin wooden passageways are built just above the water and disappear into the forest. I assume they were built some time ago, for they appear aged. 
I'm eager to discover more about this land and its people, but I have arrived here late and I must rest. I was awakened this morning by strange noises coming from a pathway adjacent to the one on which I had slept. I saw a group of monkey-like people heading in my direction. They had not seen me yet. I did not feel threatened by their presence. Their response to me was one that I would never have expected. After staring at me for a short time, they fell to their knees and began what appeared to be some sort of ceremonial worship. I tried to speak to them, but they did not understand my language. Instead, they indicated through enthusiastic hand motions that I was to follow them. As we walked, I began to notice that the waters below us were changing colors. Slowly, subtly, they would change from deep blue to muddy orange, then from muddy orange to beautifully clear. I was so intrigued by the water, I hardly noticed that we had arrived on a ladder. Climbing the ladder led us to their village, which is about 10 meters above the water and can only be reached by rope ladders that stretch from the lower paths to the village level, approximately halfway up the ground trees. It is very interesting watching these people carry out their daily tasks. Even after watching them for hours, I did not understand exactly what they were doing. At sunset, they motioned for me to follow them. I followed the creatures to the doorway of an enormous hut. Strangely, once inside, I found that the hut appeared even larger than it had from the outside. The walls were garnished with bright metals, and in the center of the hut sat the leader of these people. At least, he appeared to be their leader, for he sat a meter off the floor, in a thick throne. Guards surrounded the strong creature, who was dressed in many exotic, colorful fabrics. Next to the leader sat a very old human, at least to some extent he appears human. His hair, which was only on his face and head, was completely grey, almost white, and hung very long around his frail body. His thin head hung limply by an almost grotesque neck that could not hold its head up to look at me. But what a surprise, this creature could speak my language. Shortly thereafter I was given a bed with some hand motions that looked to be telling me to go to sleep. I look forward to learning more. As I suspected, the ancient creature is a human, but he is old beyond his own reckoning and seems almost insane. However, the tree dwellers almost revere him as a god. They are treating me now in the same fashion, which makes me feel very uncomfortable. It is almost impossible to understand this old man. His voice is feeble, but wild. He has adopted much of the language of the tree dwellers. He himself told me he had not spoken our own tongue in ages. He attempted to explain to me the history of this place. The following is my best translation of what he has told me. Many years ago, the humans and tree dwellers lived together in this place, which was then a vast island. They interacted very little. The humans dwelt on the ground, and the tree dwellers lived high above the humans. Occasionally, the island was disturbed by mysterious rumblings which happened randomly, some sort of tectonic or volcanic action, I sus suspect. The sometimes slight, sometimes heavy tremors would only last a short time. Then they would stop, allowing everything to return to normal. One day, things changed. The rumbling began and grew quickly to unprecedented levels. Soon it became apparent that the entire island was sinking slowly into the ocean around them. Many of the humans died that day, but not before sacrificing themselves in order to stop the sinking of the island. The humans who lived through this catastrophe moved into the trees where they gradually died out, maybe because they were unequipped for such an environment, but I am not sure. This is the story the old man communicated to me, although many details are very unclear in my mind. I am especially confused as to how the humans saved the island from completely sinking. In fact, I doubt the accuracy of that part of the story. The island must have stopped on its own. Yet, the old man believes in the truth of the story as if he had been there. And the tree dwellers worship him, and apparently all humans, as if they were heroes or gods. The old man ended our conversation today with an event which I will never forget. He began gripping my hands tightly, murmuring something about rest and asleep. He then said, We had expected you to come sooner. These actions filled me with a sort of immediate dread. With much effort, he stood to his feet, 
I tried to help, but he pushed me away with more force than I imagined his frail body contained. The tree-dwellers quietly surrounded him with very solemn faces. They then kneeled before him. He walked to each, uh, he walked to each and placed his hand on their heads. All the while, he murmured words which I did not understand. Finally, he turned to me and smiled. Then he closed his eyes and walked out the door, and off off the narrow path high in the trees. The tree dwellers were silent. They began a procession down the nearest rope ladder. As I was descending, I saw several of them pick up the body he had fallen onto the lower level of walkway, and carry it away. He was laying down at the dead end of a short pier-like structure. With the use of some potion, one of the tree creatures lit the pier on fire, and I watched as the flames engulfed him. As this strange funeral proceeded, the waters around the pier changed to dull green. This morning I awoke, finding it hard to even believe the previous evening's events. The water is a dull green for as far as I can see now. For some reason the water no longer shifts color. As I wander throughout the pathways, the creatures watch me, curious to see what I will do next. They are constantly offering me strange objects of affection. I even found food outside the doorway of the room in which I had slept. This is a unique race of beings. I hope to learn their language soon so that I may learn more from them. I have lived on this world for three months off and on, and the tree dwellers have shown great hospitality. I am even beginning to learn bits of their language. I have decided to return home for an extended stay with my loving wife and my sons, and hopefully return with them. However, I am sure Catherine will once again refuse. I think this age would be a wonderfully, wonderful experience for them at all, and I at least look forward to how Cirrus and Akinar will react to its curious inhabitants. Catherine is staying behind, as expected. My sons have returned with me, and they enjoy this age very much. They get along very well with the tree dwellers, and are picking up their language surprisingly fast. I have no doubt that it will be not be too long until they can speak with the tree dwellers much better than myself. I am leaving tomorrow to check on Osmoyan age. Cyrus has suggested that I allow him and his brother to stay. Though the idea unsettles me, I know the boys are growing up rapidly. The hospitality of these creatures is such that I could think of no better place to leave them alone for a short while, so I will consent to their request. I warned the boys not to take advantage of the respect the tree dwellers have for their ideas. They seem to understand my warning, and I have faith they will follow it. Much to my dismay, upon arriving in Everdunes, I learned that Pran and her people are continuing to be menaced by the, the Choctic. I fear for their survival and plan on returning to, their, to her shortly after checking on Cirrus and Akinar here. See Everdoon's journal for more information. After watching Cirrus and Akinar, I see they are handling things very well, and I think I can put to rest any fears about leaving them in Channelwood again. And for a little longer time. The tree dwellers seem slightly distressed that I am leaving, but are happy that Cirrus and Akinar are staying behind again. I have been gone for over three days and have been to many different places. I had to tell Cyrus and Akinar about Pran's death today, and they were visibly shaken, although they could, uh, although they only remembered her from their childhood. Catherine has suggested that it would be wise for Cyrus and Akinar to leave Channelwood for a while, and I have to agree. They will be returning with me when I leave again. I have told my sons that they will be returning with me in two days. They spent the entire night telling one of the telling me of an adventure they experienced in my absence, and it was rather remarkable. It seems they constructed a boat with the creatures and traveled some ways out into the surrounding waters. I enjoy hearing them talk excitedly of their adventures, and I'm reminded of my own adventures as a child. I finally understand why the tree dwellers have been giving me their many inks and insisting I write with them. Looking through some of my past entries, I see now that the inks have changed from the black I thought they were to various different colors. I have shown some of the creatures in my journal, and they laughed and howled. I did not know they had such a sense of humor. Even now, as I look through this very colorful journal, I cannot help but laugh myself. We will be returning tomorrow, so my sons are with the creatures for the last night here. They have told me they would like to come to Channelwood again, and also asked if they can visit some other ages alone. 
Though I will have to think over their request, I believe they have proven to me that they are trustworthy and responsible. Catherine will also have to help me decide whether they are ready for travel alone. For now, I must give my farewells to the creatures, for I do not know how long it will be until I visit this age again. There are some drawings here. This, um, I would say, is probably a map of some portion of uh, the Channelwood Age, I guess. Especially because it referenced a future bridge. So this is uh, probably a map of those walkways in the trees. Might be uh, useful to make a note of that. A diagram of... Well, I don't know what this is. It looks like arms of a windmill or something. And a hut in the trees. Presumably one of the tree dwellers' huts. And that is the final page of this journal. Which uh, is the longest of the four journals, I believe. And we will continue in the next video. Welcome back. We have just finished reading the Channelwood Journal, and it actually uh, contains some interesting information, not just about the Channelwood Age, but also about um, Ceres and Achenar. It seems that Channelwood was the first time that Atrus left Ceres and Achenar alone, in an age, unsupervised. We actually already knew that because it was referenced in one of the uh, other journals, but here we see it confirmed. Um, he also refers to um, his decision to let uh, Sirius and Akinar visit other ages alone, the results of which I believe we've been observing for most of the game. Atreus seemed to believe they would not abuse their power, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, from all we've known, from all we've seen so far, I think he was wrong. And he may have ended up being murdered for it. One interesting thing about that, actually, is that it's sort of suspicious that... Um, Akinar has been accusing Cirrus of murdering Atreus, yet Cirrus has made no such accusations towards uh, Akinar thus far. And also Akinar said that Cirrus uh, had tried to trick Atrus into believing that Akinar was the murderer. But if that is true, then why hasn't he tried to do the same with us? I actually also had a thought about the, the books. Uh, you know I've been wondering about um, how only four of these books remain, even though all the other books around them have been burned. It seems that um, Cirrus and or uh, Akinar, although at this point I'm pretty sure it was both of them, were um, robbing the ages of whatever precious resources they had and exploiting their inhabitants as much as possible. And they may have been doing this uh, somewhat methodically. Uh, it may be that they just destroyed the books when they were done with them. So not all of the books were actually burnt at the same time. There's actually some evidence to suggest, at least, that the books were not burned in the uh, bookcase, because there's no scorching or anything on the shelves themselves suggesting that somebody burnt the books and then put them back on the bookshelves. Which at the very least explains how um, these books managed to survive. Anyway, unlike the other journals, there is no clear feature of mist sketched in the uh, Channelwood journal, but the various references to trees make it no unreasonable assumption that the large tree we saw on the um, south end of the island is in fact the um, place of protection for the Channelwood book. It also helps that it's the only one of the uh, four places that, that is left. So let's turn the tower 
towards uh, that large tree and see if we can perhaps find a clue in the tower once again. I go into the secret passage. And considering that there are no more journals and no more places of protection, and that both Sirius and Akinar said that um, there is only one red and blue page left, this could well be our final trip into the tower. Yep, there's that large tree, all right. It sure is a hell of a lot larger than any of the other trees. I wonder what caused it to become so big. Maybe Atrus did some experiments with uh, some really powerful fertilizer or something. What clues can we find here? Seven, two, four. And that is all. Once again, a sequence of three numbers. And since the sequence of three numbers we saw for the mechanical age turned out not to be the combination to the safe. I'm betting that this sequence is the combination to the safe. And as I said before, the uh, log cabin had a picture of the tree in it. So it is not that surprising that if the tree leads to channel wood, that we will need to use the log cabin and the safe to help access the linking book there. Okay. So, our final place of protection. And there was a there were the butterflies again. I wonder if the book is stored in the log cabin or somewhere near the tree. Well, I guess we'll find out. Let's try the combination. 2-2-1 two, two, didn't work. Well, 7-2-4. It does work. So what's inside? Riches? Money? Jewels? No. A matchbox? Yes, that's definitely something you want to put in a safe. Oh, I guess they're really serious about forest fire preventing here, prevention here. Well, there's a match. And we can strike it! Now it's burning. I guess I'd better hurry before I burn my fingers then. Well, we noticed before that there was a boiler here, but the pilot light was off, so we couldn't turn it on. No, it's a good thing I turned off the gas back then, otherwise now we would have blown his entire island up, probably. Uh, ah, there we go. The pilot light is on now. And the match burned out. I guess we threw it away before we burned our fingers. Ah, boiler's working. No change in pressure as of yet. So let's just keep opening up the gas further until something maybe starts happening, perhaps. There we go. Pressure's rising. But what good does that do? Hmm. I can open it some further. What the hell was that? Well, since this appears to be related to the tree, let's take a look there. If I can actually go there. Which it seems I cannot. Hey! The tree is going up! 
And there's a, an opening in it. Some kind of hidden elevator, it seems. That is weird. Well, I seem to have missed it going uh, up. And again, I don't think there's really much you can do up there. It actually rises quicker um, the faster you, uh, the further you open the gas. Let's hope it comes back down if we close the gas. This really could have used somewhat better UI. There it comes back. Let's see if that elevator takes us somewhere. Of course, we're missing out on the chance to uh, admire the view, I guess. But I guess we'll do that when we come back to uh, the channel with age for a second time. Assuming, of course, that the first page we bring doesn't release uh, one of the brothers who then murders us or something. Which is entirely possible. There's also a button here. But that doesn't really seem to accomplish anything. An underground room! I wonder if this entire... Uh, Uh, structure is artificial, including the tree, or if this was a naturally very tall tree that Atrus just turned into an elevator. There must be a pretty deep shaft below it as well, in order to allow this uh, tree to actually sink that far. And it looks like there's another wheel to control the boiler from here. Can't really hear what's going on, if anything's going on. Nor can we see the pressure gauge, but I assume that at some point this thing will start to rise again. Yep, there it goes. And now we're trapped down here. Well, not really. Of course, we could just lower it back down. Not really any point in doing so. I'm gonna do it anyway. But I don't want to run the risk that we run out of gas or something and won't be able to come back here again. I don't want to see it come back down. It's closed now? Yeah, it comes back down. Predictable! Seems to go up and down a lot fewer steps from here. It doesn't take as long as you'd think it would take if it gotten all the way to the top. Anyway, a whole bunch of uh, wooden columns here. I wonder if these are actually continuations of trees up top or if they're just wooden columns placed here. There's also a linking book, as we were expecting. Which hopefully will lead us to the channel wood edge. Ah, so that's the windmill we saw in the sketch. It looks like there is at least uh, one high level to this edge. Some pathways at the bottom. And some pathways higher up in the trees as well. And I do believe we've looked around. So let's link to this edge.
so we can explore it in the next video. Welcome back. We have arrived in the Channelwood Age. And it seems that it matches the uh, description of uh, from the journal pretty well. There are a lot of trees and some walkways between them. And we saw in the flyby that there is at least another uh, level above us, which I hope we'll be able to access. I guess there should be some rope ladders or something around here, based on the journal. And in the distance there we can see that windmill. The water doesn't exactly look green anymore. It's more bluish. But it doesn't appear to be changing color either. This age did apparently have inhabitants. But, based on our experience in previous ages, I'm not expecting to see anybody here. There is some stuff that I don't recall being uh, described in the journal, like these pipes. There's some kind of thing on the end of that walkway. There's something there, and something attached to a tree over there. Plenty of avenues for exploration, in any case. I wonder what these pipes are for. Transporting some kind of fluid, I'd guess, but... What? I suppose that this is something that Atris built, because it didn't sound like the... Uh, uh, tree dwellers had that level of sophistication. There's something in the pipe here. The pipe splits into two. And there's a switch here, which does not appear to do anything. You can turn right here. And further explore these pathways. It seems that this one dead ends over here. Some kind of device, but it does not work. The device appears to be connected to the pipe, so that seems to have something to do with it. Another one of these switches. Still no result. And it seems that at some point in the past there was more to the structures here. The sounds here make me think more of a swamp than an ocean or something, so... I wonder if there's more land nearby. Again, it's too foggy to really make it out. Let's um, head towards the uh, windmill. Or switch. No effect. Doesn't seem that there's anything actually running through these pipes, so as long as um, that's the case, I don't think these switches do anything. You can see part of the upper structure over there. Kind of curious what that thing is. Looks like somebody built a spiral staircase or something around the tree. There is another one of these things connected to the pipes with some ropes leading off. If only we could look up. And it seems this door is closed. Now, it doesn't really look impossible to just, you know, climb around it and go up anyway. But... I guess we can't do that. I think I missed something here, yes. 
When we got to this switch, I did not go right. You can see more of the upper structure there. So far, no rope ladders, though. I guess the spiral staircase is also a more recent introduction. And this actually looks like an elevator of some sort. It's quite an expansive uh, network of passages up in the trees, it seems. It also seems that this network of, um, of platforms here does not match the map we found in the journal. So maybe that is actually one of the upper levels. Let's see, another one of these things, with another rope connected to it. What's this? Looks like an elevator. I guess Atris got tired of using rope ladders and decided to build some elevators, but they're not working. I guess it's another kind of power generation puzzle, maybe, perhaps? Let's see, what's to the right here? Let's see another elevator over there. We have a single isolated structure above it. It's hard to tell from here, but it seems like there's no pathways leading to that structure. And this pipe... dead ends. Seems like it continues on the other side of this gap, but... There's a disconnect here. So I guess we need to find a spare length of pipe and fix this or something. We also can't get to the other side. Seems that if we follow the pathways there, that one goes off over to the left there. That actually seems to um, connect to the um, other opening we saw here. So we need to find a way to cross one of those two openings. It's kind of hard to see how all this fits together in this version of the game. One of the major advantages you have in Real Mist is that it's much easier to see that uh, the other interrupted passage, the uh, other broken platform, is actually running somewhere over there. And that would allow you to go around here, maybe. So either here or the other one we need to cross somehow. If we want to get to that other elevator. Which I'm betting we will have to at some point. I think that's all as far as the platforms here is concerned. So now let's actually do what I said I would and go towards that windmill. I'm somewhat reminded of the uh, Rebels hideout in Dreamfall. Except, hopefully we're not about to be invaded by Azadi. I can see some of those huts there uh, up in the upper level resemble the drawings we saw in the journal. One thing that's kind of weird actually about the uh, about the inhabitants in this age is that Atra said that the guy, uh, the human old guy, spoke his language. Actually, that's true of the inhabitants of Mechanical and Stone Ship as well, it seems. Even though all other occasions we've seen in, in the books and the other games, um, another age never had inhabitants that spoke Atra's language. The only reason he was able to communicate with the people of H-37 and Riven is because Gen had already taught those people how to speak Dunny. Looks like this pipe also goes up here, following the path towards that windmill. I'm betting that windmill is part of some kind of power generation facility. But the windmill is obviously turning, unlike in uh, Uru. But for some reason there's still no power. I 
keep wanting to look to the side, but you can't. We climb up this rock here, the only uh, solid ground we've seen so far, although I guess the uh, actual surface is not too far down, judging by these trees. Apparently there was an island that sank. Like Aetris, I'm sort of uh, unconvinced by the old man's story that the humans somehow managed to stop it sinking. That it was actually something they did. Oh, well, I guess this is going to lead up to the uh, windmill. Yep, that's the structure from the windmill. Hey, I can hear water running here. Not here. But something is running through the pipes here, but it's not getting any further. Let's take a look. There's some kind of giant tank. Oh, there's water dropping into the tank from the top. I suppose the tank must have an emergency drain hole somewhere. Because if there's no water flowing through the pipes, it would have overflown long ago. But I guess it has a, another drain hole somewhere near the top, preventing it from overflowing. Let's take a look. Seems this is some kind of mechanical pump driven by the windmill. What does this accomplish? From the sound of it, it stops the water flow. But we can't keep it there. Besides, we don't want to stop the water flow. I guess this lever is meant to start the water flow if the windmill wasn't moving or something, I don't know. But it is moving, so we don't need to do that. We go behind here. Nice attention to detail of the shadow of the windmill is actually also moving. And it looks like it is uh, pumping water up from the lake, or sea, or whatever this is. Because we can't go for a swim, which is a shame. It would also make this whole thing a whole lot easier to navigate if we could swim. We could just swim across the gap there. But I guess, like most adventure game characters, the stranger does not want to get his shoes wet. Let's see, though. If there's water being, uh, lo if there's water going into the tank, why is there no water coming out of the tank at the bottom? Aha! A valve! I can't really see that move much. But I guess it may be open now? Yes! I can hear water flowing through these conduits now. Let's see if that enables us to do anything of interest. But we'll do so in the next video. Welcome back. By opening a valve near the windmill, there is now water flowing through these pipes. And obviously, an age that is almost completely submerged really needed flowing water. Then I guess it is pretty clever here to use the uh, wind to bring the water up and then use gravity to provide motion down this hill and further down the pipes. And I guess this uh, motion of the water is uh, going to be transformed into other forms of energy by those devices we've seen all over the place. I am betting this place is filled with mosquitoes, by the way. So I'm glad I'm not here for real. Let's see, uh, maybe we can uh, open that door if we provide power to that thing there. Or water, whatever the case may be. 
Hey! There's no sound of water anymore. There is on this side. That's interesting. And there was one of these switches here. And currently it's switched to the right, which apparently means that the water flows to the left. So I guess it indicates which side of this uh, T-valve is actually closed. So let's close the left side, so water would flow to the right. Let's see. Yes! Now I can hear water flowing on this side. And presumably, not over here. Yeah. Sound really doesn't carry very far, because you'd expect to be able to hear the sound from the pipes over there. I suppose in reality you could, but um, the puzzle would have been very complicated if that was the case. Let's see if that accomplished anything. I can definitely hear the sound of something running. So I suppose this thing is an engine of some kind. Driven by the water pressure. But we are still incapable of actually opening this door. So I guess that's not what the power was for. And then again, I wasn't really expecting it to be. Because why would you need power to open a wooden door? I guess there must be something at the top of this staircase that um, these ropes are connected to that uses the power from this engine. But at this point we can't really see what that is. I don't think you can really see what's at the top of the staircase if you're further away. No. Maybe if you're really far away. Yeah, that really helps. Well, this is the top of the staircase where it looks of things, but we can't really tell what's there. So, so much for that idea. Let's try switching power to the other side and see if we can get power to uh, water to some of the other um, things in his age. Like that elevator over there. Let's try that next. So I guess that means this one is already set correctly. Yes, I can still hear the water when I go over here. Uh, I need to switch this one. Is there any point to the pipe at the place where we started? It goes back into the water. I don't know, there might have been here something here at some point, but it doesn't look to be of any use now. Um, anyway, we switched power this way. And let's switch it to the right. Wait. Switch it to the left here. Ah, too bad. I was hoping we'd be able to see the water come out of the end of the pipe. But it looks like you cannot. I don't re recall if you can in real mist. Wouldn't be surprised if you can. Let's see. We've got power to this now. And I suppose it's feasible that these ropes are attached to some kind of pulley system that hoists this elevator up. Let's try that out. It works! I can't believe it! Wait, it's not actually that remarkable. And now we are at the top level. As far as we know. Nice view! Unfortunately, this is also one of the uh, really difficult to navigate portions of this age and this game in general. Seems like most of the Myst games need at least one place that's really hard to uh, navigate, like Adana in Myst 3 and Haven in Myst 4. Because here we have kind of a similar type of problem. The fact that the layout is confusing, there's not enough um, viewpoints, and every place looks very, very similar. 
We are given a little bit of help, though. Because there was a map in the journal. Which um, looked like this. Now, uh, in order to help you uh, gain a little uh, perspective on where we actually are, I'm going to keep um, this map in the uh, corner to show you where I am at any given point. Because it is kind of difficult to um, show how the layout of this place works otherwise. Of course, uh, the map from the journal doesn't indicate where you start, so you will need to do some exploration to see what matches what you're seeing. But it shouldn't be too difficult to establish that the starting point is actually here. We can see that there is one round hut in front of us, another round hut to the left, and a square hut to the right. I wonder if those may have been used by, uh, like, the leader or the old man, or maybe Sirius and Aknar. I guess they have rooms here somewhere, although they didn't have rooms in the Selenitic Age, so I don't... S I suppose they don't have to have rooms everywhere. Okay. Ah, looking back at this, we can clearly see that this is a V-shape, confirming that that is indeed the, uh... Uh, starting point on the map. You can also see the top of the staircase from here, where it appears there is another elevator. What's the point of that? Why would you have an elevator and a staircase? Maybe the staircase is just for emergencies. Although actually, it looks like maybe the staircase can go even further up. Because the rope above it is very high. Is there another level to this, uh, edge? Who knows? Maybe we'll find out. I guess this is the rope leading from that engine down there, which I suppose is connected somewhere up there. Oops. Um, to the uh, elevator. Alright, let's see. According to the map, going left here will lead us to a dead end. But there might be something important there. There is not. By looks of things. We can't even look at the view. We can just turn around. I guess this is where these... Uh, uh, ...tree dwellers lived. They didn't seem to need very spacious living quarters in that case. Also... I really, really hope none of these bridges have rot through in the meantime or something. From here you can pretty clearly see the uh, rope from this elevator going up. And attached to the elevator it also appears that there is a counterweight to the uh, elevator. Which, I guess, drops when we use it. Which you can't see from the elevator, because you're looking in the opposite direction. This also makes it pretty clear that this rope from this elevator doesn't go very high above it, which, again, makes it seem like the other elevator might go further up. But so far, we can't really see if there is another level, mainly because it's obscured by the canopy, and because, for some reason, we can't look up. Okay, so to the right here is back to the elevator, so let's go left towards that square hut. Well, it's pretty much the same principle, except square instead of... or rectangular, I suppose, instead of round. Broken remnants of furniture, a bench of some kind. Too bad, unlike in Uru, you can't sit on them. And this is sort of the problem, because... It's really hard to tell that now you're actually looking back where you came from, and that this is a new direction, so that's sort of what makes it very easy 
to lose track of where you've been and where you can go in this age. Huh. That actually looks like the isolated structure before, so I guess it's not entirely uh, isolated. It is actually attached to this hut. It has its own elevator. The other elevator we saw that we couldn't reach yet because the platforms to it were all broken. Pretty much the same uh, structure, though, as the uh, first elevator, except now the elevator is down and the counterweight is up. And there is some kind of enclosure around the place this elevator lands. I wonder if we can reach that from up here. Or if you need to take the elevator to get there. That's the structure. Some pottery here. I guess created by the tree dwellers. And as expected, there's no sign of the tree dwellers themselves so far. So, again, this age has been abandoned. Either they left, or they all died. And again, I am suspecting Sirius and Akinar have something to do with that. Okay, so we can go this way towards the center, or... We can continue this way. Along the edge. I kind of want to see if we can get to that enclosed elevator. Doesn't look like it. It's easier to see from here. There's actually no path leading there, so we're going to have to use that elevator from the first level to get up here. Must be something important in there. How much do you want to bet it's the mist book? Well, I guess we'll uh, continue exploring this um, tree village in the next video. Welcome back. We are exploring the upper level of the Chalwood Age. And I'm keeping a map side by side so you can keep track of my progress, because the layout of this place is kind of confusing. We are now heading into this round hut, which um, seems to be attached to a small loop structure. That sort of goes around like this. So let's go left first, then we can um, walk the long way around. See if there's anything important here. So hey, over here is another square hut. Which, when we go straight, connects to another round hut. I wonder what these were used for. They look like balls of some kind, except a bit holy. More pottery. Nice if you're an archaeologist. But kind of useless in uh, solving our present dilemma of the two brothers. So far, no sign of the uh, uh, bedrooms of the two uh, brothers, assuming they had any here. Over there, you can see that enclosed elevator again, which we cannot reach from here. Nothing going this way. More broken furniture. So let's head this way. Let's do another round hut. And another round hut with some pottery hanging around the outside. I guess whenever they left, uh, they didn't feel the need to take any of this stuff with them. Which might mean that they actually died. Mm hmm. I hope not, that's for sure. Oh, how nice it would be if we could have some more intermediate views here. Would make this whole thing a lot easier. Really, the only way to do this is to... Uh, well, have a map 
next to you, either one you've drawn yourself or the one from the journal, or the one from the uh, strategy guide, which is what I'm currently looking at, because obviously this map on screen I added it in later, so I can't see that while I'm playing the game. And just keep close track of where you are. That's the easiest way to get lost. If you just walk around here randomly, it's very easy to miss anything or something. That's our starting point up the first level, the elevator. Or the second level, I guess this is, depending on how you number. As this could be the first floor and the bottom one, the ground floor. Or if you label uh, Japanese style, this is the uh, fir second floor and the bottom one, the first floor. Now, um, you can't see it from here, which is a bit annoying. There is another bunch of... Uh, round huts over there that we haven't visited yet. This is where we started our circle. And the uh, round huts are over there somewhere. I'm gonna go towards the winding stairs first, though. Another one of the square huts. I guess maybe Atris used one of um, these as his sleeping uh, space. I do not believe the brothers used any of them. And this way is where the uh, winding staircase is, along with that elevator that seems to go even further up. Over there we can actually see the elevator where we started. And I'm kind of hoping we can get a sideways view here somewhere. But it doesn't look like we can. Well, this elevator probably won't work. Which is a bit problematic. Because if we go back down and give this elevator power, then the other elevator doesn't have power. So we can't get back up. Unless, of course, we can use this staircase. But it seems it's just as inaccessible from this side as it is from the bottom. That's annoying. Oh, here you can see that there is another level up there. Interesting. If I were a better climber, I'd say screw these elevators and just climb up there. Although then you'd be stuck at the bottom of the... ...of the walkway, I guess, unless you can climb around it. Anyway, it doesn't look like these trees have an awful lot of handholds. So I don't think that's actually a good idea. The uh, nice view of the windmill from here as well. But how can we open that staircase? Well, there's a couple places we haven't visited yet. I wonder, is that actually on the third level? Looks like it is. Okay, well, hopefully there's something useful in these other two round huts. That we haven't visited yet, where we have to go back to... Uh, this square hut with the enclosed elevator next to it. If indeed this was, uh, this is where the mist book is kept, which uh, wouldn't surprise me. This might actually be where Atris stayed most of the time. Although I do not know. So this is um, where we go to go to the two huts in the center of the map that we hadn't visited yet. Doesn't look like there's anything here. But if we continue on towards this one, we get a view of the um, square hut that, and over there that's where the elevator up to the third level is. Aha! And from here we can see that elevator and the winding staircase. And there's a switch. Which opens up the winding staircase! Clever. Now it would have been so, so helpful if there was a direction you could look from there that showed you this switch. But if there is one, I sure as hell can't find it. You can see more of the third level from here. I'm really curious what's up there. What's so important? The notebook uh, didn't really mention any additional levels, just a village. So maybe it's a more recent addition. 
Perhaps the bedrooms of the brothers are up there, since we haven't found those yet. Anyway, now that we have opened up the... Um, staircase... That enables us to... Uh, go downstairs. I see the windmill again. This is a steep staircase. I would really cling to the tree trunk while going down this. I would not want to fall down. At least it's not as dizzying an experience to go down this one as it is in uh, in uh, Real Mist. And at least it's not as complicated to walk down this winding staircase as it would have been in King's Quest, of course. And hopefully we can open this from this side. We can! And that stays open, so now we can go back up. Meaning that we can provide power to this um, engine. If whatever that is, this water-driven thing. Like this. And still be able to get back up. We didn't actually lower the uh, other elevator, so if we go back down now... Go back here we can take a closer look at the counterweight for the elevator. And up there we can see the elevator itself is where we left it. Not surprisingly. I actually didn't think to see if you could wa uh, look up before we went up with the elevator. I suppose you may have been able to. Pretty nice view, actually. But right now I'm too curious about that third level to spend too much time exploring the uh, views of places we've already visited anyway. So let's head back up the winding staircase. And presumably this elevator will now work. That, um, seems to be the case. So, let's, um, see what we can find here. Hmm, looks like there's a path heading back behind the elevator as well. We can't really look down from here to see the counterweight for this elevator. I suppose we may be able to see that from another point of view. See, part of the second level, anyway. Oh, well, let's go this way first, why not? Mm-hmm. This hut looks to be a lot bigger than any we've seen so far. And this is quite an intricately carved doorway, by the standards of this age. I have a suspicion. Indeed, we have found Cyrus's bedroom. Recognizable as always by the theme music. And the chairs fell down. Why? Did they have a brawl here? Or were there more tremors in the time that this age uh, has been abandoned? I do not know. More working lights, so I guess, uh, again, they're li more likely to be uh, fire marbles than electric lights, because they would have burned out long since... Uh, before then, before now. You actually got glass windows, by the looks of it. Really luxurious. By the standards of this age, anyway, as uh, we've gotten, uh, as we've come to expect from Sirius, of course. And he's got wine and cheese, maybe. Guess it may have been cheese in some distant 
past. I'm not gonna try it, that's for sure. Let's see. And an empty drawer. How disappointing. Wash basin. With no obvious source for water. There may have been plumbing here at some point. Not anymore. Or maybe he just used buckets. It's also entirely possible. Well, I guess we'll uh, see if we can find a red page here somewhere in the next video. Welcome back. We have found Cirrus's bedroom in the Charlwood Age. And presumably there is a red page here somewhere, although so far we haven't found it. We have found Cirrus's bed. And, uh... Something that may at some point have been cheese. Oh, you can see the windmill from the window here. Drawers in the bed. I used to have those. Perhaps they contain a red page. Nope, no red page, but half a note, by the looks of it. Vault axis, and of mist. Tit in very plain view on mist. And axis can be. Easily, if the simple, followed. First, locate switches on the island. He switches to the. Go to the dock and. In the marker switch. The off position. Hmm. That looks familiar. It's the second half of the note we found in the Stone Shape Age. So now we can um, take the uh, other part and put them together like so. I uh, had to fiddle a little bit with it to get the text to line up because we don't actually see the two pages in uh, the same perspective. But now that it's complete, we can see what it says. And it says, Marker Switch Vault Access, Island of Mist. The vault is located in very plain view on the Island of Mist, and access can be achieved very easily if these simple instructions are followed. First, locate each of the marker switches on the island. Turn every one of these switches to the on position. Then go to the dock and, as a final step, turn the marker switch there to the off position. So it seems that there is, in fact, another vault besides the uh, one containing the highly val valued treasure of matches on Mist Island. And it seems that the marker switches actually had another function besides just um, marking things on the map in the library. It's kind of cleverly done, this uh, note, because it is written in such a way that although um, each side actually tells you sort of what it's about. You need both sides to know how to open this vault. And now we do know it. I wonder what's in it. I wonder what the brothers were doing with uh, these uh, half pa pieces of a note. One interesting thing to notice is that this piece is in Cirrus's room, and we found the first piece in Aknar's room. On uh, the Stone Ship Bridge. So did they deliberately tear it up and have each brother hide one of the uh, pieces? To make sure that no one else could open that vault. I wonder. Did they hide something in it? Is something else, I wonder. 
And in this drawer there is a knife. Some more empty wine bottles. So besides a drug addict, Sirs may also have been an alcoholic. Then again, I guess we already knew that. There's another desk here. I suppose this is our final chance. Yes, red page. The last rest red page, if Sirs is to be believed. One that may set him free. Not entirely convinced that's a good idea. But then, he does at least have one thing over his brother, and that is that he doesn't keep severed heads in a chest. So if I absolutely have to pick one of them to release, I suppose it would have to be Cirrus. Wins by a very thin margin, although I'd rather not release either of them at this point. Alright, well if Cirrus' room is up here, I suppose so is Akinar's room. Okay, so here we come back to the uh, elevator, where we started. So if we head this way, there's two more rooms by the looks of things. We see the counterweight for this elevator. Yes, there it is. I guess originally it was much higher up, and we don't have any possibility to see that. I don't know if you can look up here from the uh, elevator or something. No, you cannot. Um, let's see. Looks like we can go around the outside of this room, or through the inside. There's a bench in there with spikes on it. Why do I think Akinar had something to do with this? Yep. Of course. Some kind of holographic projection, presumably using the same kind of technology as the Fortress Rotation Simulator in the Mechanical Age. And I have no idea what Sir uh, Fort Akinar said. I suppose it was in the Tree Dweller's language. This looks like some kind of altar or something. Yeah, Atrus, you really made the right call into thinking that. And the brothers would not abuse the respect the natives of this age had shown them. Some masks on the wall, some candles, yeah, it definitely looks like this is some kind of worship room. Presumably to worship Akinar. I guess there's a trigger to the door to activate this message. I wonder what powers this thing. Um. Nice! I guess we just found out how he severed that hat we found in the Mechanical Age. I guess I didn't really want to find that out. It's a good thing we didn't lose a hand trying to do that. This place is giving me the creeps. Let's get out of here. Um, it has a back door. Which actually... Oh, leads back towards the elevator, if we go this way. So I guess if we... What the hell? It closes for one second, and then it does not. That looks really weird. Not sure if that's supposed to be that way, or if it's some kind of glitch. Okay, if we go around the outside, we apparently come to the same location. This is the back entrance to that worship room. I guess Akinar used this entrance, whereas the tree dwellers would go in from the front and see that message, whatever it was. If that is true, 
Hey, look, the windmill again. Then, I suppose this leads to Alcanar's bedroom. I can already hear by the music that that is correct. Well, I've made comments about Akinar's bed in the other ages looking uncomfortable, but this beats all. I guess at some point in the past there may have been more to it. Kind of sparsely decorated, this place. Can't look at anything at this side. Well, at least uh, there's no um, severed heads or lamps made out of skeletons here. Another light bulb, which again, I guess, is actually a fire marble. And there's the blue page, but I'm sticking with the red one for now. What, though, is this contraption? Some kind of viewer, and that was actually the same message that we saw in the uh, altar room. But there's four buttons, this one is lit up. Let's see what the other three do. Hmm. That was not much clearer than the first one. Now the second button is lit up. I wonder, since the first message matched the one in the altar room... Let's see if maybe we've changed the message there. Yep. It seems that the device... Um, actually controls the imager in the altar room. Well, we'll see if um, there's something interesting under these other two buttons in the next video. Welcome back. We are in Akinar's room and have found this interesting device which apparently controls the imager in the altar room, determines which message it displays. We've seen the first two messages, neither of which was um, very uh, understandable, but maybe one of the other two will tell us something important. Not really. How about the last one? I hope I pushed the right button, my dear brother. What a very interesting device you have here. I'm not erasing anything important, am I? <laughs> Remember, he is preparing. Take only one page, my dear brother. Now that was interesting. Seems Cirrus overwrote one of the 
messages to send a message to his brother. And it sounds like they were scheming something. Take only one page of what? A red page? A blue page? A different page altogether? I suppose the latter. I don't think they would take pages from the red and blue books. That don't make any sense. What were they scheming about? Robbing some other age of its riches? Subduing some innocent population? Murdering Atrus? I don't know. Or maybe... Gee, sirs, what are we gonna do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Akinar. Try to take over the world. Not very likely. Anyway, um, one of these messages, as you may know, actually contains a little Easter egg. Because rather than just being gibberish, it is actually Akinar talking backwards. And if you reverse that, it sounds like this. Does he? I don't know. I don't think you should read too much into that. Um, after all, I'm fairly sure Rush Limbo wasn't alive in 1806. It's just an easter egg. Don't think it really means anything in the context of the story. Anyway, we uh, have a red page. We know where the blue page is. We have found evidence that um, perhaps the uh, brothers were actually conspiring together. They took a page from something. They, uh, he's, Sarah said he is preparing. Might have been talking about Atrus. So maybe the two of them actually conspired to murder Atrus together. And the fact that we found half of that note in Akinar's room in Stoneship and the other half in Cyrus's room here also seems to suggest that they were working together, even though they are constantly accusing each other now. What to make of all of that? Well, I guess if we give Cyrus the final page, we might know one way or the other. Although, if he was party to murder, I'm not sure if he want to do that. Still, again, going by the uh, severed head in chest method of uh, choosing, he still has my preference over Cyrus. And since we don't really know what else we might do, I don't suppose we have any choice but to bring him that red page once again. That of course means we must find the mist book. And I have already theorized about where it might be in that separate section next to one of the huts on this level, which could only be reached by that other elevator we saw, which means we have to go downstairs. And find a way to get power to that um, one um, other elevator and find a way to get there too, actually. Uh, let's see... I suppose that's good enough. That'll have to go... No, wait, I think I may, I may have to go right. And then this one has to go left, not to the elevator to the second level, but uh, to that other elevator, also to the second level. Except there is a break in the pipe here, although this does seem to be the way to get power there. 
We just need to fix this. But we previously spotted a um, another water generator here with the handle on it. So what can we do with that if we give that um, power? Okay, so this would have to be switched to the left. As well as this. And this one doesn't have a switch. Okay, let's try that out. It raises a bridge. But it is otherwise unhelpful in getting... Uh, power to the elevator, because the pipe does not continue here. So I guess that now that we've gotten that bridge up, we should head back and switch the water here so it goes to the broken section of pipe again. And hopefully we'll be able to get to the other side and fix that somehow. Well, it does take us to the other side, and we can reach the elevator. And... Let's see. No power right now, of course. There's the... Uh, s uh, separate... Enclosure next to that one cabin we saw. Well, I guess it's uh, no surprise that this elevator doesn't work, because it doesn't have power. And once again, we cannot see water coming out of that pipe. I am disappointed by that. But it does seem that the pipe on this side has a control on it, which uh, may be of some use. And indeed it is. It is some kind of telescoping pipe. So now, the pipes are connected, there's water going this way. And... The elevator works. Presumably. Yep. And there's a light here, which comes on automatically. That's a bit hard to make fit in the hole, it's uh, their fire marbles theory, I'm not sure. It might be a fire, fire marble that was covered up until we opened this door and triggered it to be revealed. We can just barely make out the uh, hut that's behind the planks there. And, as we were hoping, the mist book! So let's see what Cirrus has to say after the fifth, and according to him, final red page. Will he be released, or not? Ah, you finally returned. I owe you a debt of gratitude, for you have nearly released me. My name is Sirius. I trust that from your explorations you have become convinced that my wicked brother, Akhenar, is guilty, and I am innocent. It is I who am wrongly imprisoned here, imprisoned by my father. I don't know who you are, or how you came to this island, but I assume you must at least know something of the books. His father was a master of the books. He wrote hundreds of them, all describing and linking to the fantastic places and ages which he had discovered. The room in which you now stand was our father's library. It was here in this room, on this island named Mist, that he housed most of these books. But such a waste. By now, you have surely 
discovered that Akinar had burnt and mutilated most of these books. Why? Our father was always watchful of our exploration. We grew up under his strict supervision. But when we came of age, he gave us unbridled access to the mystic books. He began to leave our adventures more and more unchecked. Unsupervised as we were, my brother began to become disturbed. He began to take more from the mist ages than he had given. Soon he gained a twisted pleasure from the conquest and destruction of the other ages. It was horrific. His thirst for destruction. But alas, even I discovered his insanity too late. He had completely destroyed all of the missed ages but four. I wasted no time. In warning my father, I thought he would recognize Akhenat's guilt. But in a fit of rage, he imprisoned both my brother and myself within the pages of these books, designed to hold us until he could judge which of us was guilty. To discover the truth, our father embarked on one final journey. However, he has never returned. I can only assume that he perished along the way, leaving me an innocent victim and trapped forever. But now, you are here to release me. Listen carefully. You must find one more page and I will be forever free. There is a book on the shelves. In this library, which is mostly burned, but has a few pages still intact. It is the last book on the middle shelf. Find it. This book is filled with a variety of patterns. Find pattern 158 and recreate it on the door of the fireplace. This will bring you to the last red page. Bring that page to me and I will finally be released and able to reward you, of course. Ignore the blue page. That page finishes my brother's book. It chills me to even think what would happen if you were to release him. There is another warning. Where the red and blue pages reside, also resides a green book. If you touch the green book, you also would be imprisoned forever. Our father gave us this same warning long ago. I suggest you follow us. Go now. Soon the will be face to face. Hmm. Well, we'll continue in the next video. Welcome back. We have just given Cirrus the fifth red page, and contrary to what he told us before, there's actually another one, apparently here on Mist itself, hidden behind the fireplace, where there is also another blue page, and apparently a green book that, according to series, will trap us if we use it, which uh, would not be a good thing. Cirrus is... Um, Explanations uh, shed some light on the events here, although it's mostly things that we had already figured out. And while I am inclined to agree with his description of his brother, I do not believe Sirius is innocent in these uh, affairs. The evidence from Channel would clearly suggest that the two of them were working together. But I guess um, we should go and get the blue page and hear what Cyrus has to say before we think about getting that final red page and maybe setting Cyrus free. At least if there is another blue page behind the fireplace, that means that we won't set um, Akinar free if we give him the blue page from Channelwood, which uh, 
is a good thing, I suppose. When we finally find out what uh, the fireplace and that book of combinations is for. So let's go and get that uh, f uh, blue page from Channel Wood to get double the insanity for the same price. Actually, um, there's something else I want to check out. We found the other half of the note, and it said that there is a vault that can be opened by turning all of the marker switches on, which we've already done, and then turning the one on the dock off. I wonder if that reveals something important that might help us with our decision. Well, it opened the vault. And inside it is... looks to be another page. Is that a... a note or another? No. A white page. We haven't seen any white books. Well, I guess we'll leave this here until we find a white book. Sarah said the book behind the fireplace is, was green, didn't he? Hmm. And closes the vault again. Well, we'll keep that in mind in case we do see a white book. Man, I was kind of hoping there would be something there to help us decide what to do with these brothers, because I don't really want to set either of them free. But a white page for a white book that we don't know isn't really uh, of any use. Wait a second, didn't Cyrus in the message to Akinar he left say, take only one page? That, combined with the fact that the, uh, the two brothers had the two pieces of the note describing how to open the vault, leads me to believe that maybe that one page is the white page we just saw. But what was it for? What were they planning to do with it? And what does it have to do with... Uh, Atrus, who may or may not have murdered. Notice again, by the way, that Cyrus has still not said anything about Atrus being murdered. It's only Aknar who keeps repeating that. Cyrus only said that Atrus presumably perished in his quest to find out which of the brothers was guilty while both of them were imprisoned. Okay, I'm going to want to go back... Uh up the tree, or down the tree, actually, to go back to the Channelwood Edge to get that blue page. And since we have the opportunity, I'd kind of like to go up and take, the, uh, take in the view from this tree. There we go. Note you can still get out from there, but not from any higher. We can look down, which is kind of neat. Better not do this if you're afraid of heights. There's a the clock tower. And it seems we've reached the top. Too bad we can't look around here, we can only look uh, forward. Would have been nice to get a view of the library from this vantage point, but we can't. Also, we seem to be stuck up here. Can't climb down! Maybe this button will help. It lowered us one step. And then we ro rose back up. I guess we need to repeatedly press that. Yes. Oh, we can't go any further down using the button. And our tree will go back up, of course. So, 
the same procedure as before. We need to turn the gas gas off. And then we will be able to go back down with the tree to the Channelwood linking book. There we go. Let's get in. And get down. There we are. Let's go and find us a blue page, shall we? You really can't see that there's a third level from... Yeah, well, you can sort of see, I think, one of the bedrooms in the beginning. On the third level. Bit hard to spot, though. I'm just gonna wait for a loop around, because it doesn't take that long. It's hard to see if this is on the second or the third level. I think that is the third level, actually. But sure of it, I am not. Because this is our second visit to Channelwood, it's time to look at the map. Things would be looking up if you weren't down here, I guess so. This map is actually the least useful of all of them, I think, because it doesn't distinguish between the three levels. It just gives you one big top-down view. Uh, you can sort of make it out, though, but uh, if you don't already have at least some idea of what the levels look like, it's a bit confusing. The sort of white pathways are the uh, bottom level, where it starts at the windmill, of course. It's bigger inside. And then leads to the winding staircase, and through here, this is sort of obscured by... Uh, I think Cyrus' room on the third level. And there's the uh, elevator to the second level. The telescoping pipe. The elevator to the mist book. And that's where the sunken bridge is. And the second level, then, we started here. And you can see that that's the dead end. Then you can go like that. And then over here, not indicated on the map, is the switch necessary to open the uh, winding staircase. And then through here, one can go to the winding staircase. And then the third level is this pathway leading to Cyrus's bedroom. And then this leads to um, the altar and Akinar's bedroom. So yeah, this map is not that useful. The maps uh, that are in the official strategy guide are a lot better because um, there are actually three maps there, one for each level, and I used the one for the uh, second level when I was uh, on the second level during the video. Which is a lot uh, more helpful if you're having trouble navigating this edge. All right, let's go and get a blue page to see what Aknar has to add to what we already know. It's kind of ironic that Atreus was apparently brought down by his sons after he defeated his father all those years ago. Atreus' plan had been to destroy his father's linking book to Dunny, then link off Riven making sure his linking book was destroyed as well as he did so, leaving Gen trapped on Riven with no way out. But just as he made to do so, Gen knocked him out, and when he came to, he was bound in the temple, where his father was about to marry Catherine. Atrus was shocked at this apparent betrayal from his beloved Catherine, and then tricked by Gen into revealing that he had fixed Riven, and that he had altered the descriptive book to undo the instability that threatened to destroy the island. Ken was pleased at that, as it turns out, that had been his intention all along, and it appeared as though Catherine was in on it. Unexpectedly, however, the sky turned dark, the earth shook, and cracks appeared in the ground. 
Atris didn't understand why that would happen. In resulting confusion, he and Gens struggled to gather the two linking books, his own and Gens, only to find that Catherine had taken them and now threatened to destroy them both if Gen did not release Atris. Catherine cast both of the books into the f one of the fiery chasms and fled with Atris. She then revealed to him that this was all going according to the plan that she had made together with Anna. Anna, as you may remember from the bit of the Book of Atris that I read at the start, had followed Atris into Dunny to keep an eye on him, and when she went to confront Gen after Atris' failed escape attempt, found Catherine instead. Anna had encouraged Catherine to make some additional changes to Riven, and it was those changes that were responsible for the current chain of events, as well as the appearance of several large daggers. Atris followed Catherine to another crack in the earth, but unlike the others, this one was not filled with fire, but with stars. Another uh, byproduct of the changes Catherine had made. Catherine gave Atris a linking book back to Mist, which she used herself, leaving Atris alone with Gen. Gen tried desperately to convince Atris to give him another chance and not trap him here on, li on Riven, but Atris simply stepped into the Starfisher, using the book as he fell. And the Mist book? It continued falling into that starry expanse of which he had only a fleeting glimpse. Which brings us full circle back to the beginning of Mist. Atris, of course, married Catherine and went to live on Mist, which, as it turns out, was actually written by Anna, not Catherine. They had two sons, and it seems that those sons had now become their undoing. I'm not entirely sure how the elevator goes back down. I guess maybe it's timed, or there's some kind of trigger linked to the book. I'm not sure. It's a good thing it does, though, because otherwise we'd be stuck on the second way, and uh, the second time through. So let's head back to Mist. Where we will give Agnar his um, fifth blue page in the next video. Welcome back. We have returned from the Channelwood Age for the second time, carrying Akinar's fifth blue page, which hopefully won't set him free just yet. If Sirius was telling the truth about there being another blue page behind the fireplace, but it will hopefully allow us to talk to him just as clearly as we just did with Sirius. I'm glad to see that you've returned to help me escape from my wrongful imprisonment. <laughs> it was Cyrus who did this to me. Cyrus, my wicked brother. Do not listen to him. I warn you. I warn you. He's a liar. Do not be persuaded by his evil lies. I believe him. He killed my father. He will kill you. <laughs> And when my brother Sirius began to lust for riches, he stole from the Aegis Mist. He only riches for himself. My father. My father slept away his watchfulness. My sick brother secretly pronounced himself king. King of the Aegis of Mist, he said. He began to look upon me in disgust. His lowly brother! He did him! And then Cirrus began to destroy the Ages of Mist. He burned their forest. He tore down their structures. He flooded their lands. He murdered their inhabitants. He destroyed all but four of the Ages. Of course, I had a woman father. When I finally found him, there was Cirrus also. Talking cleverly. <laughs> the lying tongue of a serpent. He had convinced father it was I who destroyed the ages. He convinced father that it was I who was greedy for wealth and plunder. And as soon as he dealt the final blow, he tricked father into believing that I was the murderer. But Sirius did not deal as fast a blow as he planned. And his father died a slow death. 
He has doubted my brother's clever lies. It's so enjoying. Father imprisoned us both. I'm sure from which of us the blow had come. <laughs> I swear to you, what I say is true. Release me. <laughs> you must release me. My brother's a deceitful liar and deserves punishment. I only wish vengeance for my dear father. His murder. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> you must only recover one additional page to release me from this prison. It's the easiest to find. Go to the bookshelf. It's in this library. On the far right side of the middle shelf, there's a burned book, which is different from the other burnt books. This book is filled with patterns. Fine pattern 158. Mimic its design on the panel in the fireplace. Doing this will bring you the last blue page. Remember, don't take the red page. Only the blue page. Return quickly to me. And do not touch the green book. It's a clever trap to imprison those who have not been warned. <laughs> do not be tempted, for you will rot and die. Prison desire. <laughs> I tell you, if you follow my instructions, it will be well worth your while. I promise you that. Go. Go. Yeah, right. Much of the same thing as we got from Cirrus. And again, I believe most of the accusations that uh, Akinar makes of Cyrus of stealing the riches and pronouncing himself king, although I'm not entirely sure about the whole murder thing. But I do not believe that Akinar is innocent. Akinar seems to be the more obviously crazy of the two, but as I said, I don't really trust either of them. So which of the two pages should we bring, red or blue? Or neither? It's kind of a hard decision. I don't really want to free either of them, but do we really have a choice? And what to do with that white page that we found in the vault? What, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I guess there's no harm in trying to find out if there is indeed something behind the fireplace. Both Sirs and Akinar told us the same thing. Namely, that's uh, pattern 158 is the one to go to. And um, actually, if you uh, forget that and go back, normally if you go back they will just repeat our last speech but for the last one you actually get a slightly different one You don't yet have the final page You must not have understood my directions Find pattern 158 in the last book on the middle shelf Enter it into the fireplace and bring the red page to me and don't touch the blue page of the green book. Guess uh, Sirius is getting impatient. And a similar thing is true for Akinar as well. <laughs> You're wasting my time! <laughs> and yours! Just go to the last book on the middle shelf. Put Adam 158 into the fireplace. No reason to waste time. <laughs> Just get the blue page. Leave everything else there. Yeah, that tone of voice really convinces me you're of uh, you're worth releasing. I don't think Akinar was quite this neurotic in in Mist Four. Anyway, I guess we'd better do what they say, see if there is a red and blue page there, and then we can decide what to do. The book they're talking about is this one, we've seen it before, with all the patterns in it. Partially burnt, but 
Not entirely, so let's see pattern 158. Good thing we didn't try to do this by brute force, because then it would have taken us quite a long time. There we go, pattern 158. That's the one we have to enter on the fireplace, according to both Sirius and Akinar. So let's remember it. Let's see, into the fireplace. And let's input that pattern. And before you ask, no, the pattern from Uru does not work. And that should be it. Nothing's happening. Maybe we need to push the button again. Ah! 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 The fireplace rotates! And as we have been told, there is a red page, a blue page, although under this light it seems more sort of green yellowish but it is the blue page and a green book that according to both Sirius and Eknar will entrap us but what do we do who do we trust do we take the red page free Sirius hope that he will uh, reward us and not murder us or whatever do we take the blue page and give ourselves to the insanity of Akinar? Or do we ignore the warning of both brothers and take the green page? Of the green book, actually. Use the green book. Hmm. Well, I think this decision is too big for me to make. You're going to have to make it. So choose, red page, blue page, or green book. Welcome back. So, you've chosen the green book. Well, I can definitely see why. After all, we've learned that both of the brothers cannot be trusted. And since both of them told us not to use the green book, perhaps we should, in fact, use it. Of course, there is a risk that it might, in fact, be a trap book, like uh, the ones that is holding the brothers. But even if that is the case, I don't think there's any harm in at least opening the book to see uh, what's in it. Because until we would use its linking panel, we wouldn't be trapped, probably. Hopefully. Well, let's see. It's definitely a better option than picking either the red or the blue page. Neither of which is a particularly smart thing to do at this point, if you've paid even the slightest bit of attention to what's been going on in the game. A green book with... Uh, no writing on the cover, so we do not know what age it leads to, or uh, if it doesn't in fact lead to any at all, and is a trap book, like Sirius and Akinar said it was. Wait, is that Atrus? Who the devil are you? Uh, don't come here to Dunny. Not yet. Um, oh, I have many questions for you, my friend. As you no doubt have for me. Um, where should I begin? Oh... Perhaps my story is in order. Um, my name is Atris. Uh, I fear you've met my son, Cirrus and Akinar, in the red and blue books on Mist Island. Mm, in my library. My library. Oh... It contains my works, my writings. Oh, I wrote many books, many books that linked me to fantastic places. 
It's an art I learned from my father many years ago. Oh, but the red and blue books, those were different. Mm, I wrote those books, too. Ah, in trap, over greedy explorers that might stumble upon my island of mist. But I had no idea my own sons would be entrapped. Ah, my sons. Cirrus and Aganar, we had many journeys together. Ah, I gave them free reign to the books. Perhaps it was not wise. Ah, I could see the greed growing in them. I had not told them about the red and blue books. Their imaginations went wild. They dreamed of riches and power. Uh, of course, they did not know the books were traps. They begged me for access to those books, and I, of course, denied them. Ah. Oh, they devised a plan. An evil plan. I had no idea to what extent their greed had, had progressed. Their own mother. He was their own mother. Oh, my dear Catherine. Ah, to lure me here to Dunny. Of course, I... I could return to Mist, except that they removed a single page from my Mist-linking book. I cannot return without that page. You, my friend, can bring that page to me. Oh, I pray you believe my story above the lies that my sons have told you. If you could find it in yourself to return that page to me here in Dunny, I could go to Mist and bring justice to my sons for what they've done. I must return to my writing. I pray that you believe me. Please hurry. Bring the page. Bring the page with you. Well, well, well. It seems that Akinar's claims to the contrary. Atrus is not dead. He is in fact fine, but trapped on some other age, apparently, which he called Dunny. And now it finally starts to become clear what really happened. And using some of the information from the other games, we can further fill in the blanks. Atrus lived on Mist for 30 years after Gen was trapped on Riven. He wrote many ages, some of which we saw here. Unlike his father, he treated the inhabitants of his ages as equals, friends even, and often tried to help them, as we've seen. He often took his sons on explorations with him, and even created a set of lesson ages to teach them about the art, uh, which we learn about in Mist 3, of course. Although Atreus wanted to return to Dunny and learn more about its fate, and possibly rebuild the Dunny civilization, he never actually went back there. He was afraid that Gen might still be able to escape Riven and find a way back to Dunny. And if Atreus visited Dunny and left a mist book behind, Gen might find it and follow him through. It was a risk he did not want to take. But then, Anna died. We don't know exactly how, but she was apparently killed in an accident on an age written by Catherine. To deal with the grief, Atreus buried himself in, in his work and neglected his sons which they saw as rejection, and their inability to cope with this was a major factor in them straying off the straight and narrow. They declared themselves kings of the ages and mist and ruled, likely even massacred their people and plundered their riches. Eventually the two conspired against their parents. They tricked Catherine into go going to Riven, and then told Atreus that Catherine was waiting for him in Dunny. The true brothers had sabotaged Atreus's linking book by removing a single page from it, which they hid in the marker switch vault, so he could not return the mist. This is why the brothers had the note on how to open the vault, and it's also what Sirius was talking about in his message uh, to Aknar in Channelwood. It seems that message was recorded during the final stages of this plan. 
Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the brothers were too greedy. After tricking their parents, the two of them became interested in the red and blue books on mist, books that Atrus had told them not to use because they linked to dangerous ages. Sears and Akinar believed these ages to contain yet more opportunities for conquest and plunder, and each individually decided to link to one of them, unknowingly trapping themselves. It's not until Mist 4 that we learn what the brothers really hoped to accomplish by trapping Atrus, and if you want to know what that was... Well, I've got a Let's Play of that game too, so feel free to watch it. Of course, now we must go and retrieve that uh, missing uh, page from the Mist book, which we've already seen is in the uh, Marker Switch Vault. Or perhaps we should ignore what Atrus said and just go through the dunny. Would you go through the dunny? Nah, that's not a good idea. After all, we'd be trapped there too. If Atrus has no way out, then neither would we. So, I guess there is nothing for it. We have to go outside and collect that white page. And the brothers, well, they can just go screw themselves. It would be kind of funny if there was a different message uh, now that we know of their treachery. <laughs> but that's not the case if you try and look at them na uh, now. You don't yet have the final page. You just get the uh, message about not having the page yet. No, we don't have the final page, and you're not going to get it either. Because you are a liar. And if we gave you the final page, then we would get trapped in the book. Alright. Open the vault. And take the white page. Now we don't want to do with it. We have to take it to, uh, Atrus. And I'm having some trouble finding the fireplace. It's not as if that's difficult. So, once again, we need to enter the combination. Hmm? What did I just do? I don't know, I was looking at my notes while clicking. That's not right. That is! There we go! Alright, let's bring Atrus, the um, page, to his mist book and resolve this matter once and for all in the next video. Welcome back. We have returned to the green book with the white page. The missing page from Atrus's mist book that the two brothers took from it to trap him in Dunny. Have you found the missing page? Uh, come, come. Indeed I have, my friend. Come on, then. Don't be so impatient, come on. <laughs> Is she going to say anything else? Nope. Well, wherever the hell we are, it definitely needs a good cleaning up. It's a mess. But look, over there is Atrus. 
eagerly awaiting the final page, I suppose. I'm busy writing here in whatever book he's writing in. Come here. Ah, my friend. You've returned. And the page, did you bring the page? Ah, give it to me. Give me the page. I did bring Please the page, the but page. I'm going to have to disappoint you. I forgot the donuts. The page, my friend. The page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep your shirt on. There it is. <sighs> You've done the right thing. I have a difficult choice to make. Apparently, linking books have magical self-repairing binding glue. Would be useful if normal books had that. In any case, it seems Atreus went to deal with his sons. I wonder what he's gonna do. Maybe tear the pages back out of the book, out of the books, and put them back. It is done. Uh, I have many questions for you, my friend. But, uh, my writing cannot wait. I fear that my long delay may have already had a catastrophic impact on the world in which my wife, Catherine, is now being held hostage. Oh, and the reward, I, I'm sorry, but all I have to offer you is the, the library on the island of Mist, the books that are contained there. Feel free to explore at your leisure. I hope you find your explorations satisfying. You will no longer have my sons to deal with. Oh, and uh, one more favor. I am fighting a foe much greater than my sons could even imagine. At some point in the future, I may find it necessary to request your assistance. Until that point, feel free to enjoy the explorations from my library on Mist. Thank you again. Well, Okay, are you done now? <laughs> it seems that we have done good. We have released Atrus from this prison here in Dunny. And he has now taken care of his two sons some way or another. Unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have the time to uh, thank us properly. Take us out for a beer or something. Also, there's a uh, disturbing lack of pubs that are actually still open in Dunny, so... I don't really think that... Uh... <laughs> yes, I'm still here. <laughs> I like the... just uh, looking at us. Wondering why I'm just standing here talking to myself, I guess. Um... Anyway... The reason uh, Atreus is so preoccupied is, like he said, his wife, Catherine, is being held hostage on another age by this uh, foe that he is fighting. Of course, we know that he is talking about Gen, his father. And that book that he is writing in is, in fact, the... Uh, 
Descriptive book for the Age of Riven, Gen's Fifth Age. Because the corrections that Atrus made in it 30 years ago have begun to fail. Well, since uh, Atrus at this point cannot uh, help us any further, let's take a look around this new location. Of course, long-time Mist fans will recognize this place as Kvir, the old mansion in Dunny, where Viovis used to live in the Book of Tiana, and where Gen and Atras lived during their time in the city. This is, in fact, that same room in the basement of Kvir where Gen trapped Atrus all those years ago. And this uh, rubble over here is in fact a result of the cave-in that Atrus caused when he tried to escape. Which, uh, as you can see, failed, leaving him no way out but the H5 descriptive book. This uh, rubble is unfortunately also preventing us from going home, because, well, if we could get out of here, we might be able to get into the passage back to the surface, to the volcano and the cleft in New Mexico, and then just walk home from there. But unfortunately, this rubble will not be cleared until well after Riven, during the events uh, of the Book of Dunny, the third Miss novel, which takes place between Riven and Mist Three. And unfortunately, none of these other uh, doorways are actual ways out of here. And on the floor here is a uh, mosaic. And I'm not sure if I can actually get a good look at that. <laughs> I can look at the door, but I can't go through it. I'm trying to look at the mosaic, but it's not really working. However, it is supposed to be a mosaic of Rinaref, founder of the Dunny culture. It is, however, in fact, an image of one of the um, uh, employees of Cyan who worked on Mist. And that just about takes us to the end. The only thing we can do, as Aetra said, is return to Mist using the now repaired Mist book and perhaps explore some more. But since we've already seen pretty much everything, there's not much point in doing so. However, I do want to see what Atrus ended up doing to... Uh, his sons. And it looks like he, in fact... burnt the books. Or scorch marks. What, did he take a flamethrower with him? I suppose he wanted to prevent anyone else from being able to... Uh, free them. Which was a sensible thing of him to do. Of course, now that we are done with the game... We can look at the map. Because there are no more hints that could spoil the game. Congratulations! You have freed Atrus and are free to explore at your leisure. I guess it's a good thing that the hints tell you that you've won, basically. Because some people might be confused about that. It's one of the uh, few drawbacks of this game is that it's kind of difficult to tell when you've finished, because it doesn't really have a proper ending. Because the ending to it is in Riven, of course. The two really make up a unified whole. So this is more of a middle than an ending. Anyway. There is the map of Mist Island. Of course, it holds no secrets to us anymore. We have explored it all. From the docks with the sunken ship, which I guess was sunken still on this 
um, picture. Judging by the blue tint, I'd say it's underwater. Except for the crow's nests, of course. And the gears. And the planetarium. The library. The rotating tower. The spaceship. The breaker switches. The model of the sunken ship with the eight pillars around it and those contraptions with the symbols of the constellations. The generator for the spaceship. The clock tower with its hidden bridge. And the log cabin and the giant tree elevator. For us fans of you of Uru, it is actually kind of nice that you can see on this map rather easily that Relto was supposed to resemble Mist. Of course, Mist is a lot bigger than Relto was, but you can see uh, pretty clearly from this map that it has the same basic layout and even has the library in the right place, as Yisha said. Although the library itself is kind of a different shape. But that doesn't really matter. It's still nice. I don't remember this path. Could you actually walk down that? I mean, you could walk down this path to the clock tower, but... I don't know. But that is the map of Mist. In case you didn't know. And now, we're done. Now normally at this point, I would uh, have my little mini review and let the credits roll. And then, that would be the end of it. But, it isn't. There's actually one other thing that I want to do. So this Let's Play, contrary to what you might have been expecting, isn't over yet. As Atrus might say, the ending has not yet been written. Except it has been written. But, anyway, it's still, it's not actually the end of the Let's Play. If you've seen Secret Message a couple of days ago, then you might already know what uh, I'm referring to. But if you have, I'm gonna ask you not to write any comments about that, uh, to keep it a secret for those who haven't. And if you haven't, don't bother going looking for it. Um, it's gone now. So, you'll just have to wait until tomorrow to find out what I'm talking about. I am, however, going to let the credits run, because we are finished with Mist itself. And you'll find out what all this mysterious uh, crap I'm talking about is in the next video. Welcome back to Let's Play Mist. But wait a second, I can hear you say. This isn't Mist. It's real Mist. To which I can only say, Well spotted, Sherlock. I'm not gonna do a full Let's Play of real Mist, but real Mist contains one more age that is not present in the uh, original game. The Age of Rhyme. And look, there is the journal for that age. The Age of Rhyme helps bridge the gap between Mist and Riven, so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at it. Before we do so, however, I'd like to provide a little bit of background about Real Mist. After Riven was finished, Cyan began to concentrate on a new project codenamed DIRT, which stands for Dunny in Real Time. 
It was meant to be a game using real-time 3D, which would start off at the cleft, and have the player descend into the volcano and down the great shaft, and then further into the tunnels leading uh, to Dunny. And along the way, the player would encounter many of the obstacles that Tiana and Atrus also faced along this route, and uh, would read journals by the two of them. The player would also have access to various ages from the rest areas, including Noloben, although this version was very different in concept from the one we ended up seeing in Myst 5, and Taladon. Finally, the game would end with the player arriving in the Great City. Dirt would use a real-time 3D engine called Plasma, developed by Headspin Technology, a company that Cyan acquired. However, Cyan's interest shifted towards an online multiplayer game, and the Dirt project was never completed, although much of its content was later used in Uru and Myst 5. This new multiplayer game, which was codenamed Mudpai and would eventually become Uru, required significant rewrites to the Plasma game engine, because the original didn't have the networking support they needed. While work was in progress on Plasma 2, they used the original version of Plasma to create Real Mist. Real Mist, although completely unlike Dirt in story and content, borrows a lot of its internals from Dirt. Okay. Of course, Real Mist affords us an opportunity to get a better look at some things on the Island of Mist. For one thing, as you can see, there is a day-night cycle. It is currently night. Night lasts about five minutes on Mist. And of course you are able to walk around much more freely and you could in the uh, old game. Making it far easier to see where certain things are and the layout of some things. For instance, much easier to get a view of the tower, and I do believe you can actually see which way it is facing in uh, this version. Sort of tempting to think that you could walk up there. But you are eventually stopped. Although, of course, we couldn't walk behind the uh, planetarium at all. In the original mist. One other thing that you can see in uh, real mist, which is also present in the dilapidated version of mist seen in mist 5 is Tiana's grave. Yes, as I already said, Anna, Atrus' grandmother, who in Dunny was known by the name of Tiana, met an unfortunate end in one of Catherine's ages, and was buried here, on Mist, the age that she herself had written. And we can see her grave is covered with blue flowers. Presumably that grave is there, also in the uh, original version of Mist, as well as the Masterpiece Edition, we just can't actually go there. Butterflies are still hanging out, except instead of a video, they're now actually 3D. Water seems to be a lot less calm as well. Although, fortunately, the waves are not high enough to prevent us from crossing bridges like that. Is it me, or does this tree seem to be a lot less tall than it was in the original? It might be. And over here is, of course, the uh, spaceship. Which I actually can't go into because I kind of cheated. Eh, it won't open. You see, I did not actually play through the entire game in order to show you this bit. 
Because since unlike in Riven, the combinations used in Mist are not random. So if you know how to open the vault, and uh, that of course requires being able to get to the uh, final marker switch over there, so you also need to know the uh, 240 combination for the clock tower. And if you know the combination to use in the fireplace, then there is no reason to play the rest of the game, because you can immediately go to Dunny, uh, give Atris the page, and um, then you're done, essentially. Alright, let's take a look at the thing that we actually came here for. The Age of Rhyme. Well, as you can see, Atreus uh, took care of his sons in the same manner here, as he did in uh, the Masterpiece Edition, and the original version. But apparently during his trip to uh, Mist, he deposited here another notebook, which I will now, of course, read. It's not very long, though. Let's take a look. Rhyme, I have named it. A desolate age with a beauty that is quite different than I had expected or imagined. The intricate feathers of ice that fall from the sky are awe-inspiring. I feel as though I could sit and watch them for hours. And though it is cold here like I have never experienced before, I find myself enjoying the change of temperature, for it is unlike any other place that I have ever seen. Perhaps the oddest thing is the silence. Although the wind blows on occasion, when it ceases, there is a suffocating silence that falls on this place, broken only by the distant cries of unseen creatures. I have visited three times, and am sure now that this age will provide the environment I need. I believe the cold temperature is necessary for obtaining the correct resonance. Examining the structure of the books is ever more perplexing, but I am driven onward by my need to understand. The great tree of possibilities can never be fully grasped, but I must at least try to find one particular branch. On the subject of enlightenment, I would also like to find the cause of the mysterious lights that shine in the darkness here. Though I never assumed that it I would be able to build especially fast here, the speed at which I am progressing is somewhat disappointing. I do think I will bring Cirrus and Akinar, as well as some of the machinery from Selenitic. Akinar chose to stay with Catherine, but Cyrus was rather excited to come. He has spent the last few days here with me, helping with me with the beginning phases of construction. He too seems to enjoy the ice and cold weather. He is intrigued with the crystals that we have brought with us. He has been a big help, as have others, and I hope to be able to begin my experiments here soon. Tonight, Cyrus and I found a wondrous spot to view the lights, although it seems they decided to hide from us. After sitting in the cold winds for over two hours, we saw nothing. It was rather disappointing. Cyrus will return to Mist tomorrow. He has been a tremendous aid to me, and I am thankful for his willingness to help. The hard part of the construction is over, although I have decided after tonight that I would like to add some kind of observation post. I won't be finished as soon as I had hoped, although I am fairly certain it will be worth the delay in the long run. I have decided to take a break from the construction now that the tunnel is almost complete, and I have been able to set up a temporary space where the crystals will not be stimulated. I am quite convinced that with the right diffractive resonance, certain properties of the ink can be simulated. Catherine still finds it absurd and thinks I am crazy to assume I will be able to view ages with stones, but her unusual pessimism has not convinced me to stop trying. I came too close to success on Everdunes. I am fairly certain now that temperature indeed does have an effect on the crystals, but I have realized that temperature alone is not enough. The cold dampens some of the sympathetic harmonics, but a more active suppressor is necessary. I have acquired some geodes with a pure protected crystalline interior. Thin slices of the geodes below each crystal provided a stabilizing effect and even amplified the clean frequency slightly. After quite a bit of experimentation with the shapes and colors, I was able to capture a blurry image within a book. Though the link would never work, there was clearly an age on the other side. I can hardly wait to return and tell Catherine. I feel like I should finish the shaft to my observation post while I have the machinery here, perhaps tomorrow morning. The lights were beautiful again last night. They had not shown themselves for so long that I had almost forgotten their beauty. I still must find the cause. 
I am feeling rather overwhelmed with what remains to be done. The crystals have not been perfected, the shaft is not finished, nor is the observation post, or even the lab. I have not seen Catherine for some time, and I long to spend more time with Akinar and Cirrus. Besides all of that, there are, far away in the back of my mind, the thoughts of my people, and our lost city. And we see here a picture that Adrian apparently drew of what we fans of Uru will of course recognize as the Arch of Karaf. And in fact it looks a lot like it does in uh, Uru, if not uh, identical, I think it is actually ident identical. And not at all like the sketch that is seen in the Book of Atreus. It seems that much of the um, design of the city that was used in Uru was already done for the Dunian real-time project. I dreamt again of them last night. I have seen the city in its worst condition, and still, its beauty overwhelmed me. Even now, as I visualize how majestic it must have been before the destruction caused by Viovis and Agaris, it amazes and saddens me. I suspect that this is probably a Gura. Viovis and Agaris, of course, are references to names from the book of Tiana. I'm fairly certain that Dunny is not dead, as my father believed. I'm convinced that there must be some who managed to escape the destruction, and even now continue to survive in separate ages. Within me is an urging to take the chance and return to Dunny to find these survivors, and properly rebuild our city. However, I can do nothing until I am certain of the fate of my father. If my plan failed, if I missed a single book when attempting to trap him on Riven, then he has been free all along. If that is true, then all that stands between him and the ages I have now written is the link from Dunny to Mist. As much as I wish to return to Dunny, without knowing the state of my father, I cannot risk re-establishing that link. I must observe my father without re-establishing that link. It has taken several years, and there have been many dead ends, but I have partially succeeded. Now that I have managed to view another age using the crystals, it is only a matter of time until I have you arriven. At least I hope. Catherine will have her ideas about all of these things, and I miss her greatly. I will return to Rhyme later, when my mind is cleared. And there are some drawings here. This actually appears to be the control panel for the viewer. Set to 40, the combination of the uh, dimensional imager. But we didn't notice it collapse when... Uh, let's turn to that setting. And this appears to be a top-down view of that very same imager, indicating something on the back of it. Again, a drawing of the imager. And a number, 2330, 2735. If I were to guess, I suppose this has something to do with how to get to Rhyme. But we'll have to figure that out in the next video. Welcome back. We have just read the uh, journal for Rhyme, and it is actually quite interesting. It is very clear that this journal was written long uh, after the other the other journals in this game, because of the references it has to uh, the Book of Tiana and even the Book of Dunny in his. Uh, uh, description of his desire to rebuild Dunny and find survivors, which of course happens in the Book of Dunny. And um, there are a couple of other things that just make it clear that much more of the backstory had been established when this journal was written. And look, it's now day outside. Also interesting, actually, is the fact that this journal confirms that Atrus had help building some of the stuff we've seen him build. Of course, uh, we already knew that um, he used help from his sons, but this actually specifically stated that he had help from others, presumably inhabitants from other ages, in building some of the things on Rhyme, and I would assume that is also true for... Um, Uh, for the um, other ages, like Salonisic. 
And the question, of course, is how do we get to Rhyme? Unlike the other ages, it is unlikely that the tower rotation will be of any help here. Because, well, it still only stops at uh, four locations, corresponding to the uh, places of protection of the other four books. But there were a couple of things we saw in the last page of the journal that might uh, be of interest. And they had something to do with the dimensional imager in the forechamber by the docks. So let's uh, see if we can't get any wiser if we go there. Well, it's certainly been a long time since we've been here. Not since we saw... ...the message that... Uh, ...Atris left for Catherine. Alright, now according to the uh, notes, we should set this to the dimensional imager. After the uh, topographical extrusion test. And then there is supposed to be something on the back of the imager. Let's take a look. I guess that this topographical extrusion test is actually supposed to be rhyme. It's definitely not missed, as I originally said, which is something that uh, is implied in the strategy guide, but is definitely not true. I'm not sure of the, uh, if what we see in the uh, original mist in the imager is actually also rhyme. It does seem to look slightly different here, but I'm not sure. Alright, well, in the original mist we couldn't walk behind the imager, but here we can. And there's another button on this side. Hmm. Aha! Uh -huh. The panel has collapsed, like the notebook depicted. Of course, it is extremely possible that you disco uh, discovered this by accident. And if you've played uh, the original Mist, you wouldn't really know what that was for, because, well, obviously it wasn't there. But you still would not be able to access Rhyme until you'd finished the other ages. Because of that four number combination from the journal, which you also need. We see that behind the uh, controls, this diagram of the path leading to the spaceship has been revealed. It has a button on it. Which apparently rotated something. Interesting. Oh, and it goes back up. So let's go there and see if we accomplished anything. I'm gonna go walk behind here. Just because I can. Let's see. Well. This is where we push the button. And I don't see anything. Maybe we need a different perspective. Aha! A passage! Wait a second, this archway wasn't there in the uh, mist. Well, we can only assume that it was meant to be there anyway. It just didn't show it. Let's see where this leads. to an octagonal room. Could we be below the library? And some kind of device with a four-number combination code. Well, let's try the combination from the uh, 
journal then. 27... 35, if memory serves. It rises up! Out of sight. So what did that accomplish? Well, if we are underneath the library, it might pay to take a look at that. Aha! A pedestal has risen from the floor! In just about the same spot where Escher will one day put his contraption to hold the uh, borrow template. And in it is another book with much the same motif on the cover as the journal. The rhyme linking book, I presume? Indeed. Oh, we get a nice flyby, of course, as always. I'm not clicking on it because I don't think we get a full screen flyby. If I do, unlike in. Uh, unlike for the other ages in Mist. Definitely seems to match what we saw in the, uh, in the dimensional imager here, and I can see that observation post that Atrus sketched in his journal, as well as these um, towers that were definitely not mentioned in the journal. Well, let's see. You can see that this is a uh, predecessor of the game engine for, for Uru by that progress bar. Well, there we are, in rhyme, and I sure hope I got my coat. If all I'm wearing is my Riven t-shirt, then uh, it'd be really cold here. This reminds me of the... Uh, ice Pod H. The Ice Pod in the Pod H. Which one is that? Is that Derano? I think so. Might be Derano. It is kind of an eerie place. And I can hear some kind of animal. Well, those are the towers. And there's the observation post. And some kind of hut. And a machine bellowing smoke. Well, I guess this place could do with a little bit of, glo uh, of global warning. Ah, I wish I was there. It's quite hot in my room right now, actually. I would like to be in a snowy place instead. Let's see... Well, I guess that inside is where all the action is gonna be. But let's take a look outside. There's another one of these observation platforms. Anything important that we can see there, perhaps? Oh my! I think we found what makes that noise. There's some kind of... fish, I guess. Maybe they're mammals, like whales. They sort of look like whales. It's not Shroomy, but it is Shroomy's Antarctic cousin. You can hear them calling as well. Well, they don't look to be uh, any danger. I wonder what these towers were about. Atreus didn't mention them at all. Good thing he put lights on them, so passing planes won't crash into them. Yeah, that's likely to happen.
Also, no sign of these lights in the sky that uh, Atris mentioned. Let's see. Looks like this thing is pumping something up. Water? I don't know. Might be. Can we take a closer look? No. We cannot. Not even an insurmountable waist high fence. It's an insurmountable nothing. It's an invisible wall preventing me from getting any closer to that thing. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting really, really cold. So, let's head inside and get away from these cold winds. But we'll have to find out what's in here in the next video. Welcome back. We have arrived on the Age of Rhyme. Lo, I must say, I much prefer the Age of Reason. And we have ran inside to shelter from the biting cold outside. Let's close that door. Ah, that's better. Much more comfortable now. Let's see what's here. A stove, by the looks of things. That would be nice. But it's not working. I can see a spark. But I guess Atrus didn't pay the gas bill. What do we have here? A mist book! I guess finding the mist book will not be a puzzle in this game, in this age. Since we've already found it. There's another door here. But, by the looks and sounds of it, it has frozen shut. That's not very helpful. Hmm. This looks like a drawing of, I guess, the crystals and those geodes that Atrus mentioned in the journal with some dunny writing under them. Which is a bit weird, because Atrus usually writes in English. Anything on the ceiling? Nope. Let's see uh, if we can get some heat in here, which would actually be quite nice. Looks like there's a pipe, and come to think of it, I actually saw a pipe on the outside as well. Let's take a look. Here's animals again. This would be quite a creepy place, I think. Spend a lot of time alone here. Ah. That's the same pipe, I guess. Goes under the ice. And I wouldn't be surprised if it actually comes back up here, connected to this thing. So maybe what this thing does is actually pump up gas or something. Maybe there's natural gas below this ice somewhere. And that's what this thing is pumping up and processing somehow. There's a valve here. And apparently it was closed, because now I can hear gas running through it. So hopefully, now we can turn on the heat. Let's close the door again. Man, I can't even see the door from this angle. There we go. And... Whoosh! That's better. I'll warm my hands. Ah. Wait, do you hear something? Here's some creaking wood. Sounds like this door might be melting. Also, it looks like it. Wow. That is some instant melting action. I think that actually doesn't work if you don't close the door. But since we did close the door, it did work. So now we can see what's behind here. That tunnel mentioned in the journal. By looks things. Some fog here. I guess that the heat from the other room is uh, defrosting the uh, permafrost in the ground here. But 
causing that fog. That's just a guess, though. Well, end of the line. But it looks like we found yet another elevator. Can we go down? Nope. I suppose this goes up to that observation point. Let's take a look. This is just a lot of moving wall. Top floor. A nice view here of those towers. And supposedly of those lights. Except they aren't visible right now. Well, let's see what this does. Yikes! I think we found the lights. Looks like Aethers got tired of waiting for... the lights. And decided to recreate them himself. From what I can see, it looks like some kind of aurora effect. Let's see, what does this do? It's not a button. Went from green to red. It changed the color of the lights. Suppose that the high voltage somehow ionizes the atmosphere, causing this effect. Much like uh, the Aurora Borealis. Where that same effect is caused by... ionization caused by solar radiation at northern latitudes, so I guess that's also what causes that effect in this age. But, um, since that Atrish can replicate it with um, some kind of high voltage electricity spikes. Must have been a lot of work to build those towers out in those icy cold waters. Also, I hope we didn't just fry those fish we saw. Does this have any more settings? Purple. Indeed, now the lights are purple. I wonder what's generating this power. I guess maybe also this thing. Maybe using the gas to generate electricity as well. Must be some kind of capacitor involved, because you'd need a lot of voltage to get that kind of uh, spike. Well... Is that all there is to this age? What about those crystals and geodes and uh, machine ages? Wait! There's a button. Another elevator that rotates. Why am I not surprised? Looks like Atris made himself a study. Not sure what this is. Some kind of device. And another book. Is it a linking book? It's a picture of one of the crystals on the front. Nope, it is another journal. Well, let's see what it says. Before spending any more time with my experiments, I've decided that I must finish construction. I've brought both Cirrus and Akinar this time. The shaft is almost finished, as is the observation post. Both boys prefer it inside, where it is warm, protected from the cold. Akinar sits in the observation post for hours, while Cirrus is consumed with the crystals and the glimpses of ages that we were able to see. Neither of them shows any real desire to leave. I cannot remember the last time my son spent so much time with me in an age. After more experimenting with the shapes of the crystals, we were able to get a nearly perfect view of an age inside of the book. Hmm. Looks like a... Crystal viewer combination, like the ones from Mist 4. But unfortunately, the fifth crystal is not visible. There's a coffee stain, I guess. It just put his cup on this book, or something. Cyrus wanted the link immediately, not understanding the link was only visual. 
Without the ink, the crystals do not bind to onto a particular age. Because of this, the crystals have an interesting side effect. It is possible to change the crystals and watch the age change. While in reality we are seeing a vast number of distinct, though similar, ages, displaying the current age defined by the crystals. It appears as though we are changing the original age. Next are the lights. My sons seem much more interested in the lights of the night sky right now. Their only interest in the crystals seems to be whether or not we can view channel wood or stone ship, two ages I have not seen in a long while. It is possible to view the ages, although the time it would take to find the correct combination would be prohibitive. I do not consider my task with the crystals complete, but I would rather keep Sirius and Akinar excited in here, so we will mo move on to the lights. I think it is better to keep Riven from them, and so it is just as well that we move on to something else. I will view that place later. The lights are curious. Although I originally thought the effect to be an organic one, I now believe it to be electromagnetic in origin. I think the effect could be triggered somehow. It's something that we have to try, and if Sirius and Akinar have their way, it will be soon. I have never seen either of them so interested in my experiments, and I do not want to dampen their enthusiasm. It seems they have forgotten about the crystals now. I'm not sure either of my sons was expecting the amount of work it would take. It has turned out to be a challenge working above the cold waters where the wind cuts through clothing and skin like a sharp knife. Still, even amidst the dark cold, they are driven to complete the task. It is a side of them that I have not seen before. Another hard day, but we have erected the first of three towers. I am too tired to write tonight. It has been a week. The second and third towers are up. We only need to connect the power. I am exhausted, as are Sirius and Akinar. However, they have no intention of quitting, and that drives me. The towers are finished, as is the power to each of them. Power will be conducted directly through the saline sea, alleviating the need for stringing wires and enabling us to locate the towers a comfortable distance away. Most of the remaining walk can be accomplished inside, for which I am grateful. I am tired of the cold. I look forward to the warm beaches of Mist Island. Perhaps we all deserve a break. We only spent a day with Catherine before returning. We were here only a minute before we again began to experiment with the towers and the electromagnetic discharges. We were able to create an arc for the first time between two towers. Its reflection in the cold waters was magnificent. We are close now. Tomorrow, after adjusting the voltage, we will know just how close. The beauty is awe-inspiring. At our command, multicolored waves of light dance across the dark sky. Brilliant flashes of white lightning that make the display even more amazing precede them. The boys are convinced they will be able to bring their mother here, and though she usually refuses to use the books, I am becoming convinced that she will come, or at least I hope. Hmm, another drawing of the Arch of Carafe. Can't quite get Dunny out of your mind, can you, uh, Atris? As for me, I must return to Mist, or some other warm place. There's more to accomplish here, but I long for the sun, and I will spend some time under its glow before returning. Catherine had to come after I told her of my intentions to use the crystals to view Riven. She is now consumed with the setup of the geodes and the crystals, and encourages me daily as I try to uncover the combination that will allow me a view of that age. Sirius and Akinar did not come this time. I must return to Everdunes. I believe that a few of the crystals I left in Everdunes may help me here. Catherine has returned home for now, but she will meet me on Mist Island in three days. I think I will be ready by then. Okay, just some more background about this H. It seems that uh, Aetris and Sirius uh, and Akinar built these towers to replicate the lights, as we've seen. It's kind of nice to uh, read about the three of them working together in happier days before all of the destruction happened and the brothers got trapped we cannot open the drawer I am disappointed by that however there's still no sign of the crystal viewer I guess we'll have to find it in the next video welcome back we have just read the second rhyme journal found here on this uh, desk. 
And it told us about the construction of the towers, as well as some more things about the Crystal Viewer, but we still haven't found the uh, Crystal Viewer itself. Where could it be? Where else could we go? There's not any more levels. Can't go further up, can't go further down. But wait a second. We rotated the elevator after we got up here. Can we go down with the elevator in this orientation? Let's try that out. It worked! And we have found that there is more to this passage. I guess originally this passage and the one coming from the entrance were just connected until Aetris built this elevator and apparently decided he'd throw up another roadblock for possible intruders. Although I have no idea who there could possibly be to um, intrude in this particular uh, age. After all, it didn't look particularly inhabited, or even habitable for that matter. I guess maybe he was afraid somebody would find his books or something, like we have. Of course, it was nice of Atreus to tell us about how to get in here when he dropped that book in... Uh, in mist, but then I guess I, he was preoccupied. Anyway. Oh, elevator doors close automatically. What is here? Could it be? The crystal viewer? Looks like it. Even though it does not look anything like uh, its counterpart in uh, Mist 4, then I guess that was a much more upgraded version with support for sound and uh, as well as a refrigeration unit, of course, that made it work in Tamana rather than just here in Rhyme. I guess we kind of sort of already see, uh, already saw Rhyme in Mist 4, just a glimpse of it when talking to Atrus, via that crystal viewer. Hey, that cot looks awfully familiar. It's exactly the same as the cot we've previously seen in uh, Uru, or seen in the future in Uru. Particularly the one in the rest area, the Great Shaft. In either Toman. And there is a map of sorts here. I think this same map may also have been used in Uru. I can't get closer to it than this. So I can't look at it better. As well as a, a knapsack or rucksack or something. But we can't find out what's in it. Supplies! Food, maybe. There is also another desk here. With uh, a similar machine, or whatever this is, on it as upstairs. And I think this maybe is a kettle. I would uh, not mind a nice cup of tea in this kind of weather. In fact, in this kind of cold, a cup of does you good. And there's a note. It is real. The work of your hands, the touch of my dreams. I've left my dream for you. I'm only yours, Catherine. I like, so, kind of like the symmetry here that we started the game with a note from Atrus to Catherine, and now, near the end, we're seeing a note from Catherine to Atrus. 
Her handwriting does seem to be an awfully lot more legible than it was in Riven, though. Anyway, it's another combination for something on the Crystal Viewer, but what? Apparently something that Catherine dreamt. What exactly the story is with Catherine's dreams is never explained, but she seems to use her dreams for inspiration to write her ages. I don't know, she'd probably say it was guidance from the Maker or something, I don't know. It seems that using her dreams, she also was able to divine this Crystal Viewer code. And since there's only really one reason that Catherine was interested in the Crystal Viewer and this age at all, which is the same reason why Atris wrote this age and built the Crystal Viewer, I do believe that I can guess what age this is. Well, I guess the only thing we can do is uh, try to use the Crystal Viewer and see if my uh, hypothesis is correct. Let's see. We have got some kind of circle and a book sitting on one of these geodes, I guess, with something over the top over where the linking panel would be. So it kind of reminds me of the book window material that Catherine used in uh, Riven to fix Gen's broken books. And there's a button, which doesn't do anything. What are these things, then? They kind of also look like the geodes that Atrus described. Aha! Uh -huh. I think I found the crystals. Now, I don't remember these crystals being able to morph in Mist 4, and in fact, that doesn't really make an awful lot of sense that they do that. What I think is more likely is that this is actually a graphical representation or, or holographic uh, image or something of the actual crystals which are elsewhere. Because this room is probably not cold enough for the crystals to work. Otherwise, it would be very uncomfortable to work here. But I just brought up five crystals and nothing is happening. Ooh, it looks like we can change their color by hovering over them. But so far, no effect. Kinda neat. Let's try that button again. Ah! Something happened. We're seeing a star field. Now it looks like, in actuality, the image is actually shown in the uh, uh, linking panel. But there's some kind of projector mechanism, basically an overhead projector, on top of it, that is projecting this onto that screen. I guess Aters got tired of squinting at a tiny linking panel. But, um, this age doesn't look very interesting now, does it? It's very starry. Now, it could be that we're just looking into a random age and there happens to be nothing there. Or, maybe it's the Starfisher. Who knows? Not me! Well, I guess we should try to use this device and actually see something. Change the crystal shapes and change the colors. I guess we should try and find a combination that actually does something. But... There are actually eight crystals. And... 
That wasn't a good combination. Anyway. Uh, there are eight crystals and six colors. Which uh, means there are on the order of 10 to the f uh, to the 30th, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's not right. 10 to the 28th, something like that. Combinations, which um, is a lot, so I'm not going through all of them. Let's start with the one from the journal upstairs. Although there were only four crystals visible there, we might be able to uh, make that work. I guess that was the first one. That's the second one. The third one's already right. That picture was also in uh, black and white, so... If we're gonna have to guess the colors, it's gonna take a long time. Well, those are the first four crystals. Let's try it. Let's see something. Glimpses of a few places. But it ends up in the void again. But that's because the fifth crystal also matters. And in fact, the one um, you need to use, well, you could just brute force this, because there's only eight combinations after all, is this one. And there we go. This is the watery age that it just described in the journal. Now the interesting thing is that um, we were not given colors, but apparently these colors work. Or maybe any color works. I don't know. Let's try. Set this one to a different color. We changed the view. That's interesting. Well, if you remember, Atris described that um, you could actually use the crystals to change the age. Although, in fact, of course, you're not changing the age. You're just looking into one of many similar but slightly different ages. And it seems that by changing the colors we are able to uh, achieve that effect. I think we've gone all the way around, yes. Let's pick a static viewpoint. Let's see what some of the other crystals do. Let's try this one. Neat! Raises the water level. Can we drown the whole age? Nope. Goes back down! Oh, all the way down! Stop! I have some water. Um, let's see if we can get the water back up slightly. I don't see anything. Ah, there we go. That's nice. Let's try this one. Uh, this one is actually a lot more subtle. There, they could see that one pretty clearly. It changes the texture of the rock. So I guess it's changing from different types of rock. How about this one? The snow. Yep. Change the amount of snow. Maybe we're looking into a slightly different time of year. Maybe each version of the age has a slightly different orbital inclination, changing what time of year it is in that age. Therefore, removing the snow. I don't like it when it's all gone. Can bring it back. There it goes. Now it goes through all the permutations when you loop around. Lots of snow. How about the last one? This is another very subtle one. Don't know how visible it will be in the videos, but it changes the colors of the trees. They were reddish, now they're sort of bluish. Uh, I can't even tell that really. 
But it does actually change the colors of the trees. It's hard to see though. Really the reddish one is the only one that you can really clearly see. Oh well, unfortunately only the co changing the colors works. If you change one of the crystals... We're deposited back in space. Well, we'll see what else we can get on this thing in the next video. Welcome back. We are playing around with the Crystal Viewer, which showed us a watery age, which we could change by changing the colors of the crystals. Of course, we weren't actually changing it, we were just looking at slightly different ages that were all similar, but not quite the same. There's actually a graphical problem with that particular age with Crystal Viewer for some people, including for me, unfortunately. And um, if I change this crystal back to the right one, you'll be, you'll be able to see what the problem is. Instead of viewing the age, all we get is this. A white screen. Unfortunately, um, that happens with some video cards and some drivers, and I'm not entirely sure what the criteria for it are. It happens on my system, it doesn't happen on my laptop. And um, the way I got around it to record, because I can't use my laptop to record, unfortunately, the way I got around it there is to use Glide, the old... 3DFX API. I used a wrapper library that allowed me to use Glide on this modern system. And using the Glide settings, the uh, age did show up correctly. But unfortunately, the uh, quality settings that are available using Glide are much lower than what is available using Direct3D. So if the previous video did not look as good as the rest of them, that's why. Because I had to use the Glide wrapper to get this age to work right. Anyway, what else can we get on this thing? Well, there is of course the note from Catherine. So let's try that combination. Which uh, needs this crystal first, in red. Of course you may have already guessed what age this is going to show. It is the very reason why Atreus built the Crystal Viewer, why he wrote Rhyme in the first place. To spy on his father, to check whether Gen was still trapped on Riven. Because if he was, then it would be safe for Atris to go back to Dunny without risking leading Gen back to Mist. And then he would be able to look for Dunny survivors, something which he really wanted to do. But before he could do that, he had to make sure that Gen was where he was supposed to be. And hopefully, this code is the key to that. I think I got it right. I did! Ah, Riven. My favorite age of all the games. And my favorite game as well. It's kind of a nice teaser for the next game, I suppose if you're playing these in uh, in order. Unfortunately, it's kind of difficult to tell if Gen is actually still here. I guess all we could do is uh, wait until Gen 
by accident walks past uh, <laughs> this area which isn't very likely to happen not entirely sure where this is I don't think it's actually a location you can stand in the game Riven itself I think it might be Temple Island judging by the bridge here and since we can't see the big dome on the other side I suppose that this is where the temple is Although, might actually be that that is the side of the rotating room and the dome. Either, either the dome is on that side or on this side. It's hard to tell from this angle. In any case, we do seem to be on Temple Island and therefore close to um, the spot where we start in Riven, of course. So maybe Cho will make an appearance. He's not actually called Cho, that's just what people call him, because it's the first thing he says in the game. But he should be nearby, assuming he is on duty. But if he's uh, taking his duty seriously, he probably won't wander off to uh, pay us a visit. In any case, kind of difficult to tell if Gem is still actually safely trapped here. I suppose the only way we can really find that out is to play Riven, or watch my Let's Play. Which I strongly encourage you to do, of course. I don't know if Atrus was actually able to confirm if uh, Gen was in... Uh, was still on Riven, using the Crystal Viewer. I have no idea how long uh, it was before he got trapped by his sons that he managed to find this combination. Or or Catherine managed to find it, actually. I guess he should be lucky that uh, Catherine was able to uh, dream up that combination, quite literally. Because otherwise he would have tried all the uh, countless billions and trillions and gazillions of combinations, which would have taken him quite a long time. This is... I don't know if there's any way you could systematically search this. There is actually uh, something else you can see on this viewer, and that is a number of Easter eggs. I'm not going to show most of these. Most of them are pictures of the production team and things like that. And they're not that interesting. What I do want to show, however, is another Easter egg known as the Huevo and Vika, I believe, easter egg. The reason I want to show that is because it's kind of interesting to um, us fans of Uru. I'm not going to show all of them because there's quite a lot and changing the crystals would take me ages. So I'll show you one. And by the way, um, the people who found these easter eggs, the uh, real credit goes to them, of course. They did not try all of these uh, un countless combinations either. They actually hacked the game with a memory editor to find out what combinations could be used to view these images. The images had already been known before that from um, examining the files on the Realmist CD, but they didn't know if they could be sh view uh, shown with the Crystal Viewer itself until somebody tried to uh, use a memory editor and extracted the combinations that way. Alright, another one of these in purple. That should be it. It's not. What did I do wrong? Is it the other color purple? That can happen. Nope. It's not. 
It looks right. Damn it! Is this one wrong? Ah, it's supposed to be this one. And that color purple? Yes, finally! Okay, that took a bit longer than I intended. What uh, are we looking at? You can actually see this image as well in the images that are flashing by when you're just switching. And what you may be able to recognize here, uh, through all the static, it's kind of hard to see, but it is in fact Teladon. But how could this be? Real Mist was created three years before Uru. So how can there be pictures of Teladon? Well, remember, I told you that uh, Teladon was actually one of the ages slated for inclusion in Dirt, Dunny in real time, the project that eventually became Uru and whose engine was used for uh, Real Mist. So, it seems that some of the art for uh, Dirt made it into Uru as screenshots for the uh, Crystal Viewer, which is kind of neat. But that is just about all we can do here. We've looked around this age all we can. And we've gotten a glimpse of Riven and a glimpse of Uru in a sort of strange roundabout way and even missed five. But that's all there is to do. So, although Rhyme um, gives us a nice link to Revan and ties up a couple of loose ends through the journals we get to read, that unfortunately doesn't really give the game any more sense of closure than Mist had. Now, normally at this point, I would be giving you my um, thoughts on this game and my little mini-review that I usually do at the end, but uh, because I have some other things I want to talk about, about some of the retcons and uh, other things in relation to Mist and this Let's Play, I'm actually doing that in a separate video, in a bonus video that will follow this one. And for now... All we can really do is go back to Mist. And then we have to go back to uh, Dunny. After all, Atrus told us that he might need our help again. That he was facing a foe more dangerous than his sons could have imagined. And I'm kind of curious what he was talking about. And since we don't really have anything else to do, I think it's time to try and help him. So, let's see what he has to say. Hey, the red and blue pages here are gone as well. Did Atrus remove them on his way back? I guess he did. All of this video was re-recorded for Real Mist, of course, you might know. So, let's head back to Kavir to see what our old friend wants 
our help with now. Thank God you've returned. I need your help. There's a great deal of history that you should know, but I'm afraid that I must continue my writing. Here. Most of what you'll need to know is in there. Keep it well hidden. For reasons you'll discover, I can't send you to Riven with a way out. But I can give you this. It appears to be a linking book, back here to Dunny. But it's actually a one-man prison. You'll need it, I'm afraid, to capture Gan. Once you've found Catherine, signal me, and I'll come with a linking book to bring us back. There's also a chance if this all goes well, that I might be able to get you back to the place that you came from. Hello and welcome to this follow-up of Let's Play Myst. I usually give a little mini-review at the ending of a Let's Play, but due to the way I structured the ending of this one, there was not really any good place for me to do it, and I wanted to talk about uh, more things than usual, so I needed some more time, so I did it in this separate video instead. First, I want to address something that some of you have been wondering about. The agreement with Shady Paradox. Back in 2009, while I was uploading my Riven videos, Shady Paradox contacted me. He was doing real Mist at the time, but told me that his intention had been from the start to do a Let's Play of Mist 3, but then decided to, do, uh, to start from the beginning instead. So he was worried that I was planning to do Mist 3 as well, uh, in which case I probably would have beaten him since my production rate is slightly a lot higher than his. But since I had already decided to do Uru next instead, and at the time had no real intention to do Mist 3, that worked out quite nicely. At the same time, Shady Paradox told me he was glad I'd done Riven, uh, as he'd been unsure on how to approach it himself since it's such a non-linear game, and he's never played any of the games after Mist 3, so it ended up being the case that we split the Mist series between us that way. It was never the case that either of us said, I'm doing these games and you can't. It just kind of ended up that way. Of course, that was then, and this is now. And I kind of ran out of Myst games, with the exception of Myst and Myst 3, of course. I was already considering making a Myst Let's Play last year, but then Cyan released Myst Online or Live again, and that became my next project instead. And after that I had to think about how to approach this one, and... Um, I came up with the idea for the tie-in with the Book of Atreus, and I had to figure out how to do that, and what order I wanted to do things in... So, that's why this project took some time to uh, actually get started. But what I want to make clear is that the reason I did Myst is because I wanted to. I like doing Myst Let's Plays and my choices are limited. There are only six games after all. It is NOT, very emphatically NOT, because I didn't think Shady Paradox's Let's Plays uh, is good. Or that I thought I could do better or something. In fact, I think he did an excellent job with Real Mist, but the simple fact is that the two of us have very different styles and there is no rule saying only one person can make a Let's Play for a game. If he ever wants to do uh, Riven or any of the other Mist games, he is free to do so, I wouldn't mind one bit, 
and I strongly encourage you to watch his Let's Plays, as well as mine, of course. And if I ever end up doing this 3, that too will be for the same reasons, and not because I think Shady Paradox's Let's Play of Mist is bad. And about Mist 3, which is inevitably going to come up if I don't mention it in the comments, there is a definite possibility that I might do it one day. But I don't guarantee anything, and it won't be soon. It's not going to be my next project, so don't go sitting around waiting for it, and for the love of God, stop asking me about it. It'll happen when it happens, and again, it won't be soon. Okay, back to Myst. Myst is a difficult game for me to evaluate. I didn't really get into Myst when it first came out. I think I must have played it, but I don't, go, uh, don't, I don't think I got very far. It was only when I played Riven that I fell in love with the franchise, and I didn't return to Myst until after the Masterpiece Edition came out. If that seems strange, remember that I was 12 when Myst was first released. Hardly an ideal age to appreciate a game like that, especially for uh, someone whose uh, native language is not English. So while I appreciate that Myst was a groundbreaking game when it was first released, I didn't really play it back then, and for me it was always overshadowed by its sequel, Riven. And the difference between the two really is quite big, whereas Riven still holds up today, Myst hasn't aged nearly as well. Its graphics have an obvious computer-generated feel to it, uh, and they just look dated. The sound quality is very low, and uh, the low quality of the videos is really hidden only by their wise decision to only use videos sparsely. Still, we owe a lot to Myst. It pioneered a new style of games, uh, often imitated, but with mixed results. And it also showed the public what could be accomplished with CD-ROM technology and computer graphics in games. Besides the technical points, though, uh, Myst actually holds up pretty well. Its environments still have that spark of imagination that makes Myst uh, and all the other games in the franchise so great. If I have one complaint here, it's that the ages never really felt like they were ever inhabited. I know it's intentional that there's no one left now, but except for Channelwood, I have no clue how anyone survived on the ages. Where did they get food in Channelwood? Where did they even stay in the Mechanical Age, on those tiny islands? Again, it's a minor nitpick, and I know it's just because of technological limitations that they couldn't really show the ages in all their glory like they undoubtedly wanted to. And partly it's, it's Riven's fault too. Riven was so thorough in making the Rivenese village believable and everything on that island just made sense perfectly that it just sticks out when the other games don't do that. It's also the source of my problems with Spire in Myst 4. Riven just set such a high standard for attention to detail that it simply couldn't match. But uh, let's not get into Myst 4 again. I think I've discussed that uh, more than enough. The story of Myst uh, also still works, uh, although obviously the mystery has long been spoiled to me. But many things in the game gain additional meaning uh, thanks to the other games and the novels, so that works both ways. The way the player is dumped into the game and left to his own devices to figure out uh, what to do is something that I quite like. You're unraveling the mystery of what happened on this island and uncovering the uh, history and the background bit by bit, and it's something that quite appeals to me. Unfortunately, it's also the reason that many people never finished Myst, is not everyone has that kind of patience. The puzzles are pretty good too, and not too difficult. It has a few tough ones, and I understand that a lot of people had serious problems with the organ puzzle in the spaceship, though that was never really a problem for me. But on the whole, the puzzles are logical, and the solution's never too far away. With these kinds of games, it's usually a matter of figuring out the train of logic that the developers want you to follow, and once you do, it's not impossible to finish uh, with, uh, without hints. Although Riven would do a better job with integrating the puzzles in the environment, because, well, face it, uh, in Myst they're mostly combination locks after all, um, Riven also went way overboard with the difficulty. Ultimately, Myst is a good game. Even when taken on its own, um, without the rest of the franchise to back it up. And it did start this huge franchise, the likes of which the Miller Brothers uh, could never have foreseen, and which remains to this day my favorite games franchise. 
That, however, leads us to our next topic. Myst, as part of the Myst franchise, has the unfortunate distinction of being retconned almost entirely out of existence. I'm not kidding either. Nearly everything that happens in Myst has been changed by future developments in the series. Most of the damage was done uh, shortly after Riven's release, when Cyan employee Richard Watson, better known as Rawa, began answering questions on Myst newsgroups and forums in the late 90s. One of the most widely known problems is that, according to the official explanation of how linking books work, there is no such thing as trap books. I already discussed this in Myst 4, uh, which uses the official interpretation of the red and blue books as ordinary linking books to prison ages, rather than trap books. As I said back then, the earliest mention of this that I could find that trap books don't exist actually dates back to 1998, so it's not that they changed it for Myst 4, it had been changed before then. While removing trap books from the franchise has only a minor effect on the events of Riven, it nearly makes all of Myst impossible. Regular linking books just don't allow for the events we see in Myst. Linking panels work only one way, so there's no way Sears or Akinar could ever see who was in the library from their prisons in Spire and Haven. Sound doesn't travel through a linking panel either, so there's no way they could, they could talk to you. The same problems also apply to the stranger's interactions with Atrus through the green book at the end of the game, and that wasn't even a trap book to begin with. Furthermore, using a linking book to a prison age doesn't free the person trapped there. Instead, all we would have accomplished is trapping ourselves on Spire or Haven, unless we brought a mist book with us. Another problem is the red and blue pages. According to the sequence of events revealed in uh, later material, Catherine was trapped first, then Atrus, and finally Sirs and Akinar trapped themselves in the red and blue books, unaware that the other was also being trapped at the same time. That means there was no one left to spread the pages around. Plus, what would be the point of it? Like I said, using a linking book to prison age doesn't free the person inside, so what is accomplished by spreading these pages over all of these different ages? Perhaps most infuriating to some people is the stance that Sion takes about these changes. Rather than just acknowledge that there are pl plot holes, Sion maintains that their official version is correct, and that Myst is just an adaptation. They take the view which TV Tropes calls the literary agent hypothesis. Normally, when we watch or read a work of fiction, we assume that what we see is an accurate representation of the events. But if we watch a historical documentary or a reenactment or something, you'll assume that any errors are due to the interpretation of those who made the adaptation, rather than history itself being somehow wrong. If you watch The Last Samurai, nobody thinks that that's actually how the... Uh, events happened in the late 19th century uh, in Japan. It was changed for the movie to make for a more interesting story, for better or worse, depending on how you feel about Tom Cruise, mostly. However, um, the literary agent hypothesis says that a work of fiction wasn't actually created by its authors. Rather, the authors are the literary agents for the people in the story, under the pretense that all of it actually happened. Science says that the Myst games were based on real journals by the real Atris and Catherine, presumably uncovered by the real-world uh, counterpart of the DRC, and that any inconsistencies are the result of dramatic license taken by Cyan when adapting these journals into a playable game. The existence of trap books and the interaction with the brothers is all considered to be inventions on the part of the designers that don't match the supposed reality. In these journals, the stranger presumably uh, just learned about the brothers through journals and observing their rooms in the ages, never actually interacting uh, with them directly. He also wouldn't have met Atrus before actually going to Gavir, so either he found some other way to uh, he found out some other way about the white page, or took it with him by pure, ch pure chance. Now, while this view isn't really a problem in itself, uh, the main issue with it is that it then allows you to basically explain any plot hole away as dramatic license. It is a get-out-of-jail-free card for sloppy writing, allowing you to get away with anything, because you can always claim that it didn't really happen that way if someone calls you out on it. I'm not saying has, uh, that Cyan has actually done that, but as a writer myself, it does feel like a bit of a cop-out that they use this excuse to basically restructure the Mist universe to their liking, uh, removing already established elements that they didn't feel uh, fitted with where they wanted to take it. In truth, what happened is the inevitable result of a fictional work growing beyond what its authors originally intended. 
This kind of story evolution is natural, and Myst only had the misfortune of being released before its backstory had been fully formed. It happens all the times in various uh, forms of media. Just watch early episodes of the original Star Trek and you'll see exactly the same kind of inconsistencies with later material. Although there is, of course, always the possibility that Richard Watson and Cyan are telling the truth. That Dunny really is real, and Mist really is just an adaptation of these real materials. That somewhere out there, there is a linking book just waiting to be found and take you to these fantastic worlds. But not terribly likely, it is an alluring thought. And with that, we've reached the true, final end of this Let's Play. I thank you once again for watching my silly little videos and for listening to me ramble. And I'll see you again in a future Let's Play. Welcome back. So, you've chosen the red page. Are you sure? Well, I guess he does seem a bit saner than uh, Akinar. But do you really think he can be trusted? Well, I guess we'll find out. Well, let's give him the final page, the sixth red page, and hope we don't come to regret it. Uh-oh. This does not look good. Yes, I'm free! Oh, oh, thank you, my friend. My dear friend, you've done the right thing. You stupid fool! <laughs> it looks like perhaps you're in the book now. <laughs> and what have we here? A page. <laughs> hey! Leave those oh, spaces no. alone! <laughs> I hope you enjoy your new home as much as I enjoyed it. I can see you! You're getting less clear! I hope you're in the books! <laughs> <laughs> the library looks much the same as I left. Oh, I can all. Well, on the plus side, I guess he didn't kill us. On the downside, it appears that now we are trapped in this book. Man, Spire is a lot darker than I remember it. I guess that wasn't such a good choice. Maybe you'd like to try again. Welcome back. You've chosen the blue page? Really? You must be joking. I guess you like crazy people. Maybe you're like one of those, uh, one of those people who marry imprisoned serial killers. Bonnie and Clyde syndrome, I believe it's called. Oh well. If I get killed. It'll be on your head, you know that. Ooh. 
Well, against my better judgment... Whatever happens, it'll be your fault. Oh dear. Looks like now we're trapped. Great. Oh yes! I'm free! <laughs> oh, I feel alive! <laughs> and how do you feel, my friend? <laughs> oh, oh, and whatever here, perhaps the pages you work so hard for. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Perhaps you're seeing the world from my point of view. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> 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 my brother. <laughs> Maybe someone will rescue you someday. You lose. <laughs> Well, now see what you've made me do. Well, thanks a lot. Now I'm trapped in this book. All we can do is wait and hope that maybe some other stranger will show up and we can be all, Oh, I need the blue pages! To him. Or her, I suppose. Well, at least Haven isn't such a bad place to live. Although, I guess it must be night now. Well, that certainly was not the right choice, but then... I hope you uh, already knew that. Let's try that again, shall we? Welcome back. So, you think it's a good idea to ignore H's warning and go to Dunny without the missing page from the mist book? Well, let's find out what happens anyway. Well, there we are, in Kavir. And there is Atris. Come here. Whom we are about to disappoint. Ah, my friend. Ah, you've returned. We meet face to face. In the page, did you bring the page? You didn't bring the page. You didn't bring the page. I don't who are you? Oh. Did you not take my warning seriously? Welcome to Dunny. Okay. Perhaps not such a good idea. On the other hand, though, out of the two of us, maybe we can clear this uh, 
wreckage and get out of here into the rest of the house. And the rest of the city as well. In which case it wouldn't be all that bad. Come to think of it, where is Atrus getting food? Does he have a storage space here somewhere that we can't see? I have no idea how long he's actually been here since uh, the brothers trapped him here. He must have had something to eat and drink. Actually, if you think about it, there is uh, no real reason why we can't just go on with Riven anyway. I mean, of course, it's a problem for uh, <laughs> for Atrus that he can't go to Mist and is still trapped here. But we can still go to Riven and do all the things we do in that game, and even the ending would be the same for us, just not for Atrus. So, not my problem that we didn't bring the Mist page. Oh, okay, okay, I guess that's selfish. Then I suppose you want to try that again.